I'd like to to ask the interpreter currently on the Spanish channel to commence translation of this meeting. For those just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available and members of the public or staff wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in the Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear the Spanish translation. Charles, can you please restate this in Spanish? Para los recién llegados a la reunión, interpretación en vivo al español está disponible y los miembros del público o personal quienes deseen escuchar en español pueden unirse al canal de español por hacer clic en el icono de interpretación en la barra de herramientas de Zoom para hacer un globo de terráqueo. Ya que se unen al canal de español, recomendamos que apaguen el audio principal para que escuchen nada más el, el interpretación en español. Good afternoon and welcome to our February 14th meeting. Let's go ahead and call the, the roll, please. Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Council Member Rogers? Present. Council Member Fleming? Here. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present. Great. We begin our day with our study session. That's item 3.1. Madam City Manager. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers and members of council. Today's study session is the ambulance service delivery option, and it will be presented by Scott Westrop, our police uh, fire chief. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager Smith. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, members of the council. Uh, Scott Westrop, fire chief of the city of Santa Rosa. Next slide, please. So as an overview and as a review of where we're at to date, um, if you recall on November 30th, 2021, the fire department uh, presented a study session examining the current state of the RFP process being managed by Sonoma County related to the exclusive operating area or EOA ambulance service franchise. The, uh, at the time we did an assessment of the anticipated options for ambulance service, specifically a comparison of a private entity franchise versus a public entity franchise. If you recall, it's very anecdotal in nature. And we reviewed three main topics as we looked through that. It was the service delivery of the system, system control, and the business model. Next slide, please. As a result of the, the first study session, the fire department received direction to examine a couple things. Number one was the feasibility of withdrawing from EOA-1, which we'll explain more in detail in a moment, and establishing an EOA exclusive to the Santa Rosa city limits. We also were asked to explore contracting ambulance service for that newly developed EOA. This study session will examine the following information as it pertains to that direction. Number one, we're gonna look at the legal risk benefit analysis of such an enterprise, and also look at some of the available data sets we now have related to the current EMS system um, as it stands today, looking at performance and compliance. Next slide, please. 
So as we get into the legal framework and, and what the city attorney's office reviewed, I'll present, and obviously we have um, the city attorney on and also uh, assistant city attorney, uh, Jenica Hepler on as well. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Hepler for all of her help and really diving in and doing a, a fantastic job in looking at this legal analysis. So essentially we posed five questions to the city attorney's office to look at. Number one is can a charter city withdraw itself from a county exclusive operating area or EOA? Number two, can a new EOA be created to serve within the city limits or contiguous to the city limits? Number three, what would be the process for creating a new EOA and contact, contracting directly for ambulance service within the city limits? Number four would be, what would be essentially the scope of work and the timeline for such an enterprise? And number five would be, what are the legal hurdles that the city would have to overcome in order to take on such an enterprise? Next slide, please. So the next few slides are really gonna explain um, the answers to all those questions in some detail. Um, you know, we really felt it was important to explain the why of, of how the city attorney's office reached these conclusions. And some of that starts with a little bit of background. So really this revolves around the EMS Act and the EMS Act was, was established in 1980. So keep in mind that we're looking at 42 year old legislation at this point, but the EMS Act of 1980 established a statewide policy for the provision of emergency medical services in California. And really the, the the act looked at doing a couple things. It was to achieve integration and coordination amongst both governmental and EMS providers and, and outside entities um, to really make sure that the EMS delivery system was consistent throughout the state and the realm of pre-hospital emergency medical services. And really what it did is created a hierarchy of regulations starting at the state with the, sto with the state level emergency medical services agency and then the state um, basically putting the, the onus down onto the counties. So the, the hierarchy was down to the county level for control of the system. So it wasn't the wild, wild west anymore as we saw in the 70s and early 80s where um, there was ambulances and, and departments fighting over calls for service. It really tried to create that consistent and, and fair and equitable approach. Next slide, please. So to follow on to that, um, the EMS Act grants counties the authority to designate a local EMS agency that would administer uh, emergency medical services countywide. The local EMS agency may be uh, a county health department, a county agency, a contracted entity, or a joint powers of authority. Each local EMS agency may create one or more exclusive operating areas or EOA. Next slide, please. So just as a, a bit of background for everyone, um, in Sonoma County, Coastal Valley's Emergency Medical Services Agency, or CVEMSA, which lies underneath the Sonoma County of Department of Health, is our local emergency medical services agency, or LEMSA. There is a single exclusive operating area, which is referred to as EOA-1, which the city of Santa Rosa resides within. And just as a point of reference, EOA-1 was developed in 1991. Currently, and as we talked about on November 30th, an RFP has been issued for ambulance services within EOA-1. It is not a countywide EOA, it is only within the, the boundaries of EOA-1. Next slide, please. And a little bit more review, you've seen this uh, slide before, this map before, but this looks at EOA-1 in its, in its entirety. So the yellow line um, essentially draws out EOA-1. You'll see the darker gray, blue uh, portion in the middle of EOA-1 is Santa Rosa which constitutes about 75% or so of the business of the EOA. We're obviously the busiest part of the system. We have the most calls for service within the system. And so um, really that the core area is, is where we're focused on. But EOA-1, and this is important to remember later on in the conversation, also includes areas such as Roner Park, Kenwood, Sebastopol, the unincorporated areas of Santa Rosa, and now as part of this new RFP, it also includes the area previously covered by Vera Health, which is now um, as part of the OA-1, which is technically the Occidental area. Next slide, please. So going back to talking about the EMS Act or Health and Safety Code Section 1797, um, and talk a little bit about what we refer to as 201 rights. So it's a subsection of Health and Code, Health and Safety Code Section 1797. 
And essentially the 201 rights uh, refer to being grandfathered, uh, having a grandfather status to cities that were providing EMS services on June 1st, 1980, and have continued to do so without interruption since then. So commonly referred to as what you'll hear say is 201 rights. It's important to note a couple of things. Santa Rosa's entitlement to Section 201 rights is subject to proof and would likely be challenged. Reason being that Santa Rosa specifically has not provided paramedic or advanced life support service since 1980. We actually just started providing paramedic level of service in 2002. So that's where we lose the grandfathering. The city of Santa Rosa loses its obvious grandfathering rights um, in regards to this section. Next slide, please. So beyond section 201 rights, the health and safety code is silent as to the city's rights to withdraw from an existing EOA or to create its own EOA. There have been several prior court decisions that have indicated that city's rights are limited to the grandfathering provisions of section 201. Um, most importantly, the California Supreme Court has upheld these decisions with the Valley Medical Transport decision in 1998 and the San Bernardino decision in 1997. Currently, the California Court of Appeals uh, just recently upheld this decision as well with the city of Oxnard versus the county of Ventura, which we'll talk more about on the next slide. Next slide, please. However, there may be avenues that are open to the city. Santa Rosa is a charter city. However, seminal cases, cases did not distinguish between general law or charter city status. The question for the courts and really the, the ultimate issue here is, that will whether is whether a charter city has greater authority or autonomy under the EMS Act status, given the police, fire, and emergency services have historically been deemed matters of municipal affairs. Currently, referring back to the um, the Oxnard case, the city of Oxnard versus the county of Ventura, it's been appealed for it's gone through the court of appeals and is now being uh, requested to be heard at the California Supreme Court again. Um, but the Supreme Court has not acted on that decision. Next slide, please. So sort of jumping over to what the scope of work and the timeline would be um, if we so choose to go down this path. Um, this is all dictated primarily in Sonoma County Code 28-8, response zones. Um, essentially what would start the process is the, the city council would request a change to ambulance service uh, provider to the local emergency medical services agency or LEMSA. That matter would be heard at one of their regularly scheduled meetings. Um, the LEMSA would consult with LAFCO or the local agency formation commission uh, to see if any matters fell within LAFCO jurisdiction. Uh, the LEMSA would take into account the medical appropriateness of the request and the operational impact on the coordinated system. So not just Santa Rosa, but the entirety of the EOA impacted. The LEMSA may recommend changes. They might deny the change or they can conduct a competitive bid process. Next slide, please. Based on the LEMSA's decision, if the city disagrees with the decision, it re can request a hearing under section 28-21 of the county code which has to be done within 15 days. Um, the hearing officer would render, when, would render a final administrative decision within five days. And the final administrative decision would be subject to just judicial review under a writ of mandate. The writ of mandate would take several weeks to prepare and the judicial hearing would occur somewhere around the 180 day mark. So really what we're looking at here is a six, a six to eight month process even to get to a judicial judicial hearing. It's important to note that ju the judicial decision would strongly consider the impact of surrounding communities and their ability to contract for high quality EMS services. And if you go back to, if you recall back to the map in EOA one, we have to look at not just Santa Rosa, but the smaller jurisdictions, including Rona Park, Sebastopol, Kenwood, and the unincorporated areas and Occidental and how that would impact them. And what that leads back to is does, does the EMS service delivery uh, and the impact thereof of creating a new EOA become a state level issue and does it, it, does it meet the essence of the EMS Act? Next slide, please. So to summarize the legal analysis, um, essentially the city could consider requesting a creation of a second EOA. Uh, the time and cost of this endeavor is unknown. Um, both would likely be extremely high uh, there would sig be significant court proceedings. Um, it's, it's more than likely, it's for sure, based on what we've seen out of uh, Apple Valley, out of San Bernardino, and out of Oxnard. 
and the process is likely beyond likely to extend beyond the award of ambulance contract under the current RFP. And these bullet points are just a reminder under the current RFP proposals are due March 1st of 2022, so two weeks from now, um, which is when we would have to make a decision by and, and be in the process. Um, the proposal review and selection process takes place on March 16th, and the notice of award goes out April 5th. So take into account the six day month timeline of this process um, and the very lofty um, legal process we would have to go through does not match up with the, uh, the current timelines that we have on the process right now. Next slide, please. So the second part of this presentation is looking at um, the data requests that we've made and a, a data analysis of the EMS system. And so we made uh, several requests. We made requests for data from AMR, from REDCOM, which is uh, our dispatch center. It's a JPA dispatch center that uh, Santa Rosa is a part of and Coastal Valley's EMSA. And really what we, we focused on was EOA contract compliance. And as we move forward, there's a couple of things I want to call out real quick. Number one is we're looking at trends. Um, we're looking at a three to five year analysis of the data that we received. And really, we're looking at the, the trend data as we go through these next couple of slides. Another point I want to call out is that 2020 for all of us was a was a very, very much an anomaly um, in the emergency medical services realm or in the fire service realm. Um, this is the first time in history we actually saw a decline in calls. Um, this was related to COVID, obviously as we saw across the board, but it impacted our business just like any other business. And really what that relates to is the you know, uptick in use of telemedicine. It, it was people not going out. It was people not wanting to be in the hospitals. And really it was the call from uh, public health departments not to be out, not go to hospitals and not impact the, the uh, hospital system. So um, we did see a, a general decline across the state in calls for service in 2020. So um, it is a bit of anomaly and I wanted to call that out. And lastly, uh, before we move on, is um, these are pure numbers. These are pulled from um, reports submitted from uh, AMR to the county. Um, none of these numbers have been skewed in any way, but as with any data sets, um, they are nuanced. Um, in this world, there's a lot of different uh, regulations and rules as far as how the data is managed and how response times are managed. So, so there's going to be nuances everywhere. Um, we really tried to take a raw approach to it look at aggregate data and put together the best analysis we could with what we have uh, based on um, where we've been since uh, November 30th of last year. Next slide, please. So the first slide we're going to look at is instances of level zero. And what level zero is means there's no ambulances available in the EMS system in the core area. Um, and so as we look at this bar graph um, through the last six or seven years of, of data, uh, the green bar looks at pure level zero. That's the number of times there were zero ambulances available within the EOA. And this could have been for 30 seconds or it could have been for minutes. Um, so that's the raw numbers that we're looking at. Uh, the blue middle line, um, which is a little bit smaller, looks at the times that level zero was at five minutes or more. So that's, you know, that's the differentiation between the two. You know, the, the green bar is much bigger because it could have been for a short amount of time the blue bars when uh, we've been there for five minutes or greater. And the yellow line uh, looks at the level zero where a penalty occurred. And what that means is uh, penalty events are, are occurred after mutual aid exemptions are applied. So um, the times that AMR would be going out of the system are removed from the process. And the yellow bar is essentially looking at um, times that they were at level zero where they reached the penalty level. And what we're really looking at here, going back to the trends, is an increase in the trend um, across the board, across all subsets of the category. Um, and, and it's attributed to a lot of different things and, um, you know, call volume, staffing, all these different issues. But we're just we're sort of looking at the trends in a general sense and seeing if there is an upward trend in the level zero instances in the EOA. Next slide, please. So this slide looks at <clears throat> this slide looks at mutual aid by AMR going out of the EOA, so essentially AMR leaving the exclusive operating area to provide service to other parts of the community. The multiple colors aren't necessarily important. What we're really looking at is the top line. And what we see is a, is a downward trend of, of AMR going out of the EOA, um, roughly 1,200 times in 2019, down to around 900 times um, in, in 2021. Um, this is excluding a couple months um, 
particularly December of 2021, um, but it just shows a, a trend where we're seeing a decrease in the number of time AMRs going out of the system. And that could be because the other, the other parts of the system are, are stronger, um, or it could mean lack of availability. It's really hard for us to determine based on the raw numbers. Next slide, please. So mutual aid into the EOA. So this is looking at other ambulances or other service providers coming into the EOA to run for calls. Uh, again, the colors aren't terribly important. Um, this is just looking at the trends across the top line where we see an increase from roughly 900 times a year to 1500 times a year where ambulances are coming into the system. Um, this is one slide that is very nuanced in that when we looked at the raw data and looked at you know, a very broad look at the data, it includes ALS interfacility transfers. So essentially this looks at the times that um, paramedic ambulances are requested to move patients from either hospital to hospital or hospital to another care facility. We included that data, um, which may actually change the data a little bit. If we looked at just 911 calls within the inclusivity of the EOA, it may change a little bit. Um, I just wanted to bring that nuance to light. So it may not be as drastic as it really looks, um, but again, we're just looking at that, that trend data and, um, and, and really, really trying to take a broad look at um, how many times the uh, other agencies are coming into the EOA. Next slide, please. So this slide appears to be a little bit complex. Um, however, we'll try to break it down here. Um, this is looking at response times and, and the analysis of response times throughout the entirety of the EOA. So what we did is we aggregated all the data. Um, if you look at response time data in the compliance report, it's broken up into a lot of different areas, um, different subsets of different areas, rural, semi-rural. Um, and so there's a lot of data there. And then code two, code two calls, which is emergency uh, lights and sirens calls versus code two calls, which is non-emergent calls are broken out. So we tried to aggregate everything to make this as simple as possible. The green line looks at raw data and it just looks at the raw response time data and that's impacted by a lot of things. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. What I really want council to be able to focus on and the community to focus on is the blue line. And that's, um, that's the adjusted data set. So that's where particular calls are taken out where there was um, circumstances beyond the system's control um, that reduced the amount of times that the uh, ambulances were able to be um, within the response time standards. So if we look at the blue line and we're looking across the top at the, at the aggregate numbers, um, we see that uh, AMR was within the response time standards of 90% um, across the board. Uh, there was a small dip there, um, but for the most part, we see that they're across the board and they're currently in, within compliance response times um, within their contract. Um, however, we do see a decreasing trend overall um, of early January of 2019 uh, to current, we see a general decline um, in response times, however, they still are compliant. And real quickly to talk about the adjusted um, standard and the exemptions applied. So um, essentially adjusted means that exemptions were applied for and were approved. And so there's a couple reasons for exemptions. There's a lot of reasons for exemptions, but essentially as AMR submits their data, they apply for exemptions on certain calls. Some examples may be uh, mutual aid out of the EOA. So the times that they're leaving the EOA to go to um, other calls, that's a that's a, a, a approved exemption. Interfacility transfers, which we talked about before. Again, those are exemptions that are granted, but they are counted in this response time data. Um, upgraded or downgraded response. So times where an ambulance was dispatched code three and reduced to code two or vice versa, um, those are exemptions. Um, long ambulance wait wall times, um, you, you might hear referred to, refer to as APOC times. Essentially, this is the amount of times where an ambulance shows up at a receiving hospital and there's no beds available and they have to leave the patient on their gurney and, and they're unable to respond to other calls for service because of the long wall times, which we're seeing across the state as a, as a major problem um, as we face the COVID pandemic. It could be a second ambulance was requested to the scene. The second ambulance is gonna have the same dispatch time as the first ambulance. And so that's gonna extend their time. So that's an exemption, exemption that is granted. And even, you know, we could, you know, the fire department can be responsible for some of these where we request an ambulance to the scene of a structure fire 20 minutes into the incident, their dispatch time goes back to our first unit's dispatch time. So it looks like a very long response time. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is the significant and acute drop-off that we see in July of 2021. 
And there's actually a good reason for this. Um, AMR has tried to adjust to the APOC times or the, the wall times by adding a BLS ambulance or a basic life support ambulance to the system. Um, what this requires is for an advanced life support ambulance to arrive on scene first, complete an assessment with our ALS engine or truck company, and determine that a BLS ambulance transport is, is requisite. And so the BLS ambulance is requested to the scene, but the way the system is set up currently, and, and I know everybody's working on changing this, is that that ambulance has the, the response time of the first uh, dispatch ambulance. So again, it's very complicated and very nuanced, but I wanted to call out that significant drop off is actually because there was an adjustment to the system that the system hasn't caught quite up um, yet with. Next slide, please. So this slide's looking at uh, response times overall, and really it's looking at the times that uh, ambulances were late to arriving on scenes or on time really um, to arriving on scene. So looking at the green bar and a majority of um, majority of the, the bar graphs is, um, the green bar is the, the number of times per total that uh, ambulances arrived on time to calls per the response time standards. The blue line is the sum of late calls with exemptions, which we talked about before. So they were late, but there was exemptions granted. And the yellow line looks at um, times that ambulances are late to calls without exemptions. And really what I'm looking at here is the, is the trend overall in seeing you know, more late calls, more late calls with and without exemptions. And it's, while it's very, it's very minor, um, it is a trend that we, uh, we noticed and we want to explore more. Next slide, please. So going back to November 30th, I think what November 30th really did for us is opened up a lot of avenues for data sharing and data requests that we have previously not been able to obtain and really appreciate our partners for, for opening their, their books and sharing with us. Um, as you might expect, it is a, a, a lot of data. Um, it's very complicated, it's very nuanced, um, but we're really appreciative of, of the council taking the position and putting us in a position where we could um, share this data more readily. Um, what we're seeing out of the data that we've seen so far is AMR is meeting the terms of their contract. There's, there's no denying that. What we are seeing though on the other side of that is, you know, really the anecdotal analysis that we brought forward where we were talking about how crews feel like they're waiting for a long time on scenes for ambulances. There's a lot of switching off and a, a lot of different ambulances in the system. Um, that's verified by what we've seen in that. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but we are seeing um, the, that historic service delivery not sharply decline, but come down a little bit. And so it's something we want to be apprised of and work with our partners on moving forward. So our next step um, in the process is we're going to continue to look at this data on an ongoing basis, continue to analyze and work with our partners on this. Uh, but we have to do that and we have to do that together. Um, a couple of the, the areas we really want to draw out, we really need to learn more about is response times as are related to exemptions. So we need to learn more about that process and what it looks like um, and making sure that, that we're part of the process and being above board. And we also need to look more in depth at the EOA contract compliance reports. They're very complicated and complex, and we just wanna understand them better and work with our partners to understand those reports better. Um, we do need some additional data. Um, for instance, one of the areas that we really um, are drawing on and really need to look at is daily EOA system staffing. Um, it's very complex um, to, to draw that data out apparently. So um, we wanna continue to work with our partners to, to draw that data out. And really the conclusions of this is, um, this opened, as I said, a lot of doors and a lot of avenues for us to, to be better partners and to um, look at data together and work as, a, as an entire system um, on data reports. Um, so really it, it did create a lot of opportunities we haven't seen before and to work on the system as a whole. Um, the transparent monitoring of EOA compliance and guiding Santa Rosa Fire and the city of Santa Rosa on the creation of a new FRALS contract, uh, first response ALS contract, um, or really any program that we developed in the emergency medical service delivery realm is going to be important. And then we're just going to continue with those data sharing opportunities. So, um, so this really did crack the door for us, and we look forward to working with our partners in the future on this. Next slide, please. So in closing, taking into totality everything that we've talked about so far today or that I've talked about so far today, um, the options for moving forward is um, based on where we're at with the timeline, based on where we're at with the legal challenges we would face, um, there's, there's a couple options that 
um, we think are pre most prevalent uh, for the council to consider. Number one is we would use this time as an opportunity to negotiate a new first response ALS contracts with whoever the new EOA one ambulance provider is as chosen by the county RFP. And this, this new contract would focus on service delivery first. So um, previously, you know, my sense is that our contract was built from the finance perspective down. And my take would be, and in talking to the city attorney and city manager, our take generally would be um, that we need to build our new contract from service delivery as bedrock up and the business model will follow. So focus on service delivery first and worry about the, uh, the, the business model um, as the service delivery uh, model really transpires. So that's the first piece. Um, the second piece would be using this time as an opportunity to lobby for um, and to work on and join the conversation on changes that uh, need to be made to not only local ordinance, but to the health and safety code, particularly section 1797 to allow cities to have additional rights regarding emergency medical service delivery in their community. Essentially go and change that 42 year old legislation to something where cities have more rights and can determine their own future and set their own course for for their community and for their citizens. So a lot of work, a lot of that work is being done by California fire chiefs. Um, a lot of that work's being done by California professional firefighters. And, and I think it's prevalent the city joins that conversation and uses our stance with our lobbying teams to, to go forward and make that legislative change. So um, looking at a five-year plan when the, the, when the uh, RFP comes um, up for the EOA one again in 2027, we now have a legislative stance behind us both locally and at a state level to where we can make a good business decision and a good service delivery decision on ambulance delivery service into the future. Next slide, please. Quickly, before getting into questions, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank um, Assistant City Attorney Jessica Hepler. Je I'm sorry, Jenica Hepler. I was worried about screwing up your last name, and I screwed up your first name. Jenica Hepler, um, she really dug in and did some uh, amazing work in a short amount of time coming up with a legal opinion. Um, again, going back, I just wanted to have the city's legal opinion on that um, to make sure that we were making a, a decision based on where our city attorney's office stood on this. I'd like to thank our EMS Chief, Steve Suter, and our techni technology application specialist, Alondra Gutting, um, for all their work on the data side and all of our partners for working with us. So just wanted to get those quick thank yous out. And uh, I will open it up to any questions. And, and obviously, um, Jenica is here as well to answer any questions on the legal side. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Chief. Really appreciate the follow-up and all of the work that's been done on this. Council, let's see if we have any questions to start. Council Member Rogers. Chief, um, thank you for the presentation. I wanted to know how long did it, it, it seems like we're on a very short timeline and I wanted to know how long exactly did it take to uh, receive the, the data that you requested? Cause I believe you said you were gonna request this data back in November. So I'm just wondering why um, we're on such a short timeline. Sure, thank you for that, um, Councilman Rogers. So we did request the data. The study session that we held was on November 30th. We requested the data on November, I'm sorry, December 1st. Um, and it took some time to get the right data and get it in a format that we could um, interpret and understand. We were receiving data, interpreting data up until five o'clock uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, so it's, it's number one, it's a change in business proceedings for all of us. And so uh, making sure that everybody's comfortable with what's being shared and that we're um, with all of our legal, all of our legal guidelines. Um, so it took a while to get the data, but really it took a long time to interpret the data. So as you can imagine, it's, it's not a simple Excel spreadsheet. It's, it's reams and reams of data. And so it took a long time for us to interpret, but um, it took a little bit of time, but our partners did cooperate with us and we did get the data in a, in a timely fashion. Um, and a uh, second question is, um, I, I know we started to look at this really uh, because of service delivery and us wanting to provide the best service um, to our residents. Uh, is the, has the county changed their stance in wanting to work collaboratively um, with us regarding um, what they are doing or are they still um, of the same mindset that they were back in 2021? 
I would say there's been a significant change and, and really I think the study session in November um, helped guide that course. It showed that, uh, that Santa Rosa note is aware of what's going on and we're gonna take a you know, sort of um, position in, in this realm. And so it, again, going back to my previous statement, it opened a lot of doors and we really had a positive response working with the county. Um, you know, we're hoping that we can spend the next couple of years preparing for the next RFP process and changing changing some of the ordinance and legislation that exists to where we do have a parity in decision making and a parity in system design. Um, and that's just going back and, and changing language that exists right now. So um, we've seen a positive response and, and we're continuing to we look forward to continuing that positive partnership. Um, and really making the EMS system the best it can be for all communities, but particularly for us, the best in the interest of Santa Rosa. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions? Let's go ahead and go to public comment then. If you are interested in providing a public comment on this item, hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. We'll start with Mike. Mike, once we get the uh, screen up, you'll have three minutes. Uh, we won't get into a back and forth right now, but we will take down questions and be able to ask them and, and provide follow-up from staff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members, good afternoon. My name is Mike Stornetta. I'm the vice president for the professional firefighters of Sonoma County. Uh, I'm representing over 230 firefighters from around Sonoma County, including the city of Santa Rosa and the Sonoma County, Bodega Bay, and Rancho Adobe Fire Districts. Uh, 1401 has looked into this topic at extreme length. As the boots on the ground, we are here today confirming that the current private ambulance model in Sonoma County is broken. It has been proven day after day to be ineffective. As pointed out in Chief, Chief Westrope's presentation, 700 times without an ambulance available in a single year and down training response times are absolutely unacceptable and inexcusable. We have an opportunity to fix this problem by switching to a public ambulance delivery service. As the collective 1401, we enthusiastically support the public ambulance service delivery system. That's what's best for our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We'll go to Keith, followed by Tina. Hello, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. My name is Keith Jeffis, and I am the Deputy Director of the Santa Rosa Professional Firefighters, Local 1401. The women and the men of Santa Rosa Fire Department have taken an oath to protect the citizens and visitors of the city. Every single one of us take that oath very seriously, whether that be from the scourge of fire, floods, earthquakes, or even corporate greed. This issue, as Chief Westrup said, is obviously very nuanced. But when it comes to how best to protect our citizens, your constituents in regards to an ambulance delivery system, that is without question through a public model where the emphasis is on service over profit. Our citizens deserve the highest level of service available, not the minimum level required to fulfill a contract in order to maximize profits. The system as it stands is deeply flawed and changes need to be made. A component of this story, which is equally as frustrating is that as the level of service being provided is that the county has refused to give us the city of Santa Rosa seat at the table. They seem to have changed their tune recently, um, but we seriously doubt that that could potentially have a favorable outcome for us in the future. We're informed of who our ambulance provider will be and the level of service which they must provide. If there are any delays in that service, fines are incurred, however, these fines go to the county, even though, as stated, over three quarters of the calls are generated in the city limits. By going to a public service model, not only will we have more control, it can open up additional revenue streams, which by law would be required to be reinvested into that system, resulting in even better services to our citizens. We know what happens if we do nothing, we maintain the status quo. Will most people notice on a daily basis? Probably not. But this isn't a garbage contract where everyone realizes if the truck doesn't empty their can. But when someone is in their deep darkest hour, when their loved one is having a medical emergency, they will know the difference between an ambulance that arrives in four minutes and an ambulance that arrives in seven minutes. This is not a fight that will be easily won, but 
but we want to know, we want you to know that we are not alone. Municipalities up and down the state are starting to push back. Many are eager, eager to jump on board. We need to be a part of that push for what is right, whether that is by taking action now or working with our partners to change legislations for the sake of our citizens. We want you to know that the women and the men of Local 141 are here to serve, protect, and help in this endeavor in any way we can. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Keith. We'll go to Tina. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tina Rivera. I'm the interim director for the Sonoma County Department of Health Services. I'm here representing uh, Sonoma County. I just want to thank you for this time to uh, make public comment. I want to call out and thank and appreciate Scott Westrup's uh, comments and feedback with respect to the collaboration that we have been enjoying here of late. I do also want to say that um, we are committed to a renewed focus on stakeholder communication and input. And uh, it is our hope, it is our goal, it is our commitment to work extensively with Santa Rosa in any few future stakeholder meetings. Uh, and also, uh, I just also wanted to say that we have an opportunity together uh, uh, with all of our organizations to work more collaboratively. The county is committed to collaboratively working with all of our agencies in order to uh, provide quality services to our community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tina. The last hand that I have, do we have any pre-recorded voicemails on this item? We do not, Mayor. Okay, I'll bring it back to the council. Uh, Chief, first, just a quick question about some of the data. Uh, do we have any way to coordinate between the response times, particularly uh, the level zero that you're talking about and the staffing level, uh, and whether or not the, the fluctuation is caused by not having enough ambulances versus how many are the example that you gave folks waiting for a bed, for example? Uh, not currently, Mayor, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, that's something where we need to get into working with our partners to figure out exactly what the staffing levels are. And once we have that information, we can start to draw those parallels and determine exactly what the cause of that is. And so um, right now it's it's very open-ended. It's very uh, nuanced in its approach. It, it could be you know a plethora of things. And so one of the issues that I, I think we all face is that um, you know, even talking to our partners at AMR, it's, it's the response time data collection system, there's so many rules, so many regulations, so many nuances, it's very hard to extrapolate uh, good data out of it. So it's simplifying the system in a regard to, to be able to draw those conclusions is a place that I believe we need to get to. Okay, and does it have built into the RFP uh, language that you would need to be able to get access to that data? It's not built into the RFP, but that would be my direction as we move into contract negotiations for a FRAWS contract is, like I said, it's the service delivery up and part of that is data sharing set. And, and so that would be a stipulation of our, not to give away any negotiations, but it would be something I'd, re, I'd wanna go after is making sure that we have that provision within our contract that we control um, or we have control over to make sure that we have a, a, a fair and equitable system in as far as sharing data goes, particularly around staffing concerns. Right. Thank you, Chief. Council Member Rogers. Hi, sorry, another question. Um, I would like to know, and I'm, I'm very curious, does the response time, um, times that the, the data that you currently have, do you see a change depending on the side of town with the raw data, not with um, if one of our crews showed up? Right. Um, not necessarily. Um, essentially what what AMR uses and what's used pretty much throughout the, the industry, as far as ambulance goes, is called system status management. So that's moving ambulances around uh, throughout the system. So that's why you don't see ambulance stations necessarily. They move to different posts throughout the community. Um, and so uh, they, they rely on Santa Rosa for that because our engines count as an ALS resource. And so, um, so it's, very, it's very, there's good parity there. Um, across the community versus east, west, north, south, is that um, there's an ALS resource that's getting there quicker. Um, as far as a transport unit getting there, it's it's relatively paired as well in the sense that um, the ambulances are equally distributed based on how many ambulances they have. So 
So it really doesn't depend um, really where the geography or demographics is. It just has to depend with where the call volume is and where their system adjusts to uh, putting ambulances. So, um, so there is a lot of parity there and, and there's not a big di uh, disparity in that. Thank you. All right, Chief, if you could, could you please frame for us one more time what type of direction from council would be helpful? Sure. So the direction that would be helpful that, um, that I would recommend is we start looking at a, uh, a five-year plan. So uh, this RFP is um, due here in two weeks. And so the RFP is good for five years. There is a possibility to be extended, but um, I say we put our stake in the ground on five years and we do two things. Number one, um, we will work with the city attorney's office to start uh, building what we see to be a strong first response ALS contract built from service delivery up to a business model. Um, so that's the first part. The second part would be um, the city to take the position of um, looking at a five-year plan on deciding what we're going to do in the RFP process come 2027. And in that, that five years, um, we invest um, resources into changing local ordinance. Um, so we have parity and, and decision-making processes moving forward, and that's codified in ordinance, as well as start working at the state level um, and joining other partners that are already involved in the conversation on, ch on changing particularly the EMS Act or Health and Safety Code 1797 um, in, the, in the provisions within there, giving the city additional power and authority to make their own decisions um, based on what we've seen as a problem throughout the state for with a with a very very old piece of legislation. So, so really, it's those two pieces: it's the contract, and then it's the lobbying to start making changes and planning for um, for the 2027 RFP contract for ambulance service and um, how we can adapt to that and certain and provide even a better service to the community at that time. All right, thanks, Chief. I look for direction from Council. Who wants to start? I see you all avoiding eye contact. We'll start with Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Well, what I'm looking for from our ambulance provider is the speediest, most efficient, um, responsive to the community, um, the safest. Everything we are, what any everything that anyone would want in an ambulance service is what I'm looking for for Santa Rosa. And I want to be in control of the contract. Um, I want to be able to negotiate with the provider. I want to be able to be, if, there, if the provider is not doing what we expect of them, I want to be able to have direct contact, transparency, communication. Again, everything that it takes to be a good service provider, an excellent service provider to the citizens of Santa Rosa, is what I'm looking for. However we can achieve that is the path that I want to take and the, um, the taking the chief's recommendation in changing legislation that is keeping us from being able to move forward in that direction. Um, it's, it will be a heavy lift, but I think it's time that we tackle that and, um, and, and be able to, and it'll, it'll, take, it'll take, it'll take five years. Um, so take, taking advantage of this time to change the paradigm, to um, create a service that the, the citizens of Santa Rosa and our fire department and our public, public safety officials can all be proud of, and one that we could be proud of as well as, as elected officials. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Swedel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation, Chief, and uh, I'm supportive of the five-year plan that the Chief outlined. Um, one additional thing, especially if it, um, I'm encouraged to hear the uh, continued or increased collaboration with the county. And I know I mentioned this at our first study session. I sure would like to have some Santa Rosa representation on the process for the selecting uh, this next process that you just described. But um, I'm very satisfied with we're asking the right questions, and I'm supportive of the Chief's five-year plan. Council Member Fleming. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Chief Westrope, for your thorough presentation. The way that I see it is that ambulance service is a core, core and fundamental to who we are as a city. And 
obtaining and then maintaining control of it is essential because I don't believe that there's anybody who can do the job better than our employees. And I want to acknowledge how hard they work to try to get this changed and how hard you've worked with the city manager to try to find, and our legal team, to try to find a balance that's tenable. Um, I'm disappointed is the wrong word to use because that suggests that I think that more could have been done. I wish that we could be enacting a, a public model today. I get that that's not feasible. I support your recommendation and I will support you and your team with to the best of my ability in, in lobbying to get the changes made so that you and your team can have full control over the operations of our ambulance service because that's what we owe to the residents of the city of Santa Rosa. A couple of the things that I'd like to make sure and stress are there, you touched on it, is the data. Uh, I want to make sure that in the RFP that we have full access to data in a way that's timely and digestible. I think that that's what we're going to need to be able to move forward. And then um, the collaboration with the county, it was heartening to see Tina Rivera on the call today. And I want to thank her for making the time to let us know that this is really important to her and her department. And I want to encourage that relationship to grow. So those are my comments. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Rogers. Um, thank you again for the presentation. Um, to protect and to provide service to our residents, I think is so very important. Uh, I, like Council Member Fleming's, wish that we could do this tomorrow, um, but I understand why we cannot. Um, so I will back down from that one. Um, and I do agree with the, the five-year plan. Um, I, I just think that it is so important, having been one of those people that have waited for an ambulance to show up, um, those seconds seem like a very, very long time. Um, and so I know we look at it, um, we're looking at it um, in minutes, um, but just the seconds, I can assure everyone that's listening, seem like a very, very long time. So I'm hoping that um, within the five years, we can come up with a, a very wonderful plan to provide some um, very well needed services to the residents in our community. And thank you everyone that has worked on this project so much for your diligence um, in, in seeing, you know, trying to see this through. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Chief, good afternoon. Uh, before, can, can I get your definition of what calls without exemptions opposed to calls with exemptions are? And I'm sorry if I missed that during your presentation. Sure. So, um, without exemptions, just raw data is just looking at whether it's how many times they were um, at level zero or how many times they were related to a call. It's just the raw raw data set. Exemptions are applied. Um, essentially, the, the AMR or the provider would apply for an exemption to the county. They would say, hey, there, there was an extenuating circumstance outside of our control that made us late to that call or reached level zero or we had to use mutual aid. And so um, exemptions can be applied and those exemptions are really, um, there's, there's a lot of reasons for it. It could be like, I, I went through the list where it's mutual aid going out, whether it's interfacility transfers, it could be severe weather that impacts roadway systems. Um, it could be the train, um, or, or a train, um, crossing issue. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but AMR has to apply for those exemptions to the county and they can be awarded or not. So some exemptions are accepted, some are not. Very well, and, and is some of the data that you're still waiting for, uh, I imagine you've already requested and, and, and are waiting for, is how long our public emergency responders are waiting for the, for the private ones to show up or transport? Is that some of the information that you're still waiting? It is, and, and really it's not we're waiting for that data, it's having to extrapolate that data. So that's comparing two, two data sets from two different systems, essentially. So it's looking at um, our arrival times versus ambulance arrival times and, and trying to combine those two data sets. So it is something that we're gonna be looking at to make sure that, um, you know, again, we're backing up that anecdotal 
analysis, right, with data sets. So that's one of the elements that we will be looking at, but that's just going to take us a little bit more time. We, you know, we put together what we could to be fair and equitable in, in uh, the last 30 or 60 days. So, um, but that's something as we move forward, we'll be monitoring. Very well. And to Council Member Sawyer's point about having information readily available for us to take a look at, I believe that this is why it's so important for us as a city to have more control, the ability to give more direction to our public partners opposed to private ones. So with that being said, I definitely am supportive of of the strategy of public making public our emergency responders, and I do agree with your, your with your position of moving forward. I, and it's true, as 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 Councilwoman Rogers stated, I wish we could do it tomorrow, but I, I definitely believe that we're planting the seed. So in five years, we're not at this starting point here today. So with, and I do appreciate the presentation, sir. Thanks, sir. Yeah, thank you, Chief. I I'm also a big believer in the public service delivery model. I, I like the way that you frame the conversation about creating the system that we would want and figuring out how to fund it after the fact instead of starting with how much do we have in terms of resources to put into it. Uh, I agree with let's move forward with the five-year plan if, if that's the best that we can do right now. And I want to make sure uh, uh, we're pushing you out there in front to help other jurisdictions with this conversation as well because I do understand that it's a lot of advocacy at other levels of government. In the short term, uh, I'd like us to continue to weigh in on the proposals that we do see come back from the county's RFP uh, and would be more than happy to work with you to send a, a support letter for whichever proposal our team feels is in the best interest of the city of Santa Rosa to provide that better service delivery. And I understand that there's likely going to be a, a public option from uh, proposals that have been put in. Uh, and then long term, uh, let's talk about how we can continue to advocate to the county uh, on behalf of Santa Rosa to get this best system that we can, whether it's in the negotiations or as we move towards that potential five-year plan uh, implementation date. Very good. I appreciate that. Any other comments from council? All right. Thanks, Chief. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and recess. It's about 3.30. We come back at 4 o'clock for our regular council meeting. So join us at that point.
Good afternoon and welcome back to our council meeting. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Council Member Rogers? Present. Council Member Fleming? Here. Council Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present. All right. We have no report out for study or closed sessions. We have no proclamations or presentations. So we'll start with our staff briefings. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and members of council. So COVID-19 report. So today marks the final day that masking will be required indoors in most situations for people who are vaccinated are fully, fully boosted against COVID-19. Starting tomorrow, February the 16th, Sonoma County along with 11 other Bay Area counties and municipalities will lift the mask mandate for vaccinated people in many indoor settings following the California Department of Health's decision to let expire the statewide indoor mask requirement that was instituted on December the 15th. Unvaccinated individuals over the age of two will continue to be required to wear masks in all indoor public settings. Businesses, venue operators, and hosts may determine their own paths forward to protect staff and patrons, and they may choose to require all patrons to wear masks. Indoor masking will, be, will still be required for everyone, regardless of vaccination status in the following instances. Public transportation, healthcare settings, congreg congregant settings like correctional facilities and homeless shelters, long-term care facilities, and in K through 12 schools and childcare settings. The winter surge is in, set, is in a steady decline, and according to the county health officials, and after reaching a high on January the 10th of <clears throat> on January the 10th of 248.7 cases per day per 1000 residents Sonoma County's case rate has declined to 77 cases as of Monday February the 14th More information about local response to COVID-19 is available online at socoemergency.org I will now turn it over to item 7.2, Community Empowerment Plan Update to Deputy Director Tellis. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, uh, Vice Mayor Alvarez. Um, thank you so much. This is Magali Tellis with the Community Empowerment Plan um, Update. So some really quick updates that we have uh, for you all. Uh, the Mary Lou, the stereo system has been installed. The tires and rims have been mounted and fitted to the car. Um, the City of Santa Rosa Car Club plaque will be mocked and prepped for installation. Um, for those of you that are new to the world of low riding culture, the car plaques are usually only awarded once a car club deems a car worthy of the plaque and membership within the club. So our team is very grateful to be included in this ceremony and process. Um, and we're currently taking reservations from city staff to table at the Mary Lou uh, reveal event. Where we're hoping to be able to have um, the city and our departments really come out and um, talk about all the wonderful services that the city of Santa Rosa offers. Uh, so with the Multicultural Roots Project, um, this month we've focused on celebrating and highlighting Black History Month by sharing stories from influential community members within our city. The Office of Community Engagement would like to thank the following community members for their time and great contributions to the city and county. Uh, that's Chantel Reese, Lorez Bailey, Larry Younger, Kirsten Lange, um, and next month, uh, for the month of March, the Multicultural Woods Project will focus on sharing the stories of impactful women in our community for Women's History Month. And we'd like to thank um, for their time, Grace Chong, Charlie Toledo, Bernice Espinosa, Rima Markarian, uh, Lori Fong. 
in terms of redistricting, just a friendly reminder this Thursday, please join the city of Santa Rosa staff and learn how to redraw the city's seven districts in person. Staff will give a short tutorial about the mapping process and participants can bring a laptop or mobile device to draft the map. Pen and paper maps will also be provided. Materials and presentation will be available in English and Spanish. So uh, once again, that's going to be at the Findlay Auditorium. Uh, for more information, please visit srcity.org forward slash redistricting. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy Director. Let's see if there are any questions from the council on either of our staff reports for today. Seeing none, let's see if there's any public comment on item 7.1 or 7.2. Go ahead, Dwayne. Hello, item 7.2. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland and just a few moments ago, I left a meeting of the Vietnam Veterans of America, Chapter 223 monthly meeting in which they talked about a car show that they're going to do at the Veterans Memorial Building on the 2nd of July. I think this would be an appropriate time to talk about that with you because the city is now helping out on some car stuff, which I think is totally interesting. It's a good empowerment type of approach. Do you folks remember the song, Low Rider? When that came out, folks in my neighborhood were already doing it. So this car show is another form of empowerment for the community. <clears throat> and what we're hoping is that you'll also look to the idea of beginning to have the open government task force activities be considered a part of community empowerment. That was talked about originally about eight years ago when Andy Lopez was murdered. And it was this idea like, okay, we're gonna find a way to involve our community on issues that are of importance and talk about things together. COVID unfortunately has had us masked up, distanced from each other. It's had people not really get a chance to get together and talk about a lot of these issues that would be empowerment. So I'm hoping that what you folks will begin if the governor lifts the mask mandate tomorrow, which is maybe going to happen, that you'll begin a process to actually empower the citizens of Santa Rosa to be able to participate in a more personal matter. Zoomed in is sometimes zoomed out for those folks that don't have the laptops or the mobiles that she just spoke about. As a matter of fact, if you try to watch some of these meetings at the libraries, they get a little concerned unless you have headphones. So I bring this back to the main idea that multicultural events involving automobiles are a good thing. And they will continue to be something that people want to do, even as we look at this idea that we call resiliency and sustainability for climate adaptation and trying to get everyone over into electric vehicles. Do you know for 20 years now, they've been making a series of movies called Fast and Furious, and that young people are interested in automobiles more now than ever, perhaps. Ones that are really loud. They like to really burn that rubber, spin those tires and get those pipes just really roaring. So I'm hoping that you folks will accept that. It's something that's not gonna go away quickly. Thank you for doing the low riders. All right, and I don't see any hands on Zoom. Did we have any pre-recorded voicemails? We do not, Mayor. Okay, let's move on to our city manager and city attorney reports. Sue, how about you start us off today? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, happy to do that. Um, this is our monthly report on settlements and active litigation. Um, in terms of settlements, uh, we have just the one listed, that's the Airport Business Center. Uh, we did previously report out on that. It is a CEQA challenge uh, to our downtown station area specific plan. Um, 
we have entered into a settlement. It's a non-monetary settlement. We entered into a um, parking agreement and the case has now been dismissed. That case is over. In terms of litigation, we have five receivership cases and one of those properties has now been fully cleared uh, and the dismissal of the receivership case is pending. The other four properties, the rehabilitation is underway. We have eight general litigation matters um, and I do wanna note, and this is good news today, um, the Kessner case, which was a Prop 218 challenge to our water rates uh, that case has now been resolved and the court entered a dismissal of the action against uh, the city and, and a number of other um, public entities. Uh, the dismissal was entered earlier today. Uh, I will provide more information to you um, separately by email, but that case has now been resolved. So that's good news. We have seven personal injury matters. Um, two of those cases are now set for trial, one in late May, one in September, and the remaining cases are in various stages of discovery or uh, refinement of the pleadings. We have uh, five lawsuits concerning police actions that are listed uh, in the report um, this month. Now three of those five cases have been resolved. Uh, two have settled and they're just awaiting the formal uh, filing of the dismissal. That's the Ryland Stamey case and the Robert Casey case. And we have reported out on those settlements previously. Uh, the third uh, case that's been resolved is a Tamrat case. And in that matter, the court has granted the city uh, summary judgment. Um, so the dismissal was filed by the court on uh, January 21st. The remaining two cases are in, in uh, various stages of litigation. As terms of our writ cases, we have five cases listed. Uh, ABC is among those and it has been resolved. The Roseland Action Dwayne DeWitt uh, case will soon be resolved. And then the remaining three writ cases are uh, underway. Two of those have been set for trial, one in May and one in July. Uh, in terms of new claims, we have two new claims, both are personal injury claims. And happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Sue. Sure. Any questions from council? Let's move on to our city manager report. All right, today I have a couple items for you. So the Santa Rosa Police Department has announced the next Community Policing Experience, otherwise known as CPE, which begins March the 16th, and they are accepting applications from the community. The CPE is an eight-week course in which participants meet once a week. It is designed to enhance relationships by familiarizing participants with the Santa Rosa Police Department, its policies and practices. Participants get first-hand account of the daily responsibilities and expectations of police officers and other department employees. Police staff provide the instruction and participants ask questions, discuss issues, view demonstrations, and experience a variety, a training, a variety of training officers complete in order to perform their myriad of duties daily. Participants will also have an opportunity to experience a ride along and a sit along with SRPD, police officers, SRPD officers and dispatchers. So more information can be found at srcity.org forward slash CPE. So good news for our transit riders. Effective Monday, February the 21st, Santa Rosa City Bus will restore regular weekday schedules for Route 4B serving Rincon Valley and Route 8 serving Bennett Valley following reductions related to, to the Omicron surge. Additional service levels will be restored as staffing levels are increased. Updated service schedules can be found at srcity.org forward slash city bus. I also would like to remind everyone that the Transit Security Administration, Transportation Security Transportation Security Administration policy mandates that everyone must wear a mask even when traveling on public transportation networks through March the 18th. 
Santa Rosa Transit has remained operational at various levels throughout the pandemic. Seven routes continue operating under a Saturday plus schedule level of service. And I really want to thank Deputy Director Eve for her leadership during this time. She's done a phenomenal job making adjustments um, with the routes. So I really want um, to send my uh, appreciation to Deputy Director Eve. And thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? Let's go to public comment on these items. The city manager and city attorney reports. Do we have any voicemail public comments? We have no hands via Zoom and no voice message public comments on this item. Great. Let's go on to statements of abstention by council members. Does anybody have to abstain tonight? Okay. How about mayors and council member reports? Who wants to begin? Council member Fleming it is. I just wanted to extend a warm thank you to Kim Hatch and James Castro of our city parks department, along with Carol Quant, who put together a cleanup day on Saturday. I was joined by the mayor and a number of community members where we really dug into Franklin Community Park. Exciting thing is that after the community goes and does this at each of the parks on a rotating basis, then the, the parks crew comes in a couple of days later and, and really uh, you know, puts the final touches on getting each of our parks really spick and span. So excited to have our parks be more functional and clean and, and ready to roll for all the children and families and, and folks who recreate outdoors in Santa Rosa. We know it's one of our core services and we're, we're happy to provide it and we want it to be shining and beautiful for you. Council Member Schwedel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A uh, couple things. First with uh, groundwater, groundwater sustainability uh, agency had its meeting last week and we're starting the process of a rate and fee study. There's gonna be two community meetings that I'd like to let everyone be aware of. The first one is gonna be virtual on March 22nd from 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, the second one we're hoping to do in person on April 27th, uh, same thing from 5.30 to 7.30. The location is to be determined, but it'll be an opportunity for any member of the community to learn more about the rate and fee study and how it may impact um, them. And then on the continuum of care, I wanted to share at our 20, January 26th meeting, we made uh, several key actions or had several key actions. We selected a new coordinated entry provider, which is a huge uh, process. Home First was selected and they'll be starting the process of transitioning from Catholic Charities and this uh, they'll be in place by March. We also received an update on the emergency housing voucher program and of the 131 emergency housing vouchers that the Santa Rosa Housing Authority um, is facilitating, I think 23 already found uh, homes, which is a very positive step. Uh, we're also having um, some direction or additional direction was provided to continue with our centralized housing locator function. Again, this is something that would be a regional approach to helping find some locations to get people housed who either have vouchers or are experienced or don't have shelter yet. Also wanted to uh, make sure everyone is aware that we will be having our point in time count. Um, and usually it's the last week in January, but this year it was moved to February 25th. So anyone can uh, participate on that. You do have to sign up. They're doing a little bit different this year where you need to have a partner, you need to go online, but um, I'd invite all of my colleagues to join me early at about 5.30 on February 25th for the point in time count. That's it. Thank you, council member. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> on February 1st, the downtown subcommittee met and staff presented us with an alternative to skateboard deterrence uh, opposed to the L bracket that you normally see on benches and other concrete structures. Uh, the, the downtown subcommittee felt that it was best that we approach our full council and see if it was a pleasure of either uh, by motion presenting the, the approval through or really the, the, the deterrent through study session or if it's okay for us as the subcommittee to to make that decision. So the, the question from the vice mayor, make, make sure I understand it, is uh, whether council is 
comfortable with the downtown committee making a decision on this or whether there's interest from council members who don't serve on the committee and hearing that item uh, here before the full council. Correct, Mayor. Well, let's see if for folks who do not serve on the downtown committee, is there any interest in bringing this to the full council? Looks like you're empowered. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rogers. Uh, a few reports. Uh, the Health Action Council met on February 4th um, and took a historic step to recommend to the Board of Supervisors to transition to the Health Action 2.0, um, which will, um, the current one will sunset. Um, and what it does is instead of being an, an advisory board to the Board of Supervisor, Board of Supervisors, it will now uh, stand on its own. Um, and this will pave the way for a new and more inclusive health action to lead the next phase of this collect collaborative work. Um, so that is new and exciting and we will uh, hopefully get the support of the Board of Supervisors um, to do that and continued support. Um, this does not mean that the Board of Supervisors nor the county will not continue to support that initiative, but um, that it will just be able to act as its own body. Um, in addition, uh, the WAC and TAC uh, meeting, the Water Advisory Committee and Technical Advisory Committee met on February 7th, um, and I was appointed as the, the vice chair and Petaluma City Council member, Mike Healy was appointed as the chair. Um, and the TAC Finance Subcommittee um, is working with Sonoma Water on their preparation of the Sonoma Water um, budget and rates for years 22-23, and this will be presented to the City Council on March 29th uh, prior to the WAC, considering this um, at their April meeting. So this will determine our rates for water. I would also like to take the time to acknowledge um, February as Black History Month, being a proud uh, black woman here in Sonoma County. So um, whatever you can do to educate yourselves on the history of uh, African Americans, um, I suggest, uh, advise, encourage you to do so because there is a lot of wonderful, amazing history that we have um, out there, um, so a lot of which I don't even know. So um, I am uh, definitely trying to make a conscious effort to not only educate myself, but to educate my children. So um, happy Black History Month. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member. Uh, bear with me, I've got a couple of them because it has been a busy couple of weeks. Uh, we did have a Sonoma Clean Power meeting where we went over policy and regulative updates that are coming in the next year, particularly some legislation that's coming. I'll report back to the council a little bit more in depth as some of that moves forward. We had an economic development subcommittee meeting uh, where the topic was the first of many discussions around project labor agreements that I'm sure we'll have in the coming months. We had a climate action committee meeting where we moved forward the city's uh, gas uh, new gas station moratorium, and that'll be coming to council later this year as well, and some really great work and data uh, for council members if you want to look at it. Uh, our staff did a fantastic job of mapping out where exactly all of the gas station resources are within our community. I think the number was 44 in total across the city, which really gives you a visual of uh, both where impacted communities are from the impact perspective, uh, possible groundwater uh, issues or um, leakage issues, as well as the, the equity aspect, uh, particularly ar along the 101 and Highway 12 corridors. It's really fascinating data, so take a look. Um, we had both the mayor's and council members dinner, which had a presentation on the zero waste program, but also the mayor's and council members legislative task force meeting uh, where I continue to, to chair that and work with our delegation on their bills that are coming. Uh, we did the SMART strategic plan meeting uh, for the SMART board. Uh, online, it's worth a, a watch, uh, particularly given that uh, the new general manager has done a really good SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and T. Threats, thank you. Uh, 
I thought it was a really good path charting forward how SMART can continue to move forward. It's great information. Uh, yesterday, we had our SCTA RCPA meeting uh, where I took the gavel as the chair for the next two years. Uh, Linda Hopkins, our supervisor, uh, is the vice chair for the next two years as well. And there was a very good presentation and launch for the zero, uh, excuse me, um, Vision Zero master plan that the county is working on. Uh, we have launched officially a dashboard that if you go to SCTA's website and look up the Vision Zero plan, it maps out all of the collisions throughout Sonoma County, uh, both car on car, car on pedestrian, car on bicycles, and it maps it uh, against the county's equity, uh, equity priority areas, and it helps us to target where our limited resources can go to try to prevent those uh, catastrophic uh, and severe crashes, uh, really good information. Uh, with the council member Fleming, uh, I too had a chance to go out for the Park a Month launch, which was at Franklin Park this Saturday. Uh, we did have uh, the outgoing chair of the Board of Community Services, Carol Quant was there. We had the incoming chair of the Board of Community Services, Logan Pitts, as well as the chair of the Community Advisory Board, Leslie Graves, and it was amazing to see Leslie out there doing the work as well. Um, and, and a number of volunteers and some great staff work. It was just good to get out in the sun and make a difference in the community. This will be happening every single month. Uh, there's a schedule that is online of going from park to park across the city. And I'd encourage council members to get out and participate. And a huge thank you to all of the staff that have gotten this off the ground. Uh, and uh, council member Fleming named a number of them. I'll also throw in Jason Nutt as well, the assistant city manager who uh, has been leading this charge. Last thing for the council, and then I'll stop. Uh, last week, the Board of Supervisors uh, chose not to move forward with the acquisition of the Sears site, uh, something that we've obviously been in conversation with them about over the last year. Uh, we do anticipate that there will be another opportunity for the discussion. Uh, I'd like to send a letter on behalf of the council reiterating our support, which was the position that the council took last year and enumerating all of the reasons that we think that that's the right move and the way that that would benefit our broader community. If the council would like, I'm happy to agendize that as a uh, item for input uh, or if there's no objection, I'm happy to draft up the letter and send it to the county. But I wanted to make that offer to the council to see how you wanted to proceed. Is, is everybody okay with me sending a letter? I'm seeing nodding heads, great. That will go to public comment on our long and exhaustive council member reports. And I do wanna thank all of the council members. There's a lot that is going on and it is really helpful to hear, uh, particularly on the boards and commissions that we don't each serve on, what everybody's working on. I think that it helps to show that there's just a lot that's happening between our meetings as well. With that, let's go to our public comment. And I see no one in the chambers and I see no hands raised. And we had no voice message public comments, Mayor. Okay. We'll keep going then. We'll go on to our approval of the minutes. We have four different minutes for today. We have 11.1, that's December 17th, uh, 7th. December 14th, December 21st, and January 11th. Some of those were continued from our last meeting. Did council have any amendments to those four draft minutes? Seeing shaking hands, shaking heads. So we'll go to public comment on our minutes. If anybody had a correction, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature. All right, I'll bring it back. We'll show those adopted as presented without objection. We'll move on to our consent calendar. Today we have four items before you on the consent agenda. Item 12.1 is a resolution. First amendment to professional services agreement F002334 with Belinda M. Fernandez doing business as Studio B. Item 12.2 is a resolution. Approval to transfer funds from Bennett Valley Golf Course Capital Fund to purchase green mowers. 
Item 12.3 is a resolution adopt, adoption of memorandum of understanding with Unit 9 Fire Safety Management represented by Santa Rosa Police Management Association effective July the 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. And item 12.4 is a resolution declaring a vacancy in the office of council member district three and appointing Diana McDonald to serve until December, 2022. Thank you. Thank you. And council, I'm gonna start with item 12.4. Uh, in our excitement last Tuesday to get a new council member, uh, we did everything right, including the swearing in, but did not adopt the amended resolution uh, with the outcome. So with our two-step process, we do have to find, if council would like, that there is uh, a reason for us to bypass our wait period to put things on the agenda so that we can add this for this evening. So I'll entertain a motion to do so. So moved. Second. Moved by council member Fleming and a second from council member Sawyer. Let's see if there's any public comment on adding item 12.4 to the agenda. Okay, I see none, so I'll bring it back. And Madam City Clerk, if you could call the vote on adding this item to the agenda. And Mr. Mayor, before you vote, may I just uh, clarify that you are voting uh, to make the determination that there is good cause due to circumstances beyond your control to move forward with this item, even though it was not on the preliminary agenda. So thank you. Thank you for the clarification, Madam City Attorney. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes. All right, now I will entertain a motion from the Vice Mayor on the, excuse me, see if there's any questions from Council on items 12.1 through 12.4. Okay, we'll go to public comment. If you have a public comment for the consent calendar, hit the raise hand feature. We'll start with Dwayne DeWitt. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Dwayne DeWitt from Roseland on item 12.2. It would seem it might be a good idea to hold this matter until you have item 14.2 in the report. That item is about the Bennett Valley Golf Course and the scope of services for operation and maintenance. If you're going to be having a new organization come in, perhaps you should have them buy their own mowers. I've never heard of a lawnmower costing $50,000, but I can see that perhaps there's been some negotiations going on and there's this possibility you might spend $100,000 tonight for two lawnmowers. I'm real concerned about this because it seems that having been around people who do landscaping and yard work and everything of that matter, that mowers can actually be fixed. And what you're saying here is our, our old mowers are just too old. And I bet what's gonna happen is those mowers are gonna go to somebody and be used. Uh, you might say they're old, but I'll bet somebody else is gonna say, oh, they're good. And I'm curious, how are these going to be uh, disposed of is the term you use in administrative uh, discussions. It should perhaps be put up to auction. Those old mowers should raise funds and bring it back into the general fund. And uh, I just really believe this is putting the cart before the horse or the mower before the green. You should actually have this new organization that's going to be operating and maintaining your golf course handle its own equipment and we shouldn't be on the hook for this uh, i've often thought that the whole operation of the golf course over the last 15 to 20 years has been suspect and the um, former director of recreation and parks who left under a bit of a cloud because of the way this was handled should um, you folks look into this deeper. You might find there's better ways to handle this golf course and that you could perhaps put some housing out near there. I had seen signs around town saying, 
save the golf course. And when I asked somebody why they had the sign, they said, oh, they want to put housing there. And I thought, well, what's wrong with that? There was actually a proposal put forward over 25 years ago when the city was looking into getting another golf course that you could be putting housing for affordable, uh, simple homes for people of modest means near golf courses. And this might be a good way to do it because we have such a housing crisis that you have declared a housing crisis. So keep all those thoughts in mind. And then uh, let's check out, I hope they put some pictures up of these $50,000 mowers. Thank you. All right, we'll bring it back to Zoom. We'll go to Woody. Uh, thank you, Mayor Rogers and, and council members. Woody Hastings, I live in unincorporated Sonoma County. Speaking for myself today, not representing any organization. And I am also commenting on item 12.2 about the greens mowers, not not green mowers, but because uh, uh, I'm assuming they're conventional, assuming they're, this would be a conventional purchase. It sort of smacks of a sort of a business as usual um, kind of procurement, but a business as usual for the 20th century. Um, and we're well into the 21st century. And so with the passage of the Santa Rosa's climate emergency resolution um, a while back, it, it, it just seems like if that resolution is gonna mean anything, it should mean that that procurements like this should be screened for do they, do they are, are they uh, you know, in line, aligned with the climate emergency that we're facing and the, the resolution that your city council you know, adopted just seems like there should be some kind of, you know, universal screen of all these kinds of, especially fossil fuel, fossil fuel procurements, could be all procurements and just looking at the embodied greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so uh, I think that, yeah, I think that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, and actually the other thing would, would just be, you know, can in this case, in this uh, procurement, can can an evaluation be done, uh, assuming it hasn't been done, of any kind of alternatives that currently exist for either these kinds of mowers to be electric or a fleet of smaller? Because I'm assuming these are enormous mowers, given that they're fifty thousand dollars each. Um, maybe a, a, a small a fleet of smaller electric mowers might work. I'm just kicking that out there. That's that's pretty much it. Thanks. All right, thank you, Woody. Let's see if there are any other comments on the consent calendar. Seeing none, we'll no voicemail, public comments. We'll bring it back, Mr. Vice Mayor. If you'd like to put a motion on the table, thank you, Mayor. I move items twelve point one through twelve point four and waive further reading of the text. Second. We have a motion from the vice mayor and a second from council member Sawyer. Is there any additional discussion from council? All right, Madam City Clerk, please call the vote. Council member Schwedham. Aye. Council member Sawyer. Aye. Council member Rogers. Aye. Council member Fleming. Aye. Vice mayor Alvarez. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. That motion passes with six ayes. Great, we will go ahead and welcome our newest council member, Diana McDonald, to the dais. And I just want to say welcome. I think we're all thrilled to have you here. And I want to give you an opportunity if you want to say a couple of words. Well, thanks for approving that resolution. I appreciate it greatly. And I appreciate um, actually all the candidates who came last week and put their names forward. And just want to do a shout out to all of them that, that they did such a great job. And it is such an honor to serve our community. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here with all of you to learn from you and hear from our community on what matters to them. So thank you. Uh, thank you. 
So it is not yet five o'clock, so we will come back to our public comment for non-agenda items. Let's move on to item 14.1. Item 14.1 is a report, project approval, and approval of the acquisition of a portion of 1400 Fountain Grove Parkway for the permanent fire station number five rebuild project, fire station number five resiliency and relocation, and this is being continued from the February the 1st, 2022 agenda. This report will be delivered by real estate manager, Jill Scott. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I am Jill Scott, the City's Real Estate Manager, and I'm here today with Lisa Welsh, Asso Associate Civil Engineer in Transportation and Public Works, to discuss the adoption of the mitigated negative, negative declaration and the acquisition approval for a new rebuild of Fire Station 5. Next slide, please. So Fire Station 5 was formally located on Newgate Court and was really unfortunately um, destroyed in the 2017 Tubbs fire. Next slide, please. In 2018, um, the city constructed a temporary fire station on city-owned property located on Par um, Parker Hill Road. And Currently, it's um, being operated under a temporary use permit, which expires in October of 2023. Next slide, please. So following this Tubbs fire, the fire department looked at their standards of coverage, their deploy deployment plans, and their coverage maps, and they really determined that relocation of the fire station five would allow for improved coverage to Fountain Grove. It would help them to up for upstaffing an event and also serve as a, a forward command post for very large emergencies. So with council's approval, um, the fire department and real estate services searched everywhere in Fountain Grove within that area of coverage that would be the best for the citizens of Fountain Grove. And we looked at all available and unavailable land um, for the rebuild of the fire station. Next slide, please. And after a very, very lengthy search, um, council gave direction to staff in closed session to negotiate for the purchase of a little over two acre portion of Key Sites campus, which is located at the corner of Fountain Grove Parkway and Stagecoach and depicted in the pictures um, on the slide. Next slide, please. So as far as the acquisition, um, city staff and Keysight staff have negotiated a purchase agreement for a total purchase price of $205,000 and a little more than a two acre portion of Keysight's property. Um, and we're here tonight now seeking final approval from council for that acquisition. Next slide, please. So a couple of different things to know about this. Um, one interesting thing is that the proposed fire station on the new site is eligible for community development block grants, CDBG funding, which the city is looking into um, now. And then prior to funding any acquisition for the city, um, the completion of the acquisition, we always do um, a complete environmental analysis. And so for this one, we did California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, and we also performed NEPA because of the federal dollars that are involved with the rebuild of the fire station. So I'm gonna turn the next slide over to Lisa Welsh to talk a little bit about the design and some more CEQA requirements. Thanks, Jill. Okay, so uh, good evening, Mayor and Council members. I'm Lisa Welsh. I am part of the Capital Projects Engineering Group in Transportation Public Works. And to kick off the environmental process, uh, we, we hired RDC Architecture from Sonoma, California, and they provided us the programming and the preliminary engineering and data collection we needed for the environmental documents, uh, which included the CEQA mitigated negative declaration here tonight and the federal NEPA documents. Next slide. Okay, so to provide a clear and descriptive documentation for CEQA, we needed to come up with preliminary designs of what the building would look like. Um, so these are the proposed renderings of what it would look like. Uh, the overall site on the top, on the bottom right would be a close up of what the fire station would, yeah, <laughs> what the fire station would look like uh, in plan. And it would house, the first floor would house all that fire operations staff and their work. 
And then in the bottom left, um, we would we were showing the second floor, and that would be more of that community space area. Next slide. Okay, so then uh, looking at the preliminary designs, we also had uh, these elevations rendered. Um, the first elevation would be if you're looking at the fire station from Fountain Grove. And for perspective, that fire uh, or that flag is at the intersection of Fountain Grove Parkway and Stagecoach. And then that the bottom uh, elevation is uh, looking at the fire station from Stagecoach Road. Next slide. Okay. So after the preliminary design and we did all the data collection and the site investigations, uh, we created the documents for the public preliminary public review period. At that time, we sent out Assembly Bill 52 letters and we requested any historical information known about the site to the adjacent neighbors. Um, the Assembly 52 letters went out to the local tribes. Um, though no historical information was um, provided uh, on June or found. Um, on June 22nd, 2021, we did receive a request for consultation from the Federated Indians of Brayton Rancheria. Uh, we did conduct several virtual meetings and one on-site meeting with the Tribal Heritage Preservation Officer, where we addressed their comments through revisions and additional mitigation measures that were incorporated into the documents. Then on October 14th, 2021, uh, we were received confirmation from the Tribal Heritage Preservation Officer that they concluded their comments and we resolved them. And then we allow, that allowed us to formally respond and conclude the consultation on October 26, 2021. Next slide. Okay, with the completion of the tribal consultation and incorporation of the requested mitigation measures, the city was then able to go out for our public review period. Uh, we started off with the notice of intent uh, being published in the Press Democrat, and we also sent out at the same time letters to the adjacent property owners and residents uh, within 400 foot of the property, and those came out in both English and in Spanish. Um, connected to those notices, we then uh, posted the entire complete CEQA documents uh, to the city's public website, and then also we allowed in-person viewing at 69 Stony Circle, which is MSC South, um, at the conclusion of that 30 day period, uh, we hadn't received, we didn't receive any public comment and we were able to finalize the secret documents at that time. Uh, next slide. Uh, therefore, through the process, we found that there were no significant or potentially significant effects on the environment when we implement, implemented these mitigation measures. And um, yeah, next slide. Uh, looking ahead at the next steps, after tonight, um, we, after this adoption, we would be able to file the CEQA notice of determination and then um, the federal environmental review uh, NEPA documents that's going on parallel to this and that should be concluding very shortly. And so then we would be able to close escrow by the end of March, 2022. Um, for the design next steps, we would be submitting or we have submitted the project application to the grant funding agency um, and we're waiting to hear back. Uh, while we're waiting to hear from them, we are able to work on uh, the design build request for qualifications and request for proposals. Um, but until we hear back from them, we can't finalize um, that design builder. Uh, when hopefully we're hoping to hear back and have the design builder formally um, found by uh, July of 2022, and then bring a consent item for award uh, for to the, back to the city council on September 2022. Uh, the design, build, design builder would then get a notice to proceed by the end of the year, and we would be looking at uh, construction being on, on track to be completed by 2024, which is ahead of the grant funding requirements, which is good. Next slide. I think it's back to Jill. So with that, um, it is recommended by the Fire Department, Transportation and Public Works Department, and Real Estate Services that Council, by Resolution 1, adopt the mitigated negative declaration and, mitig and mitigation monitoring and reporting program for the permanent fire station number five relocation and rebuild project. Number two, approve the project. And three, approve the acquisition of approximately 2.11 acres of a portion of 1400 Fountain Grove Parkway, Santa Rosa, California, APN 173-670-022, 
for the new Fire Station 5, and four, authorize the assistant city manager or his designee to execute all documents necessary to complete the acquisition and all documents related subject to approval as to form by the city attorney. And before we turn it back to you, mayor and council members, we just like staff would like to take this opportunity to thank Keysight and their staff and their board for being willing to sell the city a piece of land um, from their complex to be able to do this. We did an extensive search, staff, fire department, real estate services, looking for the appropriate piece of property to put five, the new fire station five in the most appropriate area for the Fountain Grove community. And um, Keysight was very amenable and helpful um, in allowing the city to do this. So we just wanted to take a moment to thank them. And we are available for any questions. Thank you so much, Jill. Council, do we have any questions? Let's go to public comment on this item. If you are interested in providing comment on 14.1, hit the raise hand feature. We'll start with Andrew. Can you please unmute yourself and proceed with your comment? Okay. Uh, I don't know if I'm premature on asking this question, but with the previous fire station that burnt down, uh, before it got burnt down, they had built it. They ran into some issues on ADA requirements, which really surprised the city. And then the city went ahead and fixed it before it got burnt down. Uh, I hope that won't, we won't have that problem this time. Thank you. That's all I have to say. All right, thank you, Andrew. I'll go ahead and make sure that we ask that question when we're done with public comment. If there are any other questions on Zoom, hit the raise hand feature. Seeing none, I'll come back to the chambers. Dwayne. Thank you, sir. Dwayne DeWitt from Roseland. I was concerned about the size of the old fire station five site. It wasn't mentioned here. And just through general eyeballing, this will be perhaps the largest site for any fire station that we have, including the headquarters downtown. Two acres is a lot of land, so I just want to make sure that we understand why such a big parcel is needed. And then quite concerned about the idea to use community development block grant funding. That funding has specifically been stated in the past by the federal government to be utilized to help disadvantaged areas. The Fountain Grove area is not disadvantaged in any way, shape, or form. That's probably the wealthiest area in the entire city, if not the county. There are many other areas of Santa Rosa that need help with their infrastructure, and CDBG money could be utilized for that. But in the past, the Housing Authority and other organizations have nixed the idea of working to help disadvantaged communities. Specific example would be Corby Avenue, where there's a need for two pedestrian bridges over Colgan Creek. That need's been there for decades. And now that it's in the city, Corby Avenue could be definitely helped by CDBG monies. I would advocate that you not utilize CDBG money. You can get other funding, FEMA, other types of situations. I don't think that this is the kind of thing that's gonna break this deal if you say we're gonna let CDBG money be utilized in disadvantaged, underserved, and overburdened communities where it's actually supposed to be targeted for. Thank you for your time. See, no other comments. Did we have any voicemail public comments? We did not, Mayor. Okay, I'll go ahead and bring it back. Jill, there was a question specifically about the ADA requirements. I'm hoping you can just jump in and give some reassurance to the public. <laughs> I think actually that would be Lisa. Go for it, Lisa. You're muted, Lisa. Thanks. Uh, for the ADA-related uh, uh, question, we will not make the same mistakes again. Uh, we definitely have implemented a lot of uh, fail-safes to make sure that we are going to be providing ADA-accessible 
throughout the fire station completely. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Council Member Fleming, how about you put a motion on the table for discussion? Thank you, Mayor. I move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa adopting a mitigated negative declaration and a mitigated monitoring and reporting program with project approval and approving for the acquisition of a portion of 1400 Fountain Grove Parkway for the permanent fire station number five rebuild project, fire station number five resiliency and relocation and wait for the reading of the text. Okay. We have a motion from Council Member Fleming and a second from Council Member Schwedhelm. Are there any comments from Council? Okay. I just wanted to, on behalf of the residents of Fountain Grove and District 4, thank city staff for your tireless work and all of the council members who worked with our federal de delegation to make this possible uh, with the CDBG funding. And uh, and this just means so much, you know, to, to get a permanent fire station that will protect not only Fountain Grove, but the entire city. You know, the fires don't start in Fountain Grove and they don't end in Fountain Grove. And this is essential for our entire city's safety. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Madam City Clerk, if you could please call the vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Count Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. All right, thanks, Council. We are just a couple of minutes here away from five o'clock. Uh, I'd be reticent to go into 14.2 just because I know it is a, a high interest item. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll take just a couple of minutes break here. We'll come back, we'll do public comment for non-agenda items. Then we will move into uh, item 14.2 and then come back and do our public hearings. That we'll be right back. Here she was in roll call. Did you record a roll call? Yeah.
Council Member Rogers? Present. Council Member McDonald? Present. Council Member Fleming? Here. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council member Sawyer. And council member Sawyer will be back to the dais in just a moment. Let's move on to our public comment for non-agenda items. If you are interested in providing comment on something within the city's jurisdiction that is not currently on our agenda tonight, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. Seeing none on Zoom, we'll come back to the chamber. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. Please do not discriminate against Pomo Indians from and in Roseland. Also, please do not discriminate against veterans from and in Roseland. Handouts given here two weeks ago showed that some Pomo Indians and veterans have for many years advocated for a Pomo Park and a veterans trail on the south side of Roseland Creek. However, Santa Rosa City staff have been the forces of no to stifle the efforts of local citizens to honor the heritage of Roseland. There are concerns the city actions do not reflect the proclaimed commitment to diversity, inclusion, equity that has been talked about here. I guess one of the things that you folks don't realize sometimes is the actions actually speak far louder than the words. People have seen for a really long time that there's been a disinterest in some of the main themes that some Roseland residents would bring forward. Now though that the American Rescue Plan Act has come forward, all of a sudden there's a lot of people saying they have an interest to come over there and help in Roseland and they're gonna do some positive things. It begins to smack of a, a situation of um, opportunism, one might think. The folks who've been out there volunteering and working to try to do positive things in Roseland for decades have never sought any money. There are some organizations that are paid and funded, such as the Community Action Partnership and uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph's of Orange with their community benefits initiative, different groups like that, who've invested money because they're nonprofits and they have money to invest. But there's dozens upon dozens of other citizens that have come forward and worked to try to get things done in what they thought was the appropriate manner within our existing governmental structure. And they've become weary. They have felt that not only have their efforts been neglected, they're actually now being overrun in a way. And that's kind of sad. I don't want to see that happen. We need to look into these ideas of we're all in it together. We've done creek cleanups out there, done all kinds of things uh, to help in our community for decades. And we just now, after four years of annexation, are hoping that we can get you folks to work with the community as equal partners rather than as uh, subjects. We don't need to be ruled. We want to be served by our elected officials. Thank you. Madam Deputy City Clerk, do we have any pre-recorded voicemails? We did not, Mayor. All right, I'll go ahead and bring it back. Let's move on to item 14.2, please. Report item 14.2 is approval of scope of services and solicitation process for management of Bennett Valley Golf Course Enterprise. The report will be delivered by Deputy Director Santos. Good evening, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Alvarez, and members of City Council. I'm Jen Santos, Parks Deputy Director. Go to the next slide, please. Tonight, we will be discussing the approval of a scope of services and solicitation process for management of the entire Bennett Valley Golf Course enterprise, including the restaurant. 
the team that has been working on this evaluation of the golf course enterprise is comprised of uh, the city council's ad hoc committee, which includes Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Alvarez, and Council Member Sawyer, and formerly Council Member Tibbetts was uh, also on this ad hoc committee. Um, also, we've had the Save the Bennett Valley Golf Course group have been very much involved since early last year, contributing their insight to the analysis of the golf course enterprise. And uh, last but not least, we also have uh, National Golf Foundation started their evaluation of the golf course operations, finances, and conditions since council approval of their agreement uh, late last year. Uh, NGF, have, they have contributed their knowledge and expertise in the recommendation for future management of, golf, of the golf course enterprise. And we have Richard Singer from uh, National Golf Foundation here tonight, and he will be providing the main presentation and overview. And Jeff Danner, our golf course architect, will also be here if there are any questions regarding the golf course condition, conditions. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, we are seeking, seeking council approval for the scope of services to uh, prepare a request for proposals. Uh, the proposals will be seeking uh, a future single operator to manage the entire golf course enterprise, which includes the restaurant with its banquet and event spaces. We are also requesting tonight approval to move forward with establishing a proposal review committee of the same or similar, similar members that were available to review the golf course study proposals from last year. Uh, that review committee from last year was comprised of one council member, a citizen of the golf community, and staff members with integral knowledge and understanding of the golf enterprise. Um, additionally, we'd like to delegate authority to the city manager or designee to allow further refinement of the scope of services and the selection of the proposal review committee. The schedule from the release of the RFP on March 1st to establish a management agreement is estimated approximately four months. Therefore, we recognize that time is of the essence tonight and uh, we are seeking approvals to move forward with an RFP for management of the golf course enterprise. Next slide, please. Richard Singer from the National Golf Course Foundation will be covering sections one through seven tonight uh, which will essentially provide insight into the details that have led to the recommendation for council's review tonight for a single operator manager of the golf course and restaurant. Uh, I will jump back in uh, to cover the details of the RFP and the operational schedule and the next steps regarding the funding and recommendations. Next slide, please. So with this, I'll introduce Richard Singer from the National Golf Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Good evening. First of all, let me uh, let me ask first that uh, can everybody hear me? This is this is all working right, right? Okay, excellent. Yeah, so uh, I'm Richard Singer, as as mentioned, uh, from National Golf Foundation, and I manage our uh, golf facility consulting practice. I also have uh, Jeff Danner, who is working with me as our as our golf course architect, and um, it's great to be here and to kind of meet you all virtually. And to tell you that uh, although you're you're seeing me, many of you for for the first time uh, tonight, I can assure you, you all have been a big part of my life for for the last couple of months as we have reviewed uh, Bennett Valley. Uh, next slide. And uh, go ahead. Next slide. We'll start by just talking about the purpose as we understood it, and as to why uh, the city of Santa Rosa had brought the National Golf Foundation in, and and really just to do a, a deep dive and thorough review. Uh, of your golf course, uh, the city of Santa Rosa's golf course property, uh, the condition of the property, the business and how it's operated, um, you know, planning for the future and recommendations to improve the economics and um, con uh, physical condition uh, of the property. And the timing was important because you have a long tenured golf professional who has been there for many years, uh, who is scheduled uh, to retire at the end of June this year. Next slide. Um, our activities were, were pretty extensive over the last couple of months uh, with visits to the property in November and December uh, of 2021. There's been a lot of information exchange from city staff about uh, 
contracts and uh, records and financial records. And we've done all sorts of meetings with the city and, and golf course people. We did have some meetings both uh, virtually and in person uh, with the Save the Bennett Valley group. Um, and we, we visited some competing facilities, some other golf courses in and around the, the Santa Rosa area, and certainly have done some review of demographics, economics, and golf market data to help in our understanding uh, of this property. Okay, go ahead. So looking at the actual property itself, uh, the Bennett Valley Golf Course, the subject facility, next slide. Um, I think we can tell you that it's certainly a very popular facility and there's a lot of uh, passion and support for this, for this property. Um, the overall package of amenities that you offer at Bennett Valley is very consistent with what we see being successful in public golf, not just in this part of California, but all over the country. The, the uh, event center and restaurant operation is, is, is really a plus there. Um, but as we really start to do a deep dive into this, uh, we, we note that this property is owned by the city, but it's operated with a golf pro concession that seemed to have some uncertain terms. It, it wasn't clear to everybody involved who was responsible for what. And that seemed to come up from time to time um, in terms of how to operate this golf course and how to do it efficiently. The event center also had a separate concession, a restaurant tour, a legends that was there for, for several years. Um, they vacated the lease, uh, the concession in um, late 2020 because of COVID and, and it's been basically vacant uh, since that time. Next slide. Um, operationally, it's a fully public golf course and you have a mix of, of, of daily fee players, those players who who pay a one-time fee to, to golf on that particular day, and there's others who have a, a membership or season pass. Um, the, the event center has a potential to be both a restaurant uh, and, and banquet center, and is a, a strong revenue opportunity in its own right. Um, the two concessions, as we mentioned, is important because there was some confusion um, about how the, the facilities are operated, but the one thing that was not in confusion is that the concession agreements allowed the concessionaires to own all the revenue that they generate and are responsible for expenses to provide operation. Um, Bennett Valley is, is very active with residents and leagues. I think that we saw the passion. Um, a lot of Santa Rosa residents are members of various leagues and associations and play a lot of the golf that is played at Bennett Valley. This is definitely a facility that is serving the interest of the residents of, of Santa Rosa. Uh, next slide. The economics of it, I mean, there's there's a lot of money going through this property. Uh, the total golf pro revenue that was reported was uh, two two and a half million dollars in in 2021. It was two million in 2020, and a couple of years prior to that, it was at a 1.5 million. So what what we're showing is some really strong growth uh, in just the last couple of years. And the event center revenue, before while it was open and operating, was an additional 1.7 million. Um, you know, the total revenue generated by Bennett Valley exceeded $4 million um, as recently as, as, as 2019. Um, it's an enterprise fund, and the city's economic interest historically has been the collection of concession payments from your, from your vendors, which peaked at about $500,000, a half a million dollars in 2021, which is the strongest performance in recent years. And the city expenses that include equipment and, and some site maintenance and uh, the payment um, of debt service, um, the amount that you're collecting from your concessionaires is barely enough and in many years is not enough to cover all the city expenses. Uh, next slide. We did a pretty comprehensive condition of property report, and I know that a, a, an appendix um, material and some photographs have been provided to you, but we won't go through that here today. I think in general, we can tell you that Bennett Valley is not in its most ideal condition. Uh, most of the golf course features are well past their expected useful life. Um, some of these are mission critical to operate a golf course, that if you want to have a golf course on this site, you're going to have to address and correct some of these issues, particularly as it relates to uh, the drainage issues, which were severe, and an irrigation system, which is uh, more than 50 years old, and not efficient in delivering water to irrigate the property. Um, the corridors have been compressed. It's a little narrower than it used to be because of some overgrowth in trees, and there are some, some concerns about, about safety. Go ahead. Um, 
also how things are cited, the water usage, irrigation, um, probably need to be revisited. And um, the maintenance budget is not well tracked or, or understood. I mean, we really don't understand how much money is being spent to maintain this property. That's one of the concerns that we have about the Golf Pro concession. Um, and the maintenance facility uh, and the equipment that is being used are due for improvements. A lot of the equipment that is being used to, to mow the greens and other things are well past their expected useful life and are so bad that they could actually be causing damage to the property by, by their use. Um, go ahead. We have done our best to make an estimate um, of what it's gonna cost to upgrade this property. And we tried to divide it up into uh, two sections, which are the high priority items that are, you know, need immediate attention and some other options that you can consider. And certainly irrigation and drainage are the top two items on this list and also account for the, the vast majority of, of the money that's going to be involved with this. Um, but there are some other ideas that our architect has come up with that could help you make this property more efficient for the future. Um, and I think in, in the overall um, environment um, and the green environment and you know, uh, reducing your, your water usage, you can reduce the amount of irrigated turf, you can have better um, holding capacity for your irrigation water on site uh, through some excavation and, and some other things, uh, fix some cart paths and bridges, which could be dangerous if they're not repaired. Um, and deal with all of this is we're looking at six and a half million dollars to address it. Well, almost half of that is the irrigation system alone. Go ahead. Some other optional items, um, you know, to maybe improve the property, greens, tees, bunkers, the driving range. I think these are things that if you really wanted to, as long as you're doing some of the drainage and irrigation improvements that are necessary, you might want to think about doing some other upgrades that could make this property more appealing and more desirable to golfers. And that's essentially what these optional items represent. And that's an additional 7 million. Um, so it, it could be, it could be very expensive, um, you know, for, for doing some of these, but it's something to consider as you're, as you're looking at the future of this property. Go ahead. So, in terms of the upgrade consideration, considerations and our recommendations, and certainly a comprehensive master plan is item number one. Um, I think to address all of these items, to figure out the sequencing, how you're going to do this, um, in what phases or what sequence you're going to do this. Are you gonna close the entire property for a period of time to do these repairs? Um, do you maybe do them nine holes at a time? But at a minimum, you certainly have to address the safety, irrigation and drainage issues that need to be rectified as soon as possible. Uh, all of the key mission critical infrastructure items at Bennett Valley are past their expected useful life, and they're only going to continue to decline. It's only going to get worse. Um, phasing is possible, as I mentioned, but you're going to have to do a little more detailed study, and we certainly recommend the comprehensive master plan as being the first part of that. Moving ahead. Okay, go ahead. Um, we looked at external factors. There are, you know, and when I when when I look at a municipal golf course operation for a city, um, there are things that you can control, and then there are things that you can't control. And you can control the property, and we've talked about that. But you're also operating in a competitive market environment. I mean, whether you like to accept it or not, the city of Santa Rosa is in the golf business. You're in the golf facility business, and it's a tough business to be in, and it's a very competitive business, and. The good news is that COVID-19 has created a little mini boom for golf. And you've experienced it here at Bennett Valley. I showed you the numbers. You went from one and a half to two and a half million in revenue in just two years. There's a lot of new participants in this game, both old and young. And I think golf offers a, a positive outdoor experience. It, it's promoting a healthy lifestyle. And when you consider the residents of Santa Rosa and the visitors to this area, there's a substantial golf market here. And I, I think that there is reason to believe that this can continue, uh, you know, at least for the next five to 10 years, uh, there is strong demand for golf and there will always be activity and demand for golf for Bennett Valley. Go ahead. Uh, the supply and demand balance, the, the, the balance between demand and supply for golf is favorable in this area. So, um, you know, you're in a good position with Bennett Valley and the property the amenity package compares very favorable to the competition in the area, although the golf course condition at present is not the most ideal, but if it were to be enhanced and improved, as we've discussed, you have a real opportunity to be the market leader for providing public golf in this area. Um, 
There's been a reduction in the number of golf courses in this area that has helped Bennett Valley. Other courses have closed. And that has been a real plus uh, to Bennett Valley. And, and you've, you've felt the impact of that along with the demand. Go ahead. So that's kind of a summary of, of, of everything that, that we have found. And we'll, we'll move on to our recommendations uh, that we make in, in, in studying this. And we are preparing a full written report to, to document all of this. But basically, I think that, you know, item one is to go ahead and do the master plan of physical improvements. I think you need to commit to the high priority investments that we've identified, the mission critical infrastructure items that need to be addressed if you want to sustain a golf facility at this location, irrigation, drainage, maintenance facilities, cart paths, bridges um, are high priority items that need to be addressed immediately. And then I think the second piece, go ahead, is a new operations plan. And, you know, time is of the essence with this because your golf pro is set to retire on June 30th. And you need a new plan to be in place by July 1st. Um, and we, our recommendation is that you use a single operator. There are three main elements of a golf facility operation. There's the pro shop or golf operations piece. There's the golf course maintenance piece. And then there's the food and beverage, the restaurant piece. We recommend a single operator for all three pieces. One entity that can report directly to the city and manage this property for you. And there are many companies out there in the golf world that do exactly this, that they can manage all three aspects of it. So if you're looking for a single operator, there's really two ways that, that you can go about that. Um, I think one is to lease the property, a full site lease to a single operator. It can be a lease in exchange for a capital investment um, if a partner can be found. This at a, There was a time in golf when this was more popular than it is now, but the way it is today in 2022, I don't find a lot of takers for this option. Um, option two is a management contract. Essentially hire a management company, someone with expertise to manage the property for you at the uh, city established specifications. You define how this property is to be managed. You set the policy, you set the pricing, all revenues accrue to the city, all expenses are borne by the city, hopefully covered by the revenues generated from the property and you pay the operator a management fee. And that's essentially uh, the, the second option with that. Go ahead. Um, I think that the, the event center can be modified and should be modified. Um, it is our opinion as your consultants that you don't need a lot of capital investment here. Uh, I think what you really want to create is a true golf clubhouse environment. Right now, it's more of an event center restaurant environment. You need a golf clubhouse environment. And maybe you modify the space a little bit to incorporate more of a snack bar feel and maybe a little less of the white linen uh, napkin type operation, a little more of a snack bar or what is commonly referred to in golf as the 19th hole or a sports bar type concept. Um, you can improve the outside seating um, and service spaces outside. This has become very popular, especially in the wake of, of COVID where people are more comfortable sitting outside, providing that kind of service outside has become very popular at golf courses. You've got a great environment to do that here uh, at Bennett Valley. Um, probably not a lot of capital investment required. It's just getting an operator willing to commit to some of this. Um, changes are more operational and you know, not so much capital investment. Go ahead. We made some other recommendations. Uh, I won't go into them in, in, in detail here, but basically as you improve and enhance this property, you certainly need to market it. Um, right now you're, you're doing very well in attracting uh, your, your residents of, of Santa Rosa of the city, but there are a lot of tourists and, and tournament op opportunities, um, coordination with hotels, enhancing your social media presence, getting a better point of sale system, capturing email addresses, uh, improving your website. There are a lot of things that you can do to, to promote and market this property. Finding the right operating partner will help you a lot in these areas. Somebody who has experience in doing this to help drive activity and new revenue to this property. I think this is a great opportunity uh, to, to do that. Go ahead. Um, I mean, we think the pricing is, is generally appropriate, but there may be room to increase it a little bit uh, when you complete some of these improvements. Um, but ultimately, you want to implement some type of dynamic pricing, a model where uh, the way I like to say it is not all rounds of golf are created equal. Some are more valuable than others. And golfers are willing to pay more for weekend mornings when they can be done early than maybe they are for a Tuesday afternoon. 
And uh, there's not a lot of that going on at Bennett Valley now. And I think, again, a good operator can help you price this better to drive activity and uh, reduce your spoilage on the operation. At any, any tea time that goes unsold is gone forever, and you can never replace it. So you want to certainly fill the property up as much as you can, get golfers out there. Even if you have to discount it at certain times, you can do it. And you can keep it affordable for your residents uh, and maybe try to capture some of that tourist market and make it a little more expensive for them. Go ahead. So as you consider the structures, um, where are we? Oh, yes, just some other issues. Yes, uh, you certainly want to enhance the beginning of, of programming. Um, generate new customers by developing beginners and seek participation, non-traditional segments, minorities, uh, the female segment, younger people, people who haven't really grown up in a tradition of golf really need to be brought forth to this property a little more, um, providing, you know, rental clubs and, and, and all of these kinds of things, lesson program to teach people golf, to bring new people out um, and to have them enjoy this property, this, this city asset, which is so, so widely uh, enjoyed already. Okay, go ahead. So as we consider the structures moving ahead, ultimately, I think it really boils down to a couple of key questions. And I think that this was brought to us back in November when we first started on this project. Um, is the city going to fund these improvements or are you gonna seek a private uh, operator to, to a, a private entity to fund these improvements? Uh, I think there's a couple of things with the, and that ultimately leads to a lease. Uh, the problems uh, that you're going to find with finding a private operator or private funder for this is, uh, number one, there may not be uh, out there. There may not be a lot of entities out there willing to do it. And number two, you have to pull it together quickly because ultimately you're going to have to pull it together in time for July 1. Um, if the city were to fund it, I think it gives you a little more flexibility, a little more time, but certainly there's the money issue. Um, and that leads to the management contract. So if the city is funding it, it's a management contract. If it's privately funded, um, it, it goes to a lease. Uh, moving ahead. So just some thoughts that we were asked to do, you know, some, uh, you know, pros and cons of each. Um, I think that, you know, hiring a professional management contractor, you know, it's easy to implement. And I think it gives you a little bit of time to um, plan properly for this, to do the master plan that we mentioned, to think it through, to not rush it, uh, to have it done quickly. Um, you would get professional operation, and you could retain private sector labor with the way that it's structured. But, you know, obviously uh, in, on the negative side, the city's gonna have to fund, fund the enhancements. You're gonna have to pay a fixed management fee to your operator, regardless of performance. Uh, and then there are ongoing capital requirements. And ultimately, I mean, is this matching the city's goals? I mean, you do own this, this golf course, but you're not really operating this golf course. Under option one, you would own this golf course, but you would also be operating uh, through a management entity. Go ahead. Item two is essentially, you know, pushing this property off onto the private sector. You know, full privatization is, is, the, is the idea here. You know, private funding of improvements, you reduce the city's risk, and you also hopefully would get professional operation. But as I mentioned, you may find it's hard to find a willing partner, um, and a lease payment is unlikely to cover the bond payments. I mean, if you go out to the street and you look for a private operator to come in and fund these improvements, you may be able to find somebody willing to fund the improvements. I think it's highly unlikely you'll find somebody who would fund the improvements and also cover your existing debt service. Um, and it's a lengthy process to implement. I mean, you're looking at several months or a year to find somebody to come in and do it. And then they're going to have to do their planning for a year. It may be a long time before you can really, you know, put a shovel in the ground and really start doing some of these improvements. And that's, that's always a concern, especially when you consider, um, how important some of these uh, issues are. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. So we did some financial projections and looking at what this business looks like. And we tried to, to, to show you what this business would look like if the city were operating it uh, through some type of management entity. Um, first of all, I think it's realistic for Bennett Valley to do four and a half million dollars a year in revenue. That's from all the green fees and cart fees and membership fees and golf fees, plus the restaurant and banquets and all of that. If it's improved and if it's improved with the drainage and irrigation fixes, we're talking about the capacity uh, on the golf course would be enhanced. You could play more rounds. You could generate more income. I think that it's reasonable for four and a half million dollars a year. 
and operating expenses are probably three and a half to $4 million. So ultimately this is a facility that could contribute $500,000 a year um, in net operating income, maybe a little more in some good years, maybe a little less in some years that aren't as good. Um, there are unforeseen risks in terms of weather and other things, but that's essentially what this business looks like. It's four and a half million in revenue, uh, three and a half to four million in expenses. Uh, maybe you could improve on that and do a little bit better, but that's ultimately what the what the business looks like. Go ahead. So I'll just wrap up. Um, I mean, this is a great amenity for for the city. I think that you're in a you know in a great position. You've got a really fine golf facility for your community, but I think that the city has to ask itself, you know, what do you want this to be? Um, it needs new investment. It's, the property condition is not ideal and it's only gonna get worse. Um, your time is of the essence because of the, your pending pro retirement. You're gonna have to come up with a plan or, and do something by July 1st. Um, you know, the golf participation is also aging. Uh, it tends to be older people over 50 and uh, you know more needs to be done to attract younger golfers uh, to Bennett Valley. And I think a good operator can help you with that. I think that there is opportunity in the daily fee segment, the non-resident segment, the tourists and visitors to the area, if it's properly promoted and it's a good quality golf course, there's more revenue to be earned there. Um, and I think you can compete at the highest level of the market. This, this has great potential to be an outstanding golf course property. It just needs a little more TLC right now and to correct some of its deficiencies, but the inherent layout is good, the location is good, and it has great potential to be a good golf course property. So uh, with that, I think, I guess I, I turn it back over to Jen. I think you're next. Thank you, Richard. Uh, yeah, next, yeah, perfect. Um, so um, the goal with the release of the RFP on or before March 1st is to have as little days uh, as possible without golf. Uh, and to have tea time start on July 1st at the end of the current contractor's contract, or within about three to five days of this date. Um, the RFP, if the RFP is released on or before March 1st, then the proposals would be due on March 24th, which allows for um, the question and answer period and a thorough site visit of the entire operation and allows for a comprehensive proposal to be submitted uh, from future man management operators. Uh, the review committee will be expected to provide the review within a week or two of receipt of the proposals so that our top rank management proposals may be interviewed. It'll then take some time to finalize the details of the management agreement to be ready for council approval on June 7th. Uh, for example, when we draft a council item to approve the management agreement, that council item is due in early May. So there's still, we still have some timelines within that um, May 1st to June 7th date that are uh, mission critical to make sure that we can have a new operator by July 1st. The expectation in working with uh, National Golf Foundation is that the management company can begin shadowing the current operations and preparing to offer golf tee times beginning July 1st, 2022, and that the restaurant will open shortly thereafter um, or as close to July 1st as possible with permits re required. And of course, the maintenance will begin immediately on July 1st. So in reviewing the schedule, there is um, very little time to spare. And therefore, the ad hoc committee and staff are making this recommendation to move forward with the scope of services uh, for the RFP on or before March 1st for the management operations. Um, you've heard Richard discuss the two types of operating going forward, the management or the lease agreement. Um, you know, one of the main reasons we'd like to see this is for all the reasons that Richard mentioned, but also um, with a lease agreement, we would be uh, potentially closing the golf course. Uh, with a marketing agreement, with a management agreement, excuse me, we would be uh, able to start golf again as soon as possible on July 1st. Um, with a three to five year contract uh, potentially, which would allow us to come back and consider, should we move to a lease agreement uh, in the future or should we keep with a management operation? Next slide, please. So as you heard this evening from National Golf Foundation, there are future funding decisions to be made and the golf course team will be evaluating with the chief financial officer 
the options for funding the future operations. Some of the items that will be uh, further evaluated are reviewing the uh, revenue available in the current golf enterprise. We'll be analyzing the funding needed to support the transition from the current operator to the new management company. We'll need to review the funding options to provide for the potential capital needs if we move forward with those. Um, so therefore staff will be planning to come back in late spring to provide this information for council's consideration, likely as part of this larger study session so we can really understand um, the full depth of uh, funding needs. Um, and then of course staff will return on June 7th to council for a final recommendation for approval of a management operator. And uh, we will also be looking for any funding necessary to support the transition of a new operator at that time, including the management fee that um, National Golf Foundation provided. Although it's a, um, it's a fee that would be set annually, we would be paying on a monthly basis. So we wanna have that discussion going forward. Uh, but for now, for tonight, the decision is about the approval of the scope of services and there no, is no immediate funding impact for moving this forward. And as we've all been talking about, time is of the essence. We really do need to move forward with this if we want to consider this in the future in June when we come back to council. Um, so next slide, please. So um, with that, then it is recommended by the Bennett Valley Golf Course Ad Hoc Committee and the Transportation and Public Works Department that the council by motion approve a scope of work for management of Bennett Valley Golf Course and to authorize the release of a request for proposals to solicit for a single operator management organization to operate and maintain the Bennett Valley Golf Course and restaurant and three, approve the review committee composition and four, delegate authority to the city manager or designate to further modify the scope of work and or RFP process and composition of the review committee provided such changes are consistent with or do not otherwise conflict with council direction. And with that, all of us are here to answer any of your questions uh, that you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jen. <clears throat> thank you, Richard and your team for all of the work that you've been doing as well. Uh, I understand you when you say you've been living this and live in Bennett Valley for the last couple of, of months, the work really shows and I know that we've been trying to move quickly. Let's bring it to council and see if there are any questions on the presentation and the recommendation. Council Member Sweatham. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you for the presentation. I, I have a couple questions. Um, I think the first one for Jen in the staff report, it talked about the privately operated cell tower generates some revenue for the enterprise fund, but I didn't see a dollar amount. What is our annual revenue from that? We usually, it's an average of about $50,000 um, a year. Okay, and then um, for you, Richie, on a couple of the, uh, on the attachment and on slides 14 here, it talked about uh, the safety concerns. Can you expand a little bit more on that? Um, some of the comments were bridges pass uh, present dangerous situations. Um, two thirds of them seem okay or others don't seem safe. And uh, having been out there, I've never had a safety concern there, but could you expand on that a little bit more? Richard, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I was gonna let Jeff Danner uh, address that, our, our physical review manager. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor. Um, I'm Jeff Danner, helping the NGF with the physical evaluation of the golf course. And um, specifically related to the bridges, um, two of the three seem fairly structurally sound, although, you know, they're declining in their condition. But um, there's one, and I believe it's, I think it's on hole 15, um, that may have been struck by a falling tree. And uh, the railings are showing some sign of, of falling apart and some rotting as well of the board. So I don't know for sure that that one is structurally compromised, but it looked like it could be and would strongly recommend um, some further evaluation from a, from a structural engineer to get that sorted out. And at the very least, if they are structurally sound, maybe replace some of the rotting boards and railings and things that are, are meant to keep people safe. 
Um, some of the other safety concerns that um, we noticed out there are, you know, they're not uh, atypical for golf courses of this age. A lot of it has to do with um, the footprint of the golf course itself. Um, you know, as time has passed and there's been an improvement in how far the golf ball flies and, um, you know, the further the ball goes, the further offline it can go as well. So the, the safety setbacks that we would have used, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago are just getting wider and wider. Now, Bennett Valley does have the benefit of some very old, large trees, which can help to knock down shots and things. But on the same token, um, they can also cause a situation where uh, players on one hole may not see where players are on another hole, um, thereby making it hard for them to yell for if they don't know people are are on the adjacent hole and their ball flies that far offline. Um, so uh, having some um, awareness of players on the next hole over is a huge benefit. And so I think um, the course could really benefit for, from some uh, elaborate tree management and on that note as well, there's also um, a number of dead trees out there. I, I believe the number is, is anywhere from 50 to 100. And some of them are, are leaning and, you know, could come over at any time. Um, and others are also causing some issues with the cart path as far as the roots spreading far enough to, to cause the, the concrete and the path to heave. Um, you know, making some of the, the turns and ups and downs on, you know, on cart travel a little bit difficult and uh, somewhat dangerous in our view. Um, not to mention they could be a tripping hazard as well um, with all the, you know, the curbing that you have out there, which is something that is not widely used on golf courses anymore. Um, so I know that's, you know, that's quite a bit to cover there, but um, those are items that, you know, caused us a little bit concern as we were going around uh, touring the golf course. I appreciate this. And I don't know if this would be for the city attorney or for Jen. I mean, what's the data show? Are people getting hurt out at our golf course? Because now that we've been told by our consultants saying it's not safe, I'm a little perplexed as to what a next step would be and or if the ad hoc committee addressed any of these safety issues. I don't, just answering the, the, the last question first, I don't recall the ad hoc addressing the safety issues specifically, but maybe member of the ad hoc would, the mayor's shaking his head. Um, I'm not aware of any claim um, since I've been here uh, related to injuries on the golf course, um, but that's not to say they could, they could happen. And we will certainly want to look at a list of what the risks are and, and address them. We're certainly on notice now, so. Oh, oh. I just I think it puts us in an awkward position now if we've been told, because I'm yes. not aware of any safety issues that have been out there. I totally get the age of some of the bridges and whatnot, but when someone is well, saying it's a safety issue, I think we're kind of well, compelled. Let's make sure are we comfortable with what is currently out there, or do we need to stop doing something if the potential is someone's going to get hurt? Right. I, th I think what we'll need to do, and, and Jen may want, want to weigh in, is that we're going to need to go out and evaluate it ourselves as well and, and decide what's uh, what's what what, if anything, is needed to be done, uh, you know, more sooner than later, and what uh, uh, what does not pre uh, present a significant risk that immediate actions require. But that's going to take an evaluation of what's out there, what are the costs, what are our resources. Thank you. And I, I, I totally get the flying golf balls. That's part of the right. part of the that's game. Part of the not, game. That, that doesn't yeah. concern me, but it's some of the other issues that were addressed in that report. Okay. Um, and then just on the capital investment, the high priority list, and I'm, I, I'm making the assumption these are the recommendations. Lake construction, um, do we have a lake out there and could someone com expand a little bit more about that suggested $88,000 investment? Yeah, the, the lake construction item is specifically related to creating a new lake uh, for Bennett Valley Golf Course for, for storage purposes. Um, right now, the storage for the irrigation system is through the creek, um, which I believe has been going on for a number of years and is not necessarily um, kosher with the authorities. However, um, it's something that has been, you know, sort of going on for some time. So 
We feel it is a, a very high priority um, for the city to consider creating their own storage on site um, in order to, um, you know, fill the, the irrigation system with the water that you need to distribute on the golf course. And um, related to that, some of the water is actually leaving the site currently. So we feel like there's um, a big opportunity for you guys to capture and store your own water. Um, you have wells out there that you can use. And the idea would be to get Bennett Valley Golf Course completely removed from the creek um, with respect to using it for any kind of storage capacity. Um, it, it, it would be better for the environment. It'd be better for the golf course. Um, you guys would have a surplus of water kind of at your to use as needed. And um, it would also add, you know, an aesthetic element to the course as well and, and potentially the opportunity to create, um, you know, some interest to some of the holes. Okay, thank you. Council Member Fleming. Yes, thank you. Um, a couple of questions. One is around the turning the clubhouse into more of the sports bar and 19th hole feel. You mentioned in one part of the presentation that the that that part of the golf course has potential to be a revenue generator for events. Is that lost if it goes from being a more formal setting to being a more informal setting? No, certainly not. I think that it's a flexible space and it can it can do both. Um, one of the things that, that really stood out to us is that um, it seemed from the meetings that we had and from the interviews that we did that the golfers don't use the event center and restaurant. Um, they just leave the property after their round of golf. Um, I think that the, the building is designed in such a way that the space can be flexible, that the section of the event center that is an event center can remain an event center, but other sections that were currently or prior to the pandemic being used as a restaurant could be modified into more of a, of a 19th hole or sports bar type atmosphere during the day for golfers, and then modified a little bit every evening to become more of a, of a restaurant in the evening. I think that that's, that's certainly something that can be done. Um, and uh, the, the space is flexible enough to accommodate that. Okay, that's helpful to know. The other one is around recruiting, you know, younger people, women, people of color. Uh, I just wonder what techniques are, are working and what really, when I talk to people who are, you know, more fit that demographic, and that includes people like myself, you know, the, there was one huge barrier that they can't get around, which is time. And the amount of time that it takes to play golf just isn't really accessible to many working parents and, and younger people. So how do we make sure that this is an asset that can be used by a wide swath of our community? And how have you, how have you specifically dealt with the time commitment issue associated with golf? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. And, and we have often identified that in our own research at NGF, that time is the number one issue. It's not even, it's not even money, it's, it's time availability. Um, a couple of responses to that. I think that in general to improve participation from less traditional segments, we have found that programming that is targeted to them is the number one way to do that. Um, various um, group programming and lessons and camps and things like that tend to work really well uh, targeted specifically. And in terms of the time availability, I think that allowing your patrons to bite it off in a little smaller chunks, uh, the availability of nine hole rounds, some golf courses have been even really flexible in, in offering three hole and six hole loops that people can use. And you also have a really nice driving range there that can be used for, for a little better time commitment. There is a growing segment in golf that are what we call range only participants. And that is people who are participating in golf only using a driving range, never actually playing on a golf course. Um, so that is certainly still golf participation. Um, and a lot of times they, they learn and, and start to get involved on the driving range, and then they can work their way up to playing a three hole or six hole or nine hole loop and then work their way up to 18 holes. So I think that through programming and making a commitment, having your operator make a commitment to this, I think will go a long way to, to address that. Thank you, I appreciate it. Council Member Rogers. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I had a question about the, the clubhouse. Are there uh, no improvements that need to be made um, in the clubhouse that uh, investments 
would need to be put into the clubhouse? Is it just ready to go? Or was that just not a part of this presentation? No, it, it, it was a part of the presentation. I don't think there are any major issues. I mean, it's been closed for a while, so there may be some things that you'll have to do to kind of restart it. But we did not observe anything that was a major capital investment, um, you know, a roof issue or HVAC or things like that that, that are going to require large-scale investment uh, to address. Um, there may be some re, you know, starting starting back up again because it's been closed for a while, um, and and maybe some modification uh, of space and some interiors that that uh, you could uh, pretty up a little bit. But no, we did not see any large-scale capital investment that would be required with that building. Liz, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, was there not an issue in the kitchen that would need some investment to fix kitchen, refrigerator, grating, water? Um, help me, don't smile. I, 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 I'm going to jump in there and just say that there, um, there are some minor improvements that we'll have to make related to ADA compliance and fixing the freezer. For those of you who have been on out to take the tour of the golf course and the restaurant, there's some minor modifications to reopen. Uh, the kitchen floor is not a requirement to reopen and get going again, um, but we do have some other minor modifications um, such as paint and um, fixing places where signage was attached and um, some minor modifications to ADA compliance that can be covered with the current um, capital improvement uh, program we have right now. Um, so we're in a good position to reopen um, on July 1st. Thank you. Councilmember McDonald. Thank you for the presentation. I do have a few questions, if you don't mind clarifying for me. The first question I have is, have you seen an increase to golf during COVID because it's an outdoor sport? And have you seen that across the board? And is there any concern because of the fl flexibility of work schedules right now that the revenue that you're, you're projecting is based on maybe a current time? I think both of your observations are, are exactly correct. Um, that is exactly why we have seen a, a surge in golf. Um, one has been that it's an outdoor activity and it's something that people felt safe doing in the, in the early parts of the pandemic. And it really attracted a lot of new players who gave it a try and seemed to really and, and enjoy it. And then secondly, has been the flexibility of scheduling. And to the extent that that becomes permanent for a lot of workers, I think that there is great opportunity for people to get out and, and enjoy golf and control their schedules a little bit better. And I think those two things are, that is exactly correct. That is exactly what is driving this little mini boom in golf that we've seen in the last two years. Thank you. Um, as far as the um, investment, I saw that there was one slide that was about 6.5 million. And then there's another slide that's 7 million. So are you suggesting that the council consider 13.5 million over time and the initial investment would be 6.5 million with the option of investing another seven? I think that's exactly, again, that's exactly okay. the, way, the way to present it. Yes. Thank you. Six point mission critical items and then the other piece is option. Thank you. And um, how long would the golf course be closed after you start the improvements um, if we were to start during the timeline that's recommended? Yeah, there's a lot of it depends there. I'll let Jeff address that a little bit. I mean, ultimately, you probably just want to get it over within one fail swoop um, to just, you know, get the, minimize the disruption. But that means shutting it down and you're not going to have revenue. And some, some other communities opt to try to do it one piece at a time so they can try to keep some revenue coming in. But um, I don't know, Jeff, I mean, how long total do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, ideally, you would do everything at once. It's the most cost effective and time efficient way. But um, I can say from experience, it rarely happens that way. Um, if you were to go all in on this course um, right now and pursue all the improvements and you had a good contractor and good weather and everything, um, you could probably expect nine to 12 months um, of it being closed uh, for the renovation. But if you go with a more phased approach, um, then obviously there's a whole range of um, timelines that you could get into depending on 
whether you want to close nine at a time and, and keep nine open for play or, you know, do certain items on this list one year and, and do it the next year. That's that's really where a long term master plan is going to help you. It's actually kind of a roadmap into your future. And through that exercise, you'll find out, you know, what the highest priorities are um, and what the phasing of all this work could look like. Um, again, in an ideal world, you do it all at once and just be done with it, but um, that's not always realistic. Thank you. And I just have um, one more question and then a comment. Um, how much is a membership or a season pass currently and what would be the recommendation? I didn't, I didn't see it. If, I apologize if I didn't read it correctly. Uh, I forgot what that number is. it out I don't remember off the top of my head I believe it's about $2,000 um, yeah I was gonna say Richard you might be able to correct me but what I have here in my latest list from January 1st 2021 is the annual single pass is $1,930 for um, yes. a couple it's $3,090 and for single weekdays only it's uh, $1,150 and for senior week, limited weekdays only couple, it's $1,840 for right. uh, annual passes. Right, right. And there are many of them. I mean, I think that the numbers that I was given, there's only like 115 total um, of these memberships that, have, that are out there uh, in, in the public. So the vast majority of play uh, at Bennett Valley is uh, a single, single use pay for play. Thank you. So my only other question is um, for those that were on the task, task force, did we work with the chamber in any way around this and how to work on promotion or do we do that typically in this circumstance? And, and thank you so much for your thorough answers. I appreciate it. I'm gonna kick it over to the uh, chair of the ad hoc for a response. Thank you and thank you for the question. We did not work with the chamber. Um, th the concepts of promotion will be partially dependent on um, what, what exactly we do out there uh, and how we improve it, when we improve it. Um, but I'm sure that that conversation will be taking place when, when we can offer a fairly clear picture as to what we're planning on improvements and a timeline as well. Um, and then uh, they probably won't, e won't be the only um, organization that we enlist for uh, recommendations and involvement as well, because it is a community asset. But thank you. And I will mention, and I uh, mentioned at a previous discussion on this, my intention is to keep the ad hoc uh, in place up through the new contractor taking uh, effect. And then in the past, Santa Rosa has had a standing committee on golf that has allowed for public participation in partnerships with the chamber and other organizations that would like to participate. Uh, my intention is once we have the new operator in place for some of these longer term issues to reconstitute that standing committee uh, as that avenue for public engagement on these topics. Are there any other questions from council? I think, Jen, the only question that I uh, have, and I know the answer to it, but I also know the public wants to keep hearing a response, is with the approval tonight, does this keep us on track to have continuity of play at the golf course? I know that that's been the chief concern that a lot of folks have, and, and actually when I hear the, the nine to 12 month uh, uh, timeline for making these changes, one of the things that I'm particularly weary of is uh, don't lose a captive audience, right? That we've been through the pandemic, you have people who've started to play, we've seen this increase, we know that we have these investments that we need to make, so how do we make sure that we don't lose people by losing continuity of play, uh, particularly through the new operator, but then also as we talk about the uh, investments that we need to make in the course? Right, I 100% I, I agree. One of the primary targets we've had is looking at these two ways of moving forward um, with a management company that will allow us to provide that continuity of service, get as close as we can to within three to five days 
hopefully zero days without golf. Um, but we're looking at, you know, possibly a maximum of five days without golf tee times. But um, with this management operation and approval of the scope of services tonight, we'll be in uh, a good position to be able to have um, continuity of operation starting July 1st. Great. That's Thank good. you. Mm -hmm. And Richard, when you've seen other communities go through this approach, have you typically seen one operator that specializes in all three at the same time? Or do you see partnerships where maybe there's two partners that come in with a proposal where one specializes in the event center and the 19th hole type of the situation and one one's the golf operator? What do you typically see? Uh, typically both. I mean, there there are certainly um, operators, entities out there who, who uh, you know, feel confident and have the experience to do all three elements of a golf operation. But others may look at this opportunity as unique and recognize that the Bennett Valley offering is unique. And in order to put their best foot forward in their bid toward the city, they may look to bring in a, a more of a restaurant food and beverage type partner um, to, to augment their bid and say, well, you know, we can run the golf and we'll help. We'll get some help from another entity who can help us with the event center. Great. Thank you. Let's go ahead and go to public comment on this item. I know there's uh, quite a few folks in attendance on Zoom. If you are interested in providing comment, hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom function. I'll also look to the chambers to see if we have a public comment here. Go ahead, Mr. DeWitt. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. I'm quite concerned about this whole endeavor. It's been a situation that appears to be a bit of a white elephant. I would offer full privatization and a private entity to fund everything is the best thing for the taxpayers. Right now, Mr. Singer had said, the city income barely covers expenses. He also pointed out that the maintenance budget is not well tracked. The thing that was most important to me was he said, the city has to ask itself what it wants. So with that in mind, that would mean rather, what do the citizens and the taxpayers for the entire city want? Said there was currently 115 memberships. That's all in a city of 180,000 people. Also said uh, that the funds may, depending upon weather and other situations, cover the expenses that come up. A question you should ask before you make any decision tonight is, how many people actually use this course? I didn't hear that in this discussion in the sense of on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis. And how many of those people are Santa Rosa residents? That's important because it's been almost 25 years since Santa Rosa was looking to do another golf course in the past. And this gentleman tonight pointed out that some golf courses have closed. Santa Rosa didn't need to do another golf course. At the turn of the century, the city came forward with an idea that they would do a place to play park and that there would be a Santa Rosa Youth Athletic Field Trust that would help to make that park a reality. That park is still struggling. It has never even obtained its basic potential. So you have an entire west side of the city hoping that a place to play park will get finished up 20 years down the road. And here you're dealing with this golf course, which became a problem through mismanagement of a highly paid city employee. So I would really recommend and ask that you reach out to the entire city, not just the Bennett Valley Save the Golf Course folks. Reach out, do some sort of a survey, and say, young people, are you going to go out here and do this? Give it a thought. Maybe go home and watch uh, Caddyshack or Happy Gilmore and get those young people laughing about golf, and they might get on out there. Carl, the assistant greenkeeper, mentioned he had made a hybrid grass, Kentucky bluegrass and Northern California Cincinnati. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. 
Uh, and I will respond just really quickly. Whenever we do an approval for any park or any amenity for the city, we do reach out to everybody, including our youth. So I do want to just make that clear. I'll come back to Andrew, followed by Steve on Zoom. Yeah, this is Andrew Smith. Um, one thing I did not hear tonight uh, on the combining of the golf course operations with the restaurant, did anyone look at the situation with Windsor? Uh, do they have a single vendor for both the golf course and the restaurant? Uh, and then they subcontract it out for the restaurant. I know my wife and I go there periodically. It does not seem to cater to the golfers. And I will make a comment that, you know, most golfers don't really use the, um, uh, the restaurant when it was open, uh, other than getting some drinks and everything. So has anyone looked at what Windsor is doing as a reference point? That's number one. Uh, I understand the need to invest, and I think that's great because it's lacking. Uh, we just can't drive up the cost to play too much. This is a competitive business, and there's lots of good public golf courses around real nearby. So keep that in mind. Uh, as far as the trees issue, uh, trees are part of Benna Valley Golf Course, and they've grown up, and uh, it's like a forest out there. You just learn to deal with it. Uh, but I haven't had any issues or seen issues of people being hit by golf balls. Uh, I know time is of the es essence, um, but uh, I would hope you would look at the Windsor situation, uh, what they're doing uh, to guide you through this. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go to Steve. Yeah, thank you, um, Mayor Rogers and uh, the rest of the city council. I appreciate the, uh, the presentation and um, um, I just like to reinforce the, the, the community here you know, citywide and as well as other uh, members of other cities here that are appreciative of the asset that the city of Santa Rosa provides the public. Um, this, the, the Benna Valley Golf Course is an amazing asset here in, the, in our community and the use by, I think, all members of the community, old, young and new golfers, is is something that the city needs to support uh, along with the other amenities that the city has you know with the the parks the, the swimming pools um it's 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 a, a part of a comprehensive community outdoor ability to to use the the beautiful um environments that we enjoy here um i appreciate the the uh, input from um from Richard and, and, and Jeff on, on improving the golf course. And I think they're dead on with their assessment of the irrigation system and drainage as the uh, primary needs for the, to really improve the course out there. I think that's the, the biggest asset that, or the biggest need for the asset. Um, and I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I hope that the city approves this, um, this uh, proposal and moves forward with, um, golf operations and we can figure out a way to 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 integrate the the improvements with continuing play i think that's a pretty easy thing to do out there i think the the folks who play out there have been used to the to the, the struggles that the, our existing maintenance staff have, have gone through to try to keep this this course operational and, and frankly have done a fantastic job of with bubble gum and bailing wire to keep that that golf course as playable and beautiful as it is and I will say for the, the restaurant operations, um, the, the patio out there is the best sit in Sonoma County. You, you sit out there uh, in an afternoon like we had this afternoon. And if, if we don't utilize that asset for the entire community, um, we're, we're wasting an asset that is, is underutilized at this point. So I think getting that op the restaurant operations back up and running and optimizing them for folks who golf and folks who don't golf it's a it's a great setting and uh, a great place for us to enjoy our community and i hope that there's an opportunity to bring in folks with the expertise for restaurant operations for event operations i think that's a, a good place to bring that into into play as well so i appreciate uh, your time and uh, thank you all right thank you steve do we have any pre-recorded voicemails we do not mayor all right, I'm going to bring it back to council. 
Uh, Richard, one of the questions that was asked was specifically about looking towards Windsor and lessons learned from that golf course. Could you talk a little bit about what your process was and what you learned by looking at theirs? Yeah, I didn't look that closely specifically at Windsor. We looked at several others and there's a lot of different mixes of how these things can be run. But I think the primary uh, finding that we came up with is that focusing on that a food and beverage operation at a golf course should focus on the golfers. That's your primary source. And I think a good operator, a smart operator is going to do that and to make sure that the golfers are happy and comfortable. And then if there's additional revenue, they can pick up with some other events or restaurant activity and things like that, they'll do it. But the priority is for, for the golfers. And I think that that's really the main part of our focus on in our recommendations. And, and Mayor, if I could chime in, I have had conversations with uh, Windsor operators and uh, they concur with Richard's point, which is the restaurant, even though they attend and they try to uh, support the uh, golf operations and the golfers themselves, it, it is just it's just not the place that they're interested in going either during or after uh, the round of golf. And so um, while I know that there's interest in trying to make that convenient, uh, that that's the discussion that I had with Windsor's operator. All right, thank you so much, Jason, and thank you for your work on this. Uh, Councilmember Sawyer, let's put a motion on the table for discussion. Thank you, Mayor. So I'm going to introduce a motion to approve, let's see, hold on a second, to approve a scope of services for management of Bennett Valley Golf Course, and number two, authorize release of requests for, uh, for proposals, RFP, to solicit for a single operator management organization to operate and maintain the Bennett Valley Golf Course and restaurant, and three, to approve and review, to approve the review committee composition, and four, delegate authority to the city manager or designee to further modify the scope of work and or the RFP process and com composition of the review committee, provided such changes are consistent with or do not otherwise conflict with council direction. That's it. We have a motion from council member Sawyer. A second from council member McDonald. Do we have any discussion on the item? Council member McDonald. I just had a question if we reached out to the Santa Rosa city schools to find out if they had golf teams at any of the high schools and what facility they currently use or if they would be interested in working with us on, on something on the Bennett Valley Golf Course for their golf teams? Well, it's a good question. And I, I think that, you know, once we have a, um, a, a company in place that's looking to uh, help us move forward in the reparations of the golf course, you know, with, with their, as, as a, you know, the management company themselves would be very interested in, uh, I would believe, in furthering their visibility as a, the golf course's visibility and, and coming up with creative um, possibilities like you just mentioned to increase increase play at the golf course. So they will be, um, th that's part of the reason to have a management company uh, is they will have um, good ideas, not, you know, not unlike the one you just mentioned, to uh, increase play at the golf course once the uh, reparations are, are in place and the management of those reparations. And I'll also share in doing outreach and talking with neighbors, uh, the stories that I heard that were the most impactful were when parents were telling me about how important it was to their kids to be able to play there. And that if particularly when one of the things that we had talked about was potentially moving it into an executive course to make it shorter and faster to play, that would make them ineligible for a lot of uh, hosting of other high schools and their own high schools to play. Uh, so that was one of the big concerns that I heard repeatedly from folks was make it accessible to kids, make it accessible to, to our high school youth and give them a place to be able to play. So I do want to share that. And if I could, Mayor, um, I, I would like to um, especially thank before we take our vote, um, because the work is in place, um, Jen and her team for coming up with a scope of, of services that was amazingly comprehensive. It's a, it's a, a very well thought out um, and complete um, document 
that will help guide the selection of a, an operator uh, at the golf course. So um, thank you, Jen, for, and, and Jason as well. I mean, there are so many people involved in the, my, the ad hoc committee. Thank you for your diligence um, and meeting to, to help guide the, the, this, this um, process. Um, and the Save the, the Benna Valley Golf Course organization as well, that the, the, the represent um, not only the people in, in Bennett Valley, but citywide um, that were uh, heavily involved in um, helping to guide the decision making. Um, so no small amount of community uh, involvement there. And the National Golf Federation recommendations as well. I appreciate their uh, thoughtful recommendations and um, their uh, challenge to identify those issues that are most important to rectify as we move forward. I think that's being able to prioritize is going to be very, very important. Um, and having a plan in place um, it will be equally as important. And I look forward to that as well. Thank you, Council Member. <clears throat> Any other comments? Council Member Rogers. Um, I have a question. Uh, so let's say this is approved tonight um, and the RFP goes out and then they find someone that the funding, the money doesn't quite make sense. Um, then what happens? Uh, well, I would say that we, we do have a bit of funding right now in the golf course enterprise that we'll be looking at uh, going forward. And uh, we'll have options to consider on how to move forward, but there will be, um, we will be looking at it comprehensively. And I think it gets back to that uh, question that Richard asked on, as a city, how do we move forward with this? Do we um, keep it rolling or do we um, do we close it? And you know, our recommendation as well as the Bennett Valley Golf Course is to look at keep it going, look at keeping it going. Um, certainly the higher uh, cost of improving the golf course, we'll be coming back to the council with options on how to fund that. And I think it's a, it's gonna be um, an interesting discussion on how to move forward. And I know that Richard and his team have already done some early evaluation on how to fund those larger, um, larger construction issues. But uh, as far as operational needs, I think we're looking at a smaller, um, a smaller dollar amount moving forward. And I think it's something we'll be able to consider as we move forward and uh, make, those, um, make those considerations at that time. Uh, but in order to get there, we've, we've got to have, we've got to get started with the RFP process. And I don't know, Richard, if you have anything else to um, add as far as your early financial analysis so far. Well, I, I think the only thing I would, would add to that is, is, is in the way uh, council, councilman's question, is there short-term and long-term implications of that? I think short-term, it looks like you've got it covered, that you should be able to deal with the transition to get this up and running on July 1st. But longer term, you know, if, if a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, you're operating with your management company and the city is taking full control of Bennett Valley and you find that you're not operating profitably, then I think you're gonna have to, you might have to revisit this at some point, you know, down the road as to how you're running it. Um, we project that you will be able to do it profitably, but, it's a, it's a tough business and you're at the mercy of things you can't control, like, like I mentioned earlier. So the, there's always a possibility that it may not work out. But short term, I think you look covered. Long term, it's just a wait and see. So through the mayor, Council Member Rogers. <laughs> um, one of the things that we could look at is doing a loan from our general fund. But at this time, we don't have a way to pay for this item. So the RFP goes out, but nothing is signed until we actually have a way to to fund to fund this. 
Right, the RFP will go out, um, we'll, be, we'll receive the proposals back. Uh, RFP's uh, standard, uh, 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 as a routine basis, uh, um, do include a provision that um, all proposals can be rejected. Um, if we got to the point where we received the proposals, the proposals did not pencil out, uh, that would be an option. Um, we would be also looking at what financing, um, at my understanding from um, um, from Jen is that we will be bringing that separately, kind of the funding element of this all uh, to you. Um, and I don't know the timing, how that, you know, what, the exact timing of that in, in connection with the RFP responses. And, and if I can, if I can help out as well, we're, we're talking about uh, two different things. One is the RFP for the continuity of services at the golf course. Uh, that's what we're talking about tonight. The other, and I think the question's getting conflated, okay. is the $7 million price tag for the immediate needs and then the potential additional six that were in there. Though Those are s separate from this conversation about the continuity of services, though could be accounted for in the RFP. Um, what I heard from Richard and what I've heard from the team consistently is with the funds existing in the enterprise fund, we we are fairly confident about the transition into a new operator, but then the long-term aspects or the long-term investments, those are what we'll have to talk about either through uh, the way that it's managed or uh, other types of funding that comes from the city. Thank you. So when you say that we have the, for the, for the transition, does that mean that we have the, uh, 6.5 million dollars? No. I, so we've got... Uh, you're, you're saying it's it's two different things, but for me it's the same thing. If I'm putting out an RFP, that's like me going and looking for a contractor to do work on my house, and I know I don't have enough money in my bank account to cover the, the contractor. And so for me, I, I look at it, it's all connected. Well, I think part of it uh, the list of improvements that need to be made, one, have not been signed off on by the city. So as the city attorney said, she'll probably need to have folks from the city go out and do some of the assessment as well. Uh, and that we haven't prioritized it as a council either. So for example, the recommendation about not being able to see uh, onto the, the next course over, the next hole over, and the potential of not knowing to call for, in the in the meantime, when I know Tom's on the course, I'm just going to assume that I'm going to hear four and keep my, my wits about me. That might not be the top priority of what we're going to invest in. So we haven't had that conversation yet. What we're talking about is keeping the course open and accessible with a new operator and then talking about a long-term strategy after that to make the investments to make it a better course. Right now, it's a functional course. It does need irrigation, it does need either other upgrades, but right now it's functional. I, I was just playing it not too long ago. And so that's kind of what we're, that's why I'm saying it's kind of two separate conversations. I do see that May Alan, I do see that Alan is waiting to be promoted as well, so he might be able to weigh in. And, and Mayor, I could offer, if, if possible, uh, some additional discussion as well. Um, I think one of the comments that Richard made early on is, is revenue associated with golf play and with operations of the restaurant and event center equal roughly about four and a half million dollars annually. That's the fund source that would end up paying for the maintenance or for the management contract uh, that we would like to solicit for right now. Um, that's irregard irrespective of future capital investment. But from an operational perspective, it's the revenue stream from golf operations and the restaurant operations and event center that would pay for the management company's uh, uh, cost of providing service. Right, and if I may add on to that, the well, what we could do with this under this option is that it provides us the time to allow us to figure out what a financing plan would look like, how we could uh, move forward to, from either a financing standpoint or to a loan standpoint, whatever it may take in order to do that, yet still maintain the operations going at its current current way. So it buys the city some, some time to figure out the, 
the more longer term on it. Thank you. Is there any more, Council Member Sawyer? Thank you, Mayor. Um, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I, I don't think it is um, necessarily fair to compare the future of this golf course and its operation with the past. Um, we have a, a major uh, opportunity here. Uh, we have um, funding available to begin part of the work. Um, we have an obligation as an enterprise fund to make this asset um, fully sustainable, independent of the general fund. Might there be some, some play in that uh, it, temporarily? Yes, potentially. Um, the, we may be uh, looking for um, alternative funding, uh, but also what Alan mentioned was that there are opportunities there but we are, uh, we are, we have an obligation that this be a self-sustaining uh, property um, and asset for the city at, because that, as, as an enterprise fund, that that is the nature of it um, and that we will um, endeavor to do that. And it, according to the National Golf Federation recommendations, they believe that that the, the, the future um, is bright for the golf course but not inexpensive, in, especially in the, uh, in the short and midterm. Um, but we have to look to the future. And Santa Rosa, um, I think, is, will, will be looking at this asset um, differently after the uh, repairs are made and the, uh, the community has full use of the course again. Um, regardless of how we have to phase it, if, if we end up phasing it, which is probably what we would end up doing. Um, but I just, I think it's imp important not to look back at how it was run before and, and, and the lack of profit that came to the city. Um, that is part of what we are looking to change. That is part of, that is the dynamic and the paradigm that we are looking to change with this, with these recommendations. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, it, it's, we have to th be, you know, think boldly about this golf course. It is a, a major asset, and I don't, I don't think anyone would argue that. Um, but we need to, um, we, it needs investment. Uh, it has, there's a, a lot of deferred maintenance, um, and that was part of the um, uh, a lack of, of management and oversight at times um, that we are trying to correct. That is, that's, that is our task. And I'm, I'm hoping that it, that we, that the council gives this asset an opportunity to shine. Any other comments? Go for it, council member. Um, so I've been out to the Bennett Valley Golf Course and I cannot um, argue that it is a very beautiful asset that um, we have um, here at the city. Um, but I also can't, can't argue when I look at the price tag that that is very frightening for me, knowing that um, we have departments that we need to restore to full staff capacity, um, that we can increase our recreation staff and have uh, more programming, that we have roads that need um, improvements um, around the city, um, that we need help with our um, our unhoused residents. There, there are so many things that we need to do uh, within our city. So I, I am very concerned when I see something with such a high price tag um, and I look at those dollars and where they could just go towards uh, other things within our community or other projects um, within our community that to me uh, will touch and reach more people um, that live within our community, that live in the city of Santa Rosa. So um, I thank the ad hoc for all the work that they have done. Um, and I, I thank the groups within Bennett Valley that have been showing their passion. And I'm sorry for my, my line of questioning. Sorry, not, not so sorry, but 
um, like for my line of questioning. But I just, I'm looking at the price tag and it's just like, it's a lot when I'm thinking of all the other things that we can do in our community to help so many, um, so many people. So that is uh, my line of questioning and why I'm asking the question is because I don't want to put the cart before the horse and us not knowing. And then we will have to figure out how we're going to pay for something when we've already gone so far down a road. So thank you. Council Member McDonald. Just for clarification, under fiscal impact for the staff report, I see that there is no fiscal impact on general fund as far as we moving for us moving forward on an RFP process, and that will not have a fiscal amp impact at all in the general fund, and that there was a revenue due to cell phone towers of $50,000 a year that's currently coming in to general fund, if I'm not incorrect. So um, while I really appreciate your comments, um, Council Member Rogers, I do think that it's important for us to move forward to the uh, on the RFP process to continue to get the golf course up and running. And at a later time, we'll be able to come back and discuss the improvements and how we would be able to fund that um, through a different item, agenda item, if I'm, if I'm reading this all correctly. <laughs> so thank you. And Jason, did you want to jump in there? Okay. Any other comments? Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Whether, we're, whether we realize it or not, the decision to fund and fix this project was made probably before Legends was introduced into the property. Uh, the reality is that we as a public entity created this issue, and I think that we're morally obligated to fix the issues that exist on this property, irrigation being one of them. And I will remind folks that this is indeed an enterprise district or an asset. Unlike a park, we hope that it generates funds, makes revenue. And I'm reminding my father's words when he says, if you don't put in money, don't expect to get money. Rosalind is a prime example of that. And thinking of housing and thinking of all the needs that we as Santa Rosas need, there are 175 acres of prime real estate land there that can easily compensate any investment that we make today or tomorrow. I don't want to see real estate developments on a gym. But ultimately, we must show our residents of Santa Rosa as a whole that we were willing to go the extra mile to achieve a yes. And that is why I'm confident in the investment that must be made for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. All right, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the vote? Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. Thank you, Council. So we, let's do a little time check here at 630. I do want us to get through item 15.1. That's the first of two public hearings tonight. Let's do that, take a quick dinner break, and then come back for item 15.2. Uh, just want to remind folks, we do have to make sure that our public hearings begin uh, prior to nine o'clock, otherwise we cannot hear them. So let's get 15.1, see where we're at, take a dinner break, and then come back for 15.2. Public hearing item 15.1 is a resolution authorizing filing a grant application for FTA section 5310 funds for purchase of replacement ADA paratransit vehicles. And this is a continuation item from February the 1st, 2022. Oh, there's been a change in them. 
and staff member, uh, Deputy, Director, Deputy Director Ede will be presenting the, the report. Thank you. Actually, um, there, there is a little bit of a change there. Uh, Yuri Koslin, our transit planner, will present the item tonight, but I will be here as well to provide any uh, additional um, information that's needed. Sorry about that. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Mayor, Council, thank you for your time. Uh, we're here tonight uh, for a public hearing and resolution authorizing the filing of a grant application for FTA Section 5310 funds for um, Americans with Disability Act, uh, basically ADA paratransit vehicles. Next slide. Um, these, this grant is a, uh, is a federal grant, Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 program. It's authorized under Title 43. Um, the funds are to improve mobility for seniors and persons with disabilities. It's administered through Caltrans. So Caltrans is the recipient of the 5310 funds and is responsible for administering these funds. Next slide. So uh, the 5310 grant has two project types. There's the traditional, which is uh, funding of vehicles or equipment. And then there's the expanded, which um, the goal is to kind of expand the paratransit services provided. The city is applying for the traditional program. Um, there are um, other community organizations that uh, historically have, uh, and, and for this round of grant uh, uh, that, that are um, seeking funding under the expanded program. Uh, here at City Bus, uh, we do continue to look at those funds as, as, a, as a possible source for different uh, programs. And uh, as we kick off the uh, short range transit plan process, here um, in, in the summer, we'll, we'll be seeking the public's input on um, different services we can provide, which some of those may be able to be funded in the future through the expanded program. But for tonight, we're talking about the traditional program. Next slide. So the traditional application process uh, requires public agencies like ourselves to certify that there are no other nonprofit agencies readily available to provide the proposed services. Readily available means willing, interested, and capable of providing the proposed services at similar cost to the same clientele, same service area, with the same hours of frequency and an equivalent level of service. And next slide. So just a quick on what the paratransit services and what, what these vehicles would be used for. So Santa Rosa paratransit is essentially a uh, required um, requirements by the federal, the federal Transit Administration. Essentially, all transit agencies that have fixed route buses are required to provide paratransit services within three quarters of a mile of this of that fixed route. And these are for people who can't all the time access a uh, city bus. Um, the services provided with city-owned vehicles and city-contracted operations. Um, other nonprofits may competitively apply for the funds in the traditional program even if not replacing our paratransit services. Historically, we have sought these traditional funds and in 2017, we asked for five vehicles and were awarded four. 2019, we asked for seven vehicles and were awarded one. Um, and, and now we're uh, seeking um, some of those seven vehicles in, in this application process. Next slide. So the vehicles that we are requesting are, are um, gas vehicles, um, and they're not electric, so we want to make sure that we address uh, that concern uh, as city buses leading an effort to um, build chargers and electrify our fixed route fleet. Um, the, the, the state uh, requirement to start purchasing um, fixed route vehicles that are uh, electric does not apply to the paratransit gasoline vehicles. Um, in 2026, this, this may change. Um, but uh, currently, there, there, uh, there are no vehicles that, at least that, that, are, avail that are available uh, to use federal funds um, uh, that are electric vehicles. So the, 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 the electric vehicle market is quite limited. Um, and, um, and, and we're still waiting on our infrastructure to get built. So there's, there's a number of unknown factors. But as we, in the next round uh, that we seek for paratransit vehicle replacement, we expect to, to take another look at this. 
Next slide. So uh, we're holding this public meet, public hearing to meet the federal 5310 requirement to determine if any private nonprofit is readily available to provide paratransit services within the city. Of, within the city. Um, we're, we're ensuring that nonprofits within Santa Rosa have been notified of this opportunity and are able to comment on 5310 uh, on our application. Um, we've uh, published a notice uh, of this public hearing in the Press Democrat. Um, we've also directly emailed uh, all the available, uh, the avail the, a list of nonprofits that we're aware of that include 35 nonprofits and governmental organizations letting them know that this public hearing was occurring and that we are um, seeking um, the funding for these vehicles. Um, and, and just to date, uh, staff have not received any correspondence that there are not that there are any nonprofits that are avail available and ready to provide this service. So we're we're also so we're also seeking the beyond beyond the public hearing. We want to seek the that the city manager or designee is um, authorized to execute and file a grant application with Caltrans for the for the FTA Section 5310 program to purchase uh, these five replacement ADA paratransit vehicles. Next slide. So the benefits, um, you know, there's the community support, community supported service. This, this the, the paratransit service provides uh, trips for uh, many day programs and uh, many many services as well as individuals. Um, to date, we have received uh, the city has received eight letters of support for this application, including um, some of the very well known um, agencies in, in in Santa Rosa, including the Earl Baum Center for the of the blind. Uh, CHOPS team, team Club and Catholic Charities, to name a few. Um, this, the, this grant will allow us to modernize our, continue to modernize our fleet. Um, the majority of the grant, majority of our funds um, are grant funded and, and this grant covers the majority of the cost of the vehicles. And we just continue to invest in, in sustaining infrastructure here at the city. Next slide. So the recommendation, it is recommended by the Transportation and Public Works Department, the council, number one, hold a public hearing to determine whether any nonprofit is readily available to provide paratransit services to the city, and two, by resolution authorize the city manager or designee to execute and file a grant application with the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans, under Federal Transit Act, Section 5310, FTA C. 9070.1G to purchase five replacement ADA paratransit vehicles. With that, we'll take any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Yuri. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with just a couple of questions, uh, particularly around the electrification question. Uh, what is the timeline that we're talking about from submittal of the grant to award to purchase to actually seeing the vehicles on the road? Great question. Our um, our 2017 vehicles um, we were, got on the road about three years after the, the award. So um, so so that's I think that's that's you know and that that was during some COVID related issues. But I think three years is is an approximate time frame. And with the proposed upgrades that we have to the fleet yard, uh, will the electrification uh, capacity have increased enough to potentially have these vehicles? Um, at this point, you know, the, 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 the procurement um, options that we have for these vehicles do not include an electric, electric um, paratransit vehicle. Now these are, to keep in mind, these are smaller vehicles than our, than our larger 40 foot. Um, and the kind of the state focus is and and uh, and and the availability of vehicles on the market are really focused on these larger vehicles. Um, we have committed to having nine um, electric uh, 40 foot fixed route vehicles in place by 2025. Um, and, and that's going from zero right now. Uh, you know, we, ha we have four on order, but so including those four or five additional vehicles um, is, is the commitment that we have uh, agreed to. Um, 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, you, and you got to the core of where I was going with the, the question. Is it because, so we're not proposing the grant for electric ADA vehicles largely not because the city isn't trying to electrify our fleet, but because there's no option that's available currently in the marketplace. Correct. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the vehicles, of the smaller vehicles that require, that have the, 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 the it, under this grant would require a federal uh, testing, um, those vehicle, the, the, the size vehicle does not, has not gone through that testing process. Okay, that's um, really helpful, thank you. And if I could just chime in, Mayor, I just want to add, you know, one one thing that is a, a potential um, a plus is that, you know, these vehicles have a much shorter useful life than the fixed route buses. So fixed route buses we're replacing every 12 to 15 years. These vehicles, their useful life is only five years. So, you know, the, these vehicles we're purchasing now where we don't have that option to purchase electric vehicles will have a much shorter time frame to be back again to replace them and potentially then be uh, in, a, in a position where the market is providing uh, you know, an, a federally Altoona tested product and we will have further developed our charging infrastructure to be able to effectively charge them as well. So um, you know, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll have a chance again uh, uh, sooner than we do on the fixed route side to uh, replace these vehicles with electric. Great, that's really helpful, I appreciate that. Thank you, Rachel and Yuri. Let's see if there are any other questions. Council Member Fleming. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. The Mayor asked the majority of my questions, but the the last one is, is, is there a federal testing program in, in the works so that, because what I would hate to do is be here in five years again, is already giving me heartburn to buy more gas powered vehicles, period. So am I going to be doing that again in five years? Um, I know there are a number of uh, vehicle manufacturers that are waiting to get onto the Altoona course, and there are some that have uh, been through some of the early stages of that testing. Um, and then there's there's and then there's there's also the procurement mechanism. We typically use um, the state's uh, contract to that, that, that they've already that they procured through, and so then that that process also has to. Uh, um, to there has to be a new bid opportunity in which those manufacturers are able to put their electric vehicle on that bid in order for us to buy it. But yes, I I I, I at the conferences you you see the manufacturers just just waiting to line up to get their vehicles tested and uh, you know trying to get uh, get onto the bid. So I don't expect we'll be here um, in you know we have one paratransit vehicle that uh, is is kind of the next next in line for purchase that one may we may not be able to get it with that that particular vehicle but i would accept, expect in the next grouping of vehicles you would you would definitely see it um but we we will stay um um a uh, you know a abreast of any um new, new developments in that field for thank sure. you so much is there anything that we as a city can do to make sure that uh, the vehicles that do meet the federal testing guidelines do land on the state procurement list in terms of advocacy? Yeah, I'll take that one. Yeah, for sure. You know, we're working very closely with our industry association on, on these issues around electrification. Um, one, because of our, our interests along with the councils and climate action, but also because uh, we all are subject to the state mandates around transit fleet electrification that, as Yuri mentioned, extend to uh, paratransit vehicles uh, effective as soon as 2026. And I was going to mention that's one reason why I expect with a market the size of California and the thousands of paratransit vehicles operating in California, you know, I think we're going to see we're seeing a market response to really want to provide those vehicles as, as an option um, to, to meet that mandate. Um, but what we are certainly doing our part working through our statewide industry association uh, to promote uh, pushing the envelope of getting those vehicles available. And we are seeing movement at the state. For example, there is now the state contract we're using to buy our 40 foot buses. Um, that's that was uh, let a couple of years ago. Now we're, that's a mechanism that's available on the fixed route side. And uh, we know there is work underway to put together, uh, you know, a statewide contract for uh, uh, paratransit type vehicles as soon as as the market can provide uh, the tested you know federally uh, approved um, uh, fleet. So so I think uh, you know we're very active in that and um, can continue to uh, to work through um, our connections at the state and with our industry association to promote uh, moving the needle on that. 
That's great to hear. Thank you to you both. Any other questions from council? Councilmember McDonald. Well, my question was around, um, you know, the conversion of school buses right now is an initiative that's being proposed. And so I wasn't sure if this is a same type of vehicle or if it's, it's completely different than a school bus or if there was grant funds that we could potentially apply for later on down the road um, to actually convert our uh, gas to an electric vehicle or, or if it wouldn't even be appropriate. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's... Um... I mean, there there are just to be clear, there are um, vehicles of this size that are have aftermarket um, electric electrification to them. The, the in this particular funding uh, being federal uh, FTA funded, there's there's there, this this Altoona testing is required, and then to 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 in order for us to purchase, it has to be on a on a contract that is. That meets federal procurement guidelines. So those those two pieces limit us. Um, we we could go out. Um, at you know it, it, it is feasible. We haven't looked into it in terms of that five year time frame and trying to get a vehicle um, you know uh, you know um, converted to electric. But it's it's partly because that useful life is so short um, for the vehicle that that uh, we we typically. Um, would recommend that we just wait till that useful life's up and then see how see where the market is um, because for like school buses they have a much longer useful life um, and and so do our 40 foot buses they, like Rachel said they're, they're you know we keep them at least 12 if not 15 to 18 years whereas these are five um, so I think those are some of the, the factors that we're looking at but uh, I mean I I, I think yes All right, let's go ahead and go to public comment. This is a public hearing, so I'll go ahead and open the hearing. If you have a comment on this item, hit the raise hand feature on Zoom. I see no comments. Do we have any pre-recorded voicemails? We do not, Mayor. All right, I will close the public hearing. Bring it back for a motion from Council Member Fleming. Thank you. I'd like to move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa authorizing a grant application for federal funding under the Federal Transit Administration Section 5310, 49 USC Section 5310 program with the California Department of Tran Transportation and waive further reading of the text. Second. So we have a motion from Council Member Fleming and a second from Council Member Rogers. Any additional discussion? All right, let's call the vote. Councilmember Schwedhelm? Aye. Councilmember Sawyer? Aye. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember McDonald? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Yes. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. All right. Thank you so much, Yuri and Rachel. Let's go ahead and submit that grant. And Council, we will take a quick dinner break. We'll come back at 730 with item 15.2.
Welcome back. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you. Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Council Member Rogers? Present. Council Member McDonald? Here. Council Member Fleming? Present. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present. All right, let's go to item 15.2, please. Item 15.2 is a public hearing on fiscal year 22-23 budget priorities. Mayor Rogers. My apologies. <laughs> Sorry, Alan. <laughs> the, the presentation will be delivered by Chief Financial Officer uh, Alan Alton. Uh, and, and I'll cut him off really fast as well and say congratulations to Alan uh, and thank you for stepping up into the CFO position. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, Mayor Rogers and members of the council, the item before you now is a budget priorities public hearing for the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. Uh, next slide, please. So to foster public engagement in the city's budget process and to be consistent with the city charter, we are requesting that the city council hold a public hearing seeking oral and written comment from the public on budget priorities for the upcoming year. The charter states that this public hearing must occur before council goal setting process and no later than March 31st. At any point, the public can submit uh, input, written input on the budget online at www.srcity.org slash budget comments. Next slide, please. So this hearing essentially kicked off our budget process. Uh, we will do the goal setting uh, next week on February 24th and 25th. Departments are currently uh, developing and inputting their budgets and the, uh, uh, the city manager and the CFO will review those. Uh, and council will review the department budgets through our uh, normal two-day uh, budget workshop study session on May 10th and 11th. And then uh, we'll have the draft document of the fiscal year 22-23 budget available to the public June 6th with the adoption hearing held on June 21st. Next slide, please. So with, unless there are any questions of me or other staff, uh, we would request the mayor open the public hearing. Thank you, Alan. Let's see if there are any questions from council members before we open the public hearing and hear from the public. Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. If you're interested in providing comments on budget priorities leading into our goal setting meeting next week, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. I see no hands. Did we have any voicemail public comments? We did not, Mayor. Okay. We will go ahead and close the public hearing then. Uh, we do have ample opportunity to continue to solicit input from folks. Uh, I'd encourage council members to continue to talk with your districts as well. And when we have our goal setting next week to bring those ideas and those priorities forward. Are there any additional comments from the council? Okay. Thank you, Alan. That was quick, and <laughs> we appreciate the presentation. Let's go back now to item 14.3. Report item 14.3 is appropriation of funds for one-time programs and approval of limited-term media service services technician for three years. The report will be given by Chief Financial Officer Alton. All right, Major or Mayor Rogers and members of the council, uh, this item, we can go on to the next page, page please. Uh, this item is the culmination of several city council study sessions and public outreach 
where we have discussed the funding of programs with one-time money. Uh, initially, we, we uh, discussed programs with PG&E settlement funds uh, beginning back, I, I believe it was in the fall of 2020. And then beginning in July of 2021, we included uh, American Rescue Plan or ARPA funds uh, programs in those discussions. So far, the council has appropriated or committed $88 million of uh, PG&E settlement funds to major initiatives in the city including fire resiliency projects, fire recovery projects, contribute, uh, contributions to the Renewal Enterprise District, or the RED, contribute, or contributions to the Roseland Library, and, and the commitment of fiscal recovery funds uh, in the general fund to uh, secure the, the general fund's fiscal stability moving forward. This left approximately, or this left $7 million available for programming. Uh, the projects in this item are those that received consensus to move forward at the November 30th, 2021 study session. Admittedly, this item does not go into detail of those programs as we did on November 30th or in previous study sessions. Uh, the council provided us with uh, what seemed like good direction to proceed with these programs in November. And this um, item here basically formalizes or, or formalizes the two spending plans uh, with the council action to appropriate the funds. For the ARPA programs, I did write out a more detailed spending plan, which was, uh, provides fuller detail of the programs. And that was attached to the staff report uh, and will be included as uh, um, uh, potentially included in our reporting going forward with U.S. Treasury. Next slide, please. So for the uh, ARPA funds, uh, staff reviewed and presented council projects that would be eligible and uh, would fit within the city's total funding allocation. Uh, which was uh, about $34.6 million. Uh, we had a working group of eight city staff uh, from different departments and different disciplines. They reviewed the project with an eye toward diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as sustainability and impact on the economy, uh, especially for those uh, impacted businesses and individuals. Based on discussions at the November 30th study session, we added the construction of the Roseland Community Center at $10 million to the list. We made the funding fit by removing the fiber backbone project that was not yet project ready and removed the COVID-19 testing programming uh, as we are currently being reimbursed under the FEMA program, which is providing 100% reimbursement. And we also made some minor adjustments to the third year of the homeless services budget to bring us within the total allocation amount. So of the amount allocated to the city of $34,637,465, we are at $34,637,000. Uh, the program funding for this, all expenditures of ARPA funds must be spent by December 31st of 2026. Next slide, please. This is a visual representation of how the ARPA spending dollars are um, allocated through the different types of uh, broad program definitions that ARPA gives. So they're not necessarily the ones that, that, that we used as we were going forward, um, but it does, it's, it's when we start totaling up and show it as uh, in a pie chart, and basically what you're seeing with this is that the majority of our funding is going toward 
uh, uh, social programs out in the community um, included within the services for disproportionately impacted families is the construction of the uh, Roseland Community uh, Center. Next slide, please. So in the, uh, the next few slides, uh, I list out the, the programs that were included uh, within the plan uh, that you saw on November 30th. So under that broad category of services for impacted families, we have the after school programs at affordable housing, housing sites. Uh, this is where we were, uh, uh, we would um, uh, do programming within the, uh, the Burbank housing uh, sites there. Expand the recreation summer programs. So this is going from four programs to six programs. And I believe uh, it would help serve an additional 250 uh, youth. Um, there's the Guaranteed Basic in Income Program, which we will partner with uh, Sonoma County, um, and uh, uh, funds would go to uh, um, families within Santa Rosa and within the Qualified Census Tract. There's the Children's Savings Account, which is a 529 plan run by uh, um, uh, First Five, and in this program, there, there has been some uh, um, discussion about this one. Uh, we were able to confirm that it does work. Uh, uh, it is, it is el eligible and in, even better in that uh, because the families that would receive this funding uh, would be considered beneficiaries, once the subrecipient, which is first five, distributes our funds uh, to the community um, then, uh, or to the eligible uh, families within the community, uh, it would be off our books. So that would be one that we would, uh, uh, that, that we would be done with from our accounting. And uh, we were able to get this confirmed from Treasury. Uh, there was some question of whether if, if the, the family didn't use it for whatever reason, uh, down the road, or if the funding existed beyond 2026, would, would this count under the ARPA rules? And we were able to get the, the clarification that it would, so we're, we're good to go with this. Youth immigration attorney, uh, this is an attorney that would uh, help uh, um, uh, children uh, move through the immigration process and basically support them specifically. And then we talked about the Roseland Community Center. This would be uh, $10 million construction of a, of a facility uh, um, at, the, um, uh, at the Hearn Avenue site in, in, uh, in Roseland. And that would be combined with uh, the library and, um, and the fire station. So it's a, grand project there. This is one, one part of it. Next slide, please. So we also had a number of services allowed under ARPA for unhoused individuals. There was the safe parking with wraparound services. And this, uh, as I note with the asterisk, this is actually previously approved and appropriated by the council, but I'm including it here. So it's officially part of our uh, uh, spending plan as, as we go there and we have it in one lump. Um, there is the, uh, um, the ability to fund our homeless services programs uh, through ARPA um, uh, through that. So there's uh, about nine point, almost $9.5 million there. That should do about uh, easily two years and into the third year of homeless services, uh, um, uh, homeless services. And then we have the Samuel Jones Hall Capital Project. This is to install uh, more permanent uh, uh, bathroom and shower facilities and other uh, uh, capital 
uh, project at Samuel Jones Hall in the annex. And then I apologize, there's an error on this slide when we talk about behavioral health services. That is really just a header. The, the 1.5 million was left over from another slide, so you can disregard that. Under behavioral health, this is it's kind of a um, probably not the best uh, um, way to describe our end response unit, but it does it does hit a lot of those characteristics. So that is the uh, the funding for that, which. Uh, I believe is would bring that to a 24-7 operation. And then uh, next slide, please. We have uh, uh, services for impacted businesses. So we have uh, the Small Business Tenant Improvement Program and the Child Care Facility Grant. These are grant programs. So once the money is granted away, it doesn't come back to the city, which falls within ARPA uh, guidelines. And this allows uh, for um, us to be able to have businesses provide tenant improvements to um, uh, help uh, in um, blighted areas. Excuse me, let me find my notes here. Um, because staff did a wonderful job describing this. It, it, it's um, the, the tenant improvement part is an investment for commercial retail buildings with storefront businesses. Uh, it encourages retenanting uh, re uh, of vacant sites to encourage economic development and avoid reduced blight by enhancing the physical appearance, of commercial viability, and of course, we are targeting the qualified census track areas for this to fall within uh, ARPA guidelines. And then the child care support program, this is, uh, and, uh, and we're adding on to an existing program that we started under the uh, initial COVID relief funds that came out. And basically, this will also be administered as a grant, will include an emergency fund component uh, to provide faster, easier access to funds and address ca catastrophic facility events as a result of flooding or other unanticipated emergencies. And again, these would also be uh, for use within the city limits uh, focused in the qualified census tract. And finally, we have the ARPA program support, um, which uh, we have been able to use uh, to provide guidance and not only the eligibility of programs, but now moving forward will be the reporting and, uh, and other work to make sure that we are within guidance. Um, with my understanding of, of some of the other federal programs that we've done, uh, these types of, of programs with, uh, there is a significant amount of reporting that, that is required, and to have somebody provide uh, um, uh, subject matter expertise in uh, providing that type of reporting is invaluable to us. Next slide, please. So, as with the ARPA spending plan, the council at the November 30th meeting provided consensus uh, to move forward with certain programs and to add additional programs to the list. So those two programs were the down payment assistance program that we determined wouldn't be ARPA eligible. And then a uh, local match for funds for vegetation management grants, which promotes fire resiliency. The council identified three programs, the South Santa Rosa specific plan, the uh, Roseland Creek Park project, and board and commission, uh, commission member stipend as programs that could be replaced to add in these other, uh, those other two programs. Um, the, the down payment assistance program is uh, about $2 million with the vegetation management uh, local match at one point. Uh, 225 million. Um, 
Unfortunately, the addition of these two programs put the total spending plan over the $7 million of available PG&E funds. However, unlike the ARPA funds where there's a strict allocation cap, in the case of PG&E overage, it means that you would just draw from your uncommitted general fund reserves to cover the difference. And given the true one-time nature of these programs, that would be a reasonable action to take. Next slide, please. So this is a visual representation of how these programs, since they, uh, a lot of them are focused within the city organization, although some do go uh, out into the community, but the manage management of these programs is split within a number of different departments. Um, so even though I may mention that, that, that one uh, may be part of community engagement or HR or like that, it's actually impacting a number of, of uh, uh, departments within the city. So in case like, say the equity training or public records management or translation services, those are gonna impact, while they may be managed in one area, they're gonna impact the uh, the whole organization that's through that. Next slide, please. So these are also the um, uh, programs laid out. There's more of them with the PG&E. There's a bit smaller dollar value uh, to make up the seven or eight million dollars worth. I go through them uh, um, briefly. So we do have the translation services. This is for oral and written translation. And uh, this is uh, meant to be a, uh, um, a, a starting point for this. We know the translation services are needed not only uh, at the, uh, for council meetings and for other meetings and for uh, uh, notices throughout the city, uh, it's right now is so spread out that trying to come up with an actual cost of it was difficult. We estimated this. I, I would imagine that this is probably going to last a couple of years. It would allow us to uh, develop a better budget for this going forward. Um, we have the Youth Council uh, that will um, be uh, uh, foster youth engagement uh, within the city. We have the enhanced infrastructure financing district. This will uh, help us with um, doing that within the downtown. This is for consultant services there. There's an intern program uh, that, that will hopefully allow us to get uh, more uh, 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 foster uh, uh, more interest in working uh, within the city, um, utilizing uh, uh, schools, I believe. Um, as I fumble my way through some of these here, I'll let you know that we do have staff that is ready to jump in and they're probably kicking me virtually under the table right now. Um, we have community equity uh, capacity building uh, that's through our community engagement program. And then we have city staff equity capacity building that is more of an organizational, uh, city organizational program, which is led out of our uh, DEI office within HR. The next slide, please. I'll lay it up. We have DEI spaces, which is a community engagement program that would allow for uh, 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 spaces in the community uh, for for people to uh, um, uh, have safe spots to come together and um, come together. Uh, there are the equity plan uh, prioritized rec uh, recommendations from SEED. Uh, so this uh, is three hundred thousand dollars. We're not sure exactly what those recommendations are, but this is a placeholder for that. There's budget for the community empowerment plan, which was uh, um, uh, uh, part of the community engagement budget that did not have a budget associated with it. So this provides that. 
We had the uh, plan check and inspection contract services in planning and economic development. Uh, this addresses uh, bottlenecks uh, in that side. And then we also have the fire plan review contract services that's on the fire side of uh, planning and economic development at $500,000. We'll have an equity data dashboard that for 50,000 that would be run out of, um, uh, again, out of the DEI group there that will allow the public to see how we are doing in meeting our equity goals. We have the public records management upgrade on the next uh, uh, slide. Um, uh, uh, and this will allow us to upgrade our ability to um, do uh, public records uh, requests and things like that. This is a huge draw on staff in a number of different departments. Um, implementing trusted system as a security measure with IT. Uh, we have uh, the fire inspection database that will allow us to uh, work more closely with the state. We have a transit radio upgrade uh, that I believe the um, uh, if the item for the for the contract or the procurement hasn't happened already, this is the funding that goes with that um, uh, that will go to council. And this is to bring the transit radios up to the uh, police, uh, um, uh, the same uh, type of radio system that the police have. We have a three-year limited term media technician. Uh, this will allow for uh, staff to better uh, um, broadcast through uh, both the hybrid uh, meetings that we have now, but even when we become uh, uh, more live, that will allow for broadcasting and work there. We currently have um, uh, staff at pre-COVID levels and uh, we are not able to meet capacity very well. And finally, the kind of climate uh, action plan update implementation, and then quickly going through the last ones we have uh, on the next page, we have evacuation equipment and public works. This is to help us uh, in the um, unfortunate uh, uh, instance that could come up where we would need to provide emergency evacuation to provide the equipment that uh, for streets to be able to allow that. And then we have the two items that came in before, which is the down uh, payment assistance program that were added on and the vegetation management local match. There were two programs that have been previously approved by the council and with funds appropriated, and that was the art panels for the Asawa Fountain and the two-year limited term planner uh, um, for planning and economic development. And with that, hopefully I didn't go too fast for the translator. I apologize if I did. We, we have a recommendation uh, by the finance department that the council, by resolution, increase appropriations to fund one-time programs using PG&E settlement funds and American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA funds, as set forth in Exhibit A and B of the resolution, and amend the city classification and salary plan to add one FTE limited term media services technician for three years in the information technology department. And with that, I'm available for questions. I know staff is here uh, available as well that can be promoted to you. All right, thank you so much, Alan. We'll start with questions from council. Council Member Fleming. Yeah, I, I have a, a broad question, which is why are some of these items um, funded in sort of really round numbers and then we get um, unusual, like more specific ones like around the PED plan check at $298,000. Is it because we're unsure of about how much we're gonna allocate things to and in, on some items and then on other items, we are able to get really specific numbers. Can you help me understand that? 
Yes, I mean, in general, uh, I, I tend to like to use the more rounded numbers for this. I think for, for this particular item, because they were looking at contract services, I think they were able to actually get the number down there. But in hindsight, I probably would have rounded that to, uh, to an even number. Um, uh, okay, we're going to uh, hold you to that style going forward. We're going to like yes, have a style, Alan Alton style manual. Um, <laughs> And then if you need to bring a colleague on, I was wondering what DEI spaces means. I think I get an idea of it, but it seems pretty unclear to me on its face. Uh, yes. So I think that that would be uh, Magali Taya that, that should be able to assist with that. Okay. Hello. Uh, hi, good evening again. Um, so great question. Um, that uh, portion came from different community members, um, different sort of uh, um, cultural community groups that were really interested in looking for opportunities to have designated cultural spaces, either within spaces that are already built um, or any potential new spaces. Um, so that's uh, essentially what that um, item was about. So functionally, what would that mean? Would it mean that we would be paying for the rental or of space within the community? Um, that's correct. So we've been asked by um, various community groups to see, you know, where there would be opportunities, uh, where the city would support um, being able to assist in either, you know, uh, rental, um, some the uh, financial rental fee, or if there are opportunities that you know exist in our current um, spaces, our, our, our current buildings, um, where we could charge you know rental fee and then cover that rental fee uh, with this portion of the budget. Okay, and then um, are, are you prepared to answer a couple other things like what is it? What is an equity dashboard going to look like um, if we haven't determined our equity goals yet? Or have we already determined them and then we're going to have a dashboard to that effect? Sure. And um, definitely that item uh, was Socorro Shields. Um, and which if she is available, I, I don't want to um, steal her thunder. But I do remember the, the conversation. Um, and I think she's coming on. So OK. And none of these questions are, are me uh, suggesting that we shouldn't do this stuff. But I definitely want to be able to tell people when they say, what are we spending the money on, uh, be able to clearly articulate what it is. So it's very helpful for me to have you guys illustrate or walk through what it is that we're doing. Hey, good evening. This is this is Socorro. The Hello. item on, good more, Good afternoon, good evening. Good Lord, the day is gone. The item on the equity dashboard, you're correct that the equity goals have not been finalized and there'll be an update next month for the council from the seed collaborative. It is a set aside believing that starting this summer, we will have an idea of what those key strategies and priorities will be and we'll be able to determine metrics and help make that public and share with all employees and the community what those goals are and our advancement towards those outcomes. Excellent. Thank you. You answered my next question. I don't have any more questions at this time. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions? Council Member McDonald. Thank you. I have a question on the DE&I spaces. If we are doing um, one-time money for maybe an ongoing cost, is there any idea of how we would cover that? Um, I'm, I'm definitely for ensuring that we have um, opportunities, but if we are, are we remodeling an area within something that we already have and so it would be considered a one-time cost? And then um, that's my first question. I'll let you answer that. Sure. Um, thank you for the question. And so essentially, given that, you know, if, if um, there's approval for this um, funding, the second step would be to go up back out into community because uh, during our listening sessions, you know, the 
sort of preference was we'd rather be able to hold space for one year than not to be able to do it at all and be able to organize. And a lot of these conversations really came from, um, you know, working uh, during the fires and not having sort of a designated space uh, like that's culturally focused uh, for people to get information uh, that's, you know, that that type of information um, from a sort of cultural perspective. So I think the sort of community um, is asking, you know, we'd, we'd love to just get started on something like this, um, but we really need this to be community led, informed and inspired. So it'd be really important for us to make sure that we go out into community first un so that they understand like here are the parameters um, and then how they would, you know, want to go about um, using this potential funding. Great, thank you. Um, and as far as the equity dashboard, uh, that I would, I would, I'm asking if and Socorro could probably answer this one for me. Um, is it going to be similar to like the California dashboard, where we have goals and then we have objectives to meet, and then we'll be able to show the community by similar to what they do in a school dashboard how we're doing in each of those areas? That actually, um, thank you for the question. That actually, it, yes, it would be something visual like that. We're, again, we will have an update next month, so those are great questions to ask. We are in process, so I don't know exactly how the recommendations will come out. It is a very grassroots, iterative process to get to those outcomes that will, and recommendations that will come before the council for approval this summer, but I do believe that, yes, once we get there, the goal is to make those outcomes and aspirations very, uh, very, some, very much something that we can visualize and follow to know how far we're going, to, know, to share with, again, with the community and with our employees the progress we're making on achieving those goals. Great. Thank you. May I ask? A couple more? Okay. For the child care facilities grants, is that just for commercial buildings or would that be for new buildings um, for, because we do have a lack of child care facilities and or is it to like retrofit and actually repair buildings or is it extended to home child care facilities as well? I would leave that question for Raisa, who I know is also in attendance. I'm not sure if that is an Allen question. I'm not sure who. That would that would be more of a right to question if she's on and it's okay. just popping up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here I am. Okay. Um. So yeah, that is. Um. It's going to be. Uh. For any, it's new facilities in um, new buildings, ground up buildings, but it's only for this, the um, portion of that building that is specific to childcare, but it's also for rehabilitation of buildings um, uh, that are in existence uh, or new facilities in already existing buildings. So it's to cover any type of facility related to um, accessing new childcare uh, sites. Great, thank you. And I just have one more question on youth um, promotoras or the youth council. Can you tell me what that is and and how that's going to work? And um, I think using, you know, well, that sounds terrible. Using, but I think working with our youth to go out and work like in a peer type of situation is a great idea. I'd just like to hear more about it or how we would meet these young folks that are out in our community serving us. Sure. Um, thank you for that. That's that question. We're very excited um, for this potential partnership. So the Youth Promotores uh, model has been uh, used by many different nonprofits. Um, and so for us, how we've been able to um, partner with the Youth Promotores, specifically Latino service providers has been working with us on a couple of different projects, but currently the, the PRO Promotores, uh, which is uh, the name of the cohort that we're working with, they are assisting us with um, bringing out the uh, Youth Citizens Guidebook, which is essentially um, a youth-led and youth um, written in a, a form that would be appealing to youth 
so that you can understand like this is what council usually this is what council does this is their job this is what a policy is this is how you get involved um, in addition they're working with us on a really incredible program uh, which they're still working on the name for but essentially they're going out into neighborhoods and speaking to community members and speaking to other youth and asking them what they love about their neighborhood or what are some things that people should know about that specific neighborhood so it is expanding the engagement and also an opportunity for the city uh, to understand you know uh, what the community needs are via their projects so um, that's that's one of the items that we're working on but we do we are hoping to expand that um, given the opportunity and I'll give a quick shout out to our youth promotors uh, we have uh, Jocelyn Via Lobos, who's joined us on the Charter Review Committee and is helping to serve our community. So it's a good partnership. Were you all done, Council Member? Okay. I did have an additional question. I just want to see if we could get all of our staff on the Zoom, apparently. Uh, it is about the down payment assistance program, which I suspect is probably Megan. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and members of council. How's it going? I have a quick question about the down payment assistance program, uh, if this is uh, within your purview. We set aside the $2 million. It was a little bit nebulous in terms of specifics, and I know that staff has been working through it. Uh, for the $2 million investment and understanding that it's a, a revolving fund, how many folks do we think we can help in the beginning, and what are the parameters that we're developing for the program? That's a great question. We are anticipating being able to initially assist about 25 households. These would be households that are at or below 120% of median income. The program parameters that we're currently working through uh, would be the maximum purchase price is based on the California Association of Realtors Sonoma County uh, sales price for that uh, month that the transaction or that the buyer was approved. And currently that's um, $789,000. So it definitely allows a unit to be purchased that's around market rate. Um, we're anticipating a maximum assistance amount of 10% of this, the purchase price. And it would be a 3% deferred loan. So uh, there will be no payments due, but at the time of sale or if there was a refinancing where the borrower took cash out of the home, they would need to repay the loan. And as council had previously requested, we are working on uh, developing the requirements of the home buyer counseling that uh, approved borrowers would need to participate in and complete prior to being approved for a loan. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions. It, yeah, so it uh, sounds like we're anticipating $80,000 per family that we're helping. If it is intended as a first time home buyer program, are these folks that would qualify for the FHA first first time home buyer program and only need 3% down instead of 10% down? It, um, you know, I don't have that level of detail right now. It would depend on where they're able to obtain a first mortgage. So the amount of assistance could vary, um, but by providing up to 10%, it does allow them the ability to have a lower first mortgage that they would have to service. Okay. And have we been discussing or partnering with the Realtors Association or any other groups that uh, specialize and focus on this? We have not gotten to that level of outreach yet. We are still working on um, establishing a relationship with a home buyer counseling organization and then uh, working on our developing our loan documents uh, with the city attorney's office. So outreach will be the next step in the program development. Okay, great. I look forward to getting input from folks within the industry as well on how to make this this program stretch further to be able to help more more families. Any other questions from council? Great, thank you so much, Megan. Let's go ahead and go to public comment on this item then. If you're interested in providing comment, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature. We'll start, oh, hand disappeared. Let's go to Ann. Good evening, Mayor Rogers, 
Vice Mayor Alvarez, council members. I'm Ann Hammond, Sonoma County Library Director. I wanted to take a moment to welcome City Council Member McDonald and City Manager Smith. I hope to meet you both very soon. The countywide library system is grateful to have the city of Santa Rosa as a partner as we provide excellent library service to your city. The new library that we're going to build is going to be the newest and best public library in Northern California. We can't wait to see the delight in people's eyes when they walk through the doors and see the positive impacts we can make on their lives. I'm here to take a moment to acknowledge the weight of what the council is doing today. The Roseland and Southwest areas of the city have been underserved, as you know, and an investment at this scale with this commitment is truly visionary. We wouldn't be here without an extraordinary confluence of events, but it also took the extraordinary people. And I want to publicly thank the city staff for working hand in hand with the library to move our vision forward, to serve and support everyone in Santa Rosa. So thank you. Thank you, Anne. The only hand that I see, do we have any pre-recorded voicemails on the item? We do, Mayor. Although two more hands just popped up via Zoom. Let's go to June, followed by Manny, and then we'll come back for these. Hello. Hi, June. Oh, hi. Hi, um, this is June Bershares, and I'm a volunteer with the North Bay Organizing Projects Climate Justice Task Force. And I'm speaking in support of the $10 million of uh, ARPA funds uh, to go towards the community center, recommended for the community center, and um, for that to be a publicly owned and operated community cultural center in Roseland, um, which would be co-located along with the library. Um, which can serve as a center for multiple purposes, including um, being a resiliency hub. And I think this is so important for the youth in our community. And I wanna support the, with the vision of the youth that have been calling for this and for their future. Um, it would be a great to have uh, such a center and to have it resil be resilient and mindful of the climate situation we're in, um, for it to be facilities that are powered by on-site solar uh, photovoltaics for electric generation and to have storage there um, to deal with the different situations that we may be encountering and to provide that resource for the community. Um, facilities like this um, would be very helpful for responding to the aspirations of the Roseland community. So thank you. Thank you, June. We'll go to Manny. Good evening, Santa Rosa City Council members. Um, thank you for your time. Um, my name is Emmanuel Morales. I go by Manny. And I'm here tonight speaking on behalf of the Latinx Student Congress, um, the students who organized over um, fall to advocate for the demands of Roseland and getting the city of Santa Rosa to create a multicultural center, a community center, a public library, uh, resiliency hub and other um, other establishments that could serve the community of Rolston here in Santa Rosa. Um, now our focus has shifted towards the the new location that's being proposed as a result of the city acquiring um, the six plus acres in Southwest Santa Rosa. Um, we continue to to make the same demands, and we hope that tonight you take initiative and um we serve the 10 million dollars from the ARPA funds to go into the creation of, of the center again that can serve uh, multiple purposes including the public library a multicultural center and a resiliency hub that will support the the community with resources um with uh, and knowing and understanding that there's a, a high risk of um uh, environmental uh emergencies that could potentially happen in the near future and how we need to respond and, and continue to serve our community. 
So um, with that being said, I want to forfeit my time and thank you for your time tonight. Thank you so much, Manny. We'll go to Ricarda, followed by Gregory. Um, good evening, council members. My name is Ricarda Suarez. I'm a senior at Roseland University Prep. I'm former co-chair of MECHA at RUP um, and come back here to one of these meetings to again um, advise you all to approve of this, uh, these 10 million to go to the proposed location for multiple amenities. Um, as mentioned by Manny, we, the youth and the advisors from NBOP and from the clubs um, work together towards um, the attempt of appealing the previous uh, or the cannabis dispensary at the former RUP as that wasn't approved by y'all. We now have this location which we are fighting for and um, we hope to see our efforts come to life and given the circumstances um, and the community outreach and hope that you guys listen to the voice of Roseland and what we've been desperately asking for and build that resiliency hub, a multicultural center and a Roseland library, which, which we haven't had a permanent location for. So yes, I, I hope you guys listen and approve of this. Um, thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Gregory followed by the phone number ending in 7466. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Gregory Farron. I'd like to just take a minute to congratulate both you, the council and the staff for the wide variety of uh, new implementational uh, projects. This is, a, this is the largest number of and depth of projects I've seen the council embark on in a long time. And I wanna point out that there's some challenges with that. Uh, and uh, the CFO alluded to one of them, which is uh, simply reporting on all of these projects as they are implemented. And, and I would add it, evaluating them. And, but even before that, we're gonna have a large job just uh, talking about them, getting it out to the community as to what all these projects are, how to get access to them, how to participate in them, and how to help make them successful. Uh, this, is, this is something that will take more than just making decisions. It's gonna be how does the community and the county and the city uh, work to implement them? Uh, I, I mentioned county accidentally, but I do wanna point out that in a, a, a few months, there's going to be even more projects coming into the city and into the county uh, from the county's uh, portion of ARPA. So the real challenge is trying to figure out not only how to best publicize, best evaluate, and best report on what the city's doing, but to integrate as much as possible what the city's doing with what the county is doing. Because it can very easily overwhelm the community uh, with um, the vast number of new ideas and new projects and new opportunities for them to take advantage of. So I, I urge you to work hard on trying to uh, build a system that is understandable to the community and that's integratable into what the county is doing, because then we'll really succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. We'll go to the phone number ending in 7466. Hello, and thank you all. This is Yvette, the minor based here in Rosen. I do a lot of boots on the ground programming here in Rosen. And I want to just say thank you for all the hard work that you're doing currently in regards to Rosen and the Southwest of Santa Rosa. I just like to say, even though we have all this great um, infrastructure coming into Rosen, we just recently received the um, data from the Portrait of Sonoma, which shows that Rosen and Southwest Santa Rosa is still at a huge distance advantage. So I'm asking that you take the remainder of the money that is available to help support and continue to build up Southwest Santa Rosa. We need an emergency hub, which would, could possibly be the same thing with the cultural center slash uh, library. We need that emergency hub so that when in the event when we have future uh, emergencies, we will have a 
a place where we can gather or have um, people come for support and resources. If, and then if we have a community kitchen, that would be even better because then it would be able to allow um, feed-ins for the homeless. And in a large community space, that is something that's missing right now. We used to have the old Dollar Tree right here where we would have those community functions. So we definitely need a large space to continue to have those community events that we so desire and would like to have in our community. Roseland is a self-healing community. We always find a way to bring things to our community and support our community. And so we're grateful that the City of Santa Rosa is stepping up and bringing us into the fold. Uh, ARPA funding is very clear. It's, it's to support vulnerable populations. And then the city of um, Southwest Santa Rosa is that. We have a lot of vulnerable populations in that community. Capital investment to public facilities. So we're trying to bring a public facility here in Rosa. And so this is the perfect uh, way to use that ARPA funding. And again, have outreach and pro promote access to health and social services. So with this particular building, we'll be able to bring services back into the community. You come to where the people are. And that is something that many of us are saying in our community. We need this to be in our vicinity, in a walkable space. We're talking about, you know, being uh, uh, good stewards of the environment. And so when you put the services and buildings in the vicinity of this capacity where people can walk that will save on time, that will save our environment, it will help reduce our carbon footprint. So going forward, please continue to provide the additional funding that is needed for the pool, for the fire station, for the public library, for the cultural center, for the community center, all those things that is needed so much in Roseland and for the southwest area of Santa Rosa. Thank you. Thank you. Dwayne, did you have comments? Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. It was encouraging to hear all those folks just now talking about their interests in helping Roseland. The Portrait of Sonoma County Update 2021 specifically points out that the Roseland Census District is the most disadvantaged for the Human Development Index in the entire county. When you use the term Roseland, it's very important to keep in mind that Hearn Avenue and South is actually the Bellevue District, and that the County of Sonoma delineated what Roseland was 30 years ago, and Roseland is to the north. I attended the meetings for the Sebastopol Road Urban Vision 15 years ago. I actually served on a Southwest Santa Rosa Redevelopment Project Area Committee uh, 20 years ago, and I attended the meetings for the Roseland Specific Plan, Sebastopol Road Update, part of that committee also. At no time did we ever speak about putting things further to the south. We talked about having things in Roseland where people right now are suffering and want to have better services as all those speakers before me just mentioned. The dilemma we face is that often in an administrative situation, people will begin to change the dynamic, mission creep. They'll say, oh, well, we want to build out the Southwest. We want to put 25,000 people to the south of Roseland, so we're going to call that area that we're just purchasing this land Roseland. And that's not helping the people up along Sebastopol Road a mile and a half away. So keep these things in perspective. It's really important, especially when people have participated and tried to do everything the way they were given the information. And they're hoping that folks will abide by what was talked about in the past. If it comes down to, like was said earlier in another matter, the future is what matters and not the past. That really hurts those people in Roseland who are still suffering right now. So I hope you will use these ARPA funds for a Roseland library up in the Roseland Census District or to the north where all the people are and not way far to the south as you build out this town. And then last but not least, use any extra money to fix the roads. Specifically, it could be used at uh, Barham, Boyd, Corby, South, 
Let the record show that all those roads have been suffering for decades and have still not been fixed. And we're in the city for four years now. Thank you. I believe we had a voicemail public comment. Hi, my name is Woody Hastings, speaking for myself, not representing any organization. I'm speaking today on item 14.3, appropriation of funds for one-time programs in support of the Latinx Student Congress, calling for $10 million of the ARPA money recommended for a community center to go specifically toward a publicly owned and operated community cultural center in Roseland that can also accommodate multiple purposes, including a public library and a resiliency hub. I think the resiliency hub part of this is particularly important given the growing frequency of power grid and other disruptions caused by the climate crisis. Facilities like this are especially needed in Roseland. Thank you for the opportunity to comment and thank you for your efforts on these allocations. Chair, that concludes public comment on this item. All right, I'm gonna bring it back. Uh, Madam City Manager, I actually missed what is perhaps the most obvious question from the beginning of the presentation. Uh, the ARPA funds that are slated for approval uh, are $465,000 under what we actually have in terms of ARPA. Uh, so I'm gonna throw you a, a curveball and one that you've been here only a couple of months. Is there anything glaring that we're missing that you would recommend the council consider for those additional funds? So yes. So a couple of things that I've noticed that I think we need to do a better job or just have resources is tracking. I'm big on data, I'm big on analytics. It's very difficult for us to measure where we're going if we don't measure it from the beginning. We have a lot of projects ahead of us. Um, we have a lot of money in front of us. And I think one of the comments that uh, one of the public individuals made was, how are you gonna resource this? How are you gonna get the message to the public? In addition, how are you gonna capture what you're doing? I think it's important that we start to measure everything we're doing, have data dashboards, so we can see how we're performing. It's important for us to have a well-managed city. We're talking about getting back to some physical stability, and I think we're getting there. So it is extremely important for me to have a process and have staff to be able to measure exactly where we're gonna go in the future. Um, you're talking about $9 million, you're talking about $8 million here. We talked about the, the golf course earlier, $7 million here. We have to be able to show the, the public how efficient we are with our dollars. And a lot of that is just measuring, having smart goals in front of us and just having the analytics to, to, de to determine how we're gonna move forward. So if I had an option, um, I'm, I'm not certain that I would hire a full-time staff person at this moment because it's important for me to show you exactly what that looks like. But I think if we could get some consultant on board or someone on staff to help us move forward with showing the public exactly where we're being proficient and how their money is being spent. I appreciate that. And uh, sorry to throw you a curveball like that. Uh, we do have a proposal in front of us and we can put a motion on the table uh, for discussion, but I don't wanna lose sight of that part of the conversation as well, whether tonight or in a future uh, council agenda item as well. Uh, so council member Rogers, if you wanna put a motion on the table for us to start. I would like to make a motion to adopt the resolution titled Resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa Approving Spending Plans for American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA funds and pg e settlement funds, appropriating funds and amending the city classification and salary plan to add 1.0 FTE limited term media services technician for three years in the information technology department and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion from council member Rogers and a second from council member McDonald. Do we have any discussion council? Council member Fleming. Yeah, I'd like to add that this has been a long and iterative process. And I think that while we don't have all the details 
of every single project laid out that we have a really impressive and broad array of, of initiatives that have something in it for everybody in the city and a lot in it for the people who need and who we, to whom we owe the most, but we have something that every Santa Rosan can be proud of and, and really enjoy. And I know it's been a challenging process for us because it's an unusual task for, for the city council to have so much and for staff to have a surplus and to have different types of surpluses uh, that can be used in different types of ways. So what I wanted to do was just note that we are continuing to move along. My gratitude toward Alan Alton, who has you know, been with us over and over and over again in this process and is much appreciated. And all of the staff who were on tonight, late night, and this is not the first or second or the third time that we've had this conversation. So a sincere thank you to everybody from the legal team, the city manager's office, who's bearing with us through this process that has not always been easy because of its complexity. So we keep moving forward with appreciation. Council Member Rogers. Um, I would like to thank all the staff um, for, you know, just having the ability to hear all of our our wants after we uh, listen to the community um, to hear what their wants are. I feel for me that it was really captured um, in what was presented tonight and um, I'm very thankful um, to the staff for being able to do that and being able to, to hear us. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, the mayor throwing uh, City Manager Smith a curveball, and I'm hoping that soon we'll be able to look at what she said because I think it is very important. With so many balls in the air, a juggler can only do so much, but for us to really come back to um, our residents and say, this is what we plan to do, this is what we did, and we can show you this is how we did it, um, to me, that is ultimate success, and that is what I want to show, not just that we appropriated the money, but that we actually did what we said we were going to do. So thank you for throwing that curveball tonight. I just want to add that I agree with, with that. Councilmember McDonald. Yes, I want to say thank you so much for the presentation tonight from staff and um, to Alan for answering my questions ahead of time that I sent him so I didn't have to bother the rest of the council with some of the acronyms so I could get a <laughs> what this meant. But um, I, a couple things. Um, I, too, would like to leave the money and then come back and revisit it after our city manager has an opportunity to look at what might be needed. I believe thoroughly in transparency and how we used public dollars and then how we can go back to the um, public and, and tell them how we use that. And so I think that's a really great idea um, to leave that space. And and if we can bring that back, that's um, thank you for doing that, Mayor. Um, and then in addition to that, I just want to comment on how proud I am to join a team that was so visionary in appropriating $10 million to an area in our city that has been neglected. And I think it's a, a real testament to Vice Mayor Alvarez for being the representative for that area, for listening to the community and bringing that forward. And so I want to say thank you for that. Libraries are critical for the development of young children. It's where families have access to books that they may not be able to have at their homes. It's where they can get access to bilingual books. And I can tell you working on a state task force that was around literacy, specifically early literacy, it sets our children up for school. And so it's, so t it's such a great thing that we're able to bring forward for so many things for the support of children and families, but also to be a resource hub for families to be able to have access to computers and to have access to other things that they may not have in their homes. So hats off to all of you for um, being a visionary and I'm so lucky to get to join the team to see it go forward. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, and I appreciate the, the compliment, Councilwoman, but it's definitely amongst ourselves that made that happen. City staff that made it happen. The community speaks up, speaks up loud and clear. You know, a bit ago, we just heard about investing into a golf course to protect the gem that it is. And investing into the gems 
that can be found in Southwest Santa Rosa. Our children, our future leaders, our kings and queens. That, I find no greater investment than that. And when we're talking about the ROI, I mean, for the future leaders who are prepared to lead the city of Santa Rosa in, in the best way possible for us to prepare them. You know, we hear it being called the Resiliency Hub. What a great name. What a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And I just want to extend a huge thank you to our team as well. I know it's been a long process to get here. I uh, want to give a special shout out to Raisa as well. Uh, when this first started, I had a nice long conversation with Raisa where I said, you know, what I wanted to do was invest in children and tackle poverty. And I said, what, what could you come up with? And she was so helpful to bounce ideas back and forth uh, and to really have a big vision about what we could do with such a huge chunk of money. And the entire team has embraced it. And uh, Megan with housing, we heard uh, Magali with community engagement, we heard Socorro with DEI, Alan with the finances, uh, and then our new city manager. I, I fully support giving you the tools that you need to show the impact of what we're trying to do. Uh, and we, as a council, I understand that uh, we could have easily just invested the, these dollars into city services, into city staff, into city uh, priorities, uh, but we took a step back and we looked at it and we said, this is a once in a generational opportunity for us. How can we impact our entire community and how can we change lives for folks? And that's what I see when I look at what we're approving today is uh, we'll see some immediate impact, but really the focus on it is the next community, uh, uh, the next, the future that we have here in Santa Rosa and making sure that we're addressing inequities as we move forward and the folks who have been the most impacted by COVID-19. Uh, and helping fire survivors rebuild and get their community safe. Uh, and, and I don't want to lose sight of that as well because we didn't talk about it tonight, but we did invest in roads and sidewalks in the infrastructure in Fountain Grove and Coffee Park. We did invest in our fire service. We invested in vegetation management. Uh, and I think that the council really was thoughtful about how we manage the, the huge needs across our community that are very different uh, from neighborhood to neighborhood. So I just want to thank everybody for, for that. Uh, Madam City Manager, did you have something to add? I did. I did want to clarify that it's $465 that's available. But um, one of the things that I have talked to each of you about is how we're going to actually stat this process going forward. Um, so there may be savings. So, you know, we're going to begin probably in another month with staff having conversations about where are we with the money, where are we with the projects, what do we need in order to move forward. So we're going to start that process, whether or not we have a, a someone on staff or a consultant, so, because, it, again, it is important for the public to understand how we're spending their dollars. But I'll take the $465. <laughs> <laughs> With that, Madam City Clerk, could you please call the vote? Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. Thank you all so much. I'm really excited to see that across the finish line. Let's move on to item 14.4. Item 14.4 is a report for the fiscal year 21-22 budget amendment, and this will be delivered by Chief Financial Officer Alton. Mayor uh, Rogers and members of the council, rounding out the evening. <laughs> um, this item is a mid-year budget review, and it's also uh, a budget amendment that we are proposing uh, next slide, please. So with this item, we intend to uh, um, achieve a number of tasks. So first, I'll provide a brief review of the fiscal year in 2020 results for the general fund, um, just to set context for how we're going further in the evening. And then I'll review the budget performance in the general fund through December 31st, 2021. Uh, then we will uh, present proposed amendments to the current year budget, both in terms of uh, 
additional revenue recognition and, uh, and, and expenditures. Again, also for the general fund, but also in other funds. Uh, and then we will present a proposed uh, change to the Measure O implementation plan that's tied up with all of these other things um, uh, uh, that will, uh, and, and then finally we'll, we'll highlight some organizational changes uh, at the, at the city. So uh, next slide, please. So again, to set context, and this is for the general fund only, this is how we ended our, uh, uh, our adopted budget versus our actual results for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. And as you can see, uh, what we're trying to show here are recurring uh, revenues and expenditures versus non-recurring revenues and expenditures. So what you're seeing here are the recurring revenues and expenditures. And what that does is that strips away those, those items that are, are uh, grant or investment earnings or things like that that you would typically not build or want to build a budget on because they're not a uh, they're, they're not a knowable number going forward. In other words, very hard to predict, or they have a tied uh, uh, revenue source that's coming in on a different ledger and it, and it skews this, right? So what this is doing is showing you the revenues and expenditures that will, that you can support a budget moving forward in the general fund. What this also illustrates is how we, how you'll hear me talk about a budgetary structural deficit. And then you'll see the actual results that we had a, an operational surplus. So the reason why we, we, we adopted a budget based off of one, revenue expenditures that we thought we were going to have during a pandemic and two, while we kept our expenditures rather flat, we also instituted a, or, or continued our hiring freeze into last year. What ended up happening is that we had a, a revenue that, that bounced back way quicker than what we thought. And we artificially held down uh, um, expenditures through that hiring freeze. So the result of greater revenues and less expenditures gave us our, our operating deficit or surplus. The problem with that is that we have expenditures based off of full uh, employment, right? We have positions that we uh, expect to be able to do the programs that we have in the, uh, in the community and to keep our operations going. So the concern that I will always have is that once we get to the point where we have those positions all filled, will we have the revenues to be able to support it? And that's something that we look at very closely. Next slide, please. So this shows the status of the general fund reserves at fiscal year end. And then I, I ticked off a couple of things that I, that hadn't quite hit our, our books yet, but, but we knew we could count on. So one, we, we, uh, we had unaudited reserves for contingencies at 122 million. Uh, right off the bat, we need 30.4 million to make our policy mandated reserve requirement is 17%. Then we pull off money that we've committed uh, um, uh, out of the PG&E funds. Again, those PG&E funds were sitting in the general fund inflating that, that reserve number, but being ready to use, which is a ter totally normal way to do this. So you, you check off those 47 million plus we, uh, and I'm including the ones that we just uh, appropriated. Uh, and then we have committed funds for fiscal stabilization. And that's doing a couple of things. One, it's gonna help us with our uh, fund 
uh, any funds that are as a result of, of our fiscal policies that we're doing. So if, uh, with say, uh, uh, a pension, pension stabilization fund, we could use some of those 40 million to, um, to help pre-fund that trust account. Or what it could also do, and what I would imagine that it is going to need to do, is to allow us time to get our uh, 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 get our budget balanced to where our revenues will match our expenditures at the at full employment. Anyway, taking all of those things out, we have about five point four million dollars over what our um, all of our commitments are. So that is that is a good thing to be have more money than uh, than our our basic uh, policies allow. Next slide, please. So going into our mid year uh, 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 budget. Uh, or our budget at mid-year. Again, for the general fund, and this is just a visual representation of our revenues, and basically what it does is it points out that about 53% of our revenues is coming from sales tax and property tax. Um, in uh, charges for services, you have our recreation fees, and you have a lot of our planning and economic uh, uh, development uh, fees. And in the other taxes, you're gonna you're gonna see things that I'll go over in another slide. Uh, uh, have that detail. So next slide, please. So looking at our our total revenues based off of our major categories that we do, uh, where we are at at mid year is about what we would expect to be. Um, in fact, in a couple of areas, we're trending higher than that even though it doesn't really show up on this chart. And that's due to a lag in either the, the, the dollars coming to us, uh, such as in sales tax, or in other areas where we know we're going to get the revenue coming in in the spring or, um, or late spring, early summer. Uh, next slide, please. So going into a little deeper about property tax and why we think that, that we're doing well there is that uh, our initial payment that came in was uh, higher than what the typical amount of what we would get and what we budgeted for. So right now we are looking to be trending about $1.5 million ahead of, of what our budget estimates were. And if you go back to prior years, we, we kind of see that that trend going. So when I look at, at 1.5 over where we are, I think that's probably uh, a realistic amount to be and, and it's something that we need to be able to adjust to uh, through this item in order to have the more realistic base numbers and for our revenue. Next slide, please. So this is a visual of where we are with sales tax performance through uh, the second quarter or through mid-year. So the first two bars are visual representation showing the amount of sales tax collected this year to date. The first blue uh, bar shows what we would typically expect to receive um, at, uh, uh, at about 34 uh, um, or shows that we would typically expect to receive about 34% of the year's total by the end of Q2, and that's due to uh, a two-month lag in tax uh, revenue coming in. But the second bar shows that we're actually up at about 37.5%. Uh, so we are uh, trending higher. And, uh, and as such, we are looking to trend well higher toward the end. And if you go back and look at where we were ending last year, um, uh, we were about $11 million off of our sales tax estimate. So at the very least, what I would come to you is say, we need to at least be where we were 
at at the end of last year. So we would at least need to adjust our sales tax budget up that much. But what I'm seeing and what we're looking at and what actually is following along with our uh, sales tax consultants most likely projection is that uh, we can even go a little bit more to that to a six million dollar uh, budget adjustment, which is what we're looking at here. Next slide, please. And so I mentioned other taxes, and uh, you know we lumped this into one category, but they're pretty important taxes within there. So and right now our VLS swap is is on track. Um, we get a substantial amount of franchise fees from PG&E that comes in in April. So we'll see that in our fourth quarter results. Our cannabis tax historically trends higher in the spring. Uh, so we don't consider this being behind. And quite frankly, I looked at it uh, before coming on tonight uh, through today in revenue and uh, it's, it's significantly higher in revenue. So already that trend is bearing out that we, we expect to be able to, at the very least, hit our budget estimate with uh, uh, spring revenue coming in. Um, the majority of our business tax uh, is, is actually, we're in business tax season right now, so we'll see this in the, uh, in the following quarter. Um, so probably in the fourth quarter estimates, we'll have a truer sense of where we are with business tax, so we don't really see any issue there. Occupancy tax, we show this here as being on, on track. What, what I would say is that I, again, looked at that before I came on here, and our transient occupancy is, is uh, doing really well right now. So we're, at, as of uh, as of today, we're around 80% of our uh, of our tax estimate. So I would expect that to easily uh, meet expectations and probably go over uh, our real property transfer tax. We have virtually all of our uh, revenue estimate now. So uh, we're suggesting to bump that up to two million. It follows the trend. Uh, or another two million, up to five and a half million. Um, it follows the trend that we saw last year and and even leading into last year. It's real property transfer tax is a component of, of property, uh, uh, the value of property that, that changes hands and the volume of it. So what you're seeing is high volume in, in real estate transactions and a, uh, uh, and a high value of that volume. So, which is, which is great. And, uh, and so we're trying to recognize that. Next slide, please. So with our general fund expenditures, uh, while um, the council approved uh, the labor contract uh, in November-ish, um, uh, we will start seeing that uh, affect our budget um, going forward from this one. It's just not quite picking that up yet. Um, we are right about where we would think that we would be. There are some adjustments that we need to make, and I'll get to that in, in a future slide. But right now, we're right around the 50% range is where we would want to be. Uh, next slide, please. So, why are we doing a mid-year budget adjustment? Um, basically, is I think that it's it's um, important to increase the transparency of our budgeting, especially in the general fund. When we see things that are uh, are too low, and again, some of that is the function of when we uh, adopt our budget, we don't have our year-end results. We need to be nimble enough to to adjust our our budget to reflect uh, where we can clearly see that we're going to be low in revenue. Uh, one of the things that we, you know, we still want to keep it. Look, one of the last things that I would ever do, because I'd probably be fired right afterwards, is come to you with, uh, with overly uh, optimistic revenue numbers. 
Uh, so what these changes do just brings us more into reality. And I think that's important as we're talking to the community of what we can really afford to do um, having realistic revenue numbers is a good way to go about that. Uh, so what we're looking at is a total of uh, uh, an increase of $1.5 million in property tax, $6 million in uh, sales tax, and real property transfer tax going up, uh, adding an additional $2 million to that which brings a total revenue adjustment to our general fund revenue of 9.5 million. Next slide, please. And just as we need to be uh, uh, transparent on the revenue side, we do need to show what's happening on the expenditure side. As I mentioned before, there were general fund labor agreement costs. Uh, all of our MOUs, or at least most of them that have been uh, approved, um, they have a cost to them. Uh, uh, when you approved the uh, uh, the MOU, there was not a, a corresponding uh, increase in budget. This is that increase in budget for the cost of, of the labor agreements for uh, this year. Um, in addition, as I've mentioned before, um, probably too much, but I uh, mentioned before, we have uh, vacancies in the in the city, and typically we uh, we put in a credit to help offset that. In other words, you don't want to overly inflate your expenditure budget when you know that you're going to have some sort of vacancy level. Um, uh, uh, that credit was taken out last year. Uh, we're adding it back at mid-year because it's important to try to uh, uh, hedge the, the cost of, of the turn back that we know we're going to get. Um, we are asking for some staffing changes and there are partial annual appropriations that go along with that. I'll get into what those positions are in the next slide, but just uh, on a summary level, there uh, three of them are within the um, uh, planning and economic development area. They're they are specifically to address um, uh, uh, the uh, plan review and, uh, and, and that type of, of work to help development and clear that backlog that, that has been there. And we also are, are requesting a, uh, a human resources analyst, uh, given the number of recruitments that we need to do, the number of reclassifications that come through, Human Resources just simply does not have the staff to meet up with that demand, and we need to add to be able to bolster their ability to keep the recruitment and reclassification process moving forward. There's also, we uh, there is a, um, a facility need in the public safety building. There was a boiler line uh, that broke. It is uh, leaking water. Uh, and so replacing that is something that we would look at as more of an urgent need to get uh, uh, to fix now rather than go through the normal uh, um, uh, budget process and have those funds appropriated in July. And finally, uh, as we're going through and looking at, at budgets, we've been analyzing the fire department over time and, and it's just uh, uh, given the amount of, well, it's simply, it's too low. So what we need to do is add to it. And we anticipate this being an ongoing cost going forward to bring them more in line of, of a realistic overtime amount that they would need to manage to going forward. Right now, they just had a uh, one that was too low and then we would uh, use salary savings or some means to that to balance it at the end of the year. And when it and in doing that, it doesn't really show the true cost of a fire department budget within the city. And what we're trying to do here is to be as transparent as possible on the cost that it takes to to operate within the city. The so next slide, please. 
So I mentioned uh, that there were labor adjustments. We we are making those those costs to the general fund. We're we're increasing expenditures there. We've analyzed the other funds that have uh, uh, that we feel that the cost would be such that they wouldn't be able to absorb uh, within their current year budget. So we need to increase appropriations there. And so that's the information technology fund, the water enterprise fund, and the water regional enterprise fund. So those we are, uh, uh, we're increasing by $300,000, $810,000, $560,000 respectively. So with that, next slide, please. You now we're getting into the Measure O uh, uh, special revenue fund. So Measure O, these are special revenue tax that comes into it. It's a, it's a, a, a special tax that funds these. These are programs that are absolutely separate from the general fund. Um, but because it is a sales tax, a special sales tax that funds it, they are also experiencing the same level of sales tax growth that we are in the general fund. So what we are proposing to do with this is to increase the cost to the fund of the labor agreements that affect those three funds, but also increase the sales tax that offsets those labor costs. The fire department that has a sufficient um, uh, fund balance to be able to buy specialized equipment as it as it need be has uh, a, a need to upgrade and and really uh, uh, significantly upgrade their uh, mobile radios and this is a very enhanced specialized equipment that falls within the purview of Measure O that allows them to do that and they have the money there to be able to do this, so that's what they're doing. We, um, we took this to the Citizens Oversight Committee on January 19th, and uh, the, uh, which approved uh, the changes to the implementation plan uh, by a 6-1 vote. Next slide, please. So this basically lays out what I just mentioned. Uh, what you see is we have uh, increased uh, uh, revenues to offset increased labor costs. Um, that just makes it for a clean in and out from a, a from an accounting standpoint. And then we have the added expenditures of the um, of the the radios. And because I didn't mention it before, there are APX. 8,500 radios and the associated vehicle repeater system. It'll help bridge vital communication gaps should radio repeater equipment ever fail during disasters. And next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, uh, also included in this are, are some uh, organizational uh, changes that we're making to our structure. So with uh, the city manager coming in and reviewing our core organizational structure um, and moving to a more efficient model, um, uh, this will occur over a multi-phase approach. But what this item here will do is allow the very beginning parts of that. So uh, what we would do is, is move back to a traditional assistant city manager role and no longer with the dual role of a department head responsibilities. And so in order to do that, we needed to add back uh, the department head positions for planning and economic development and transportation and public works. Um, also, we needed to add staff that I mentioned earlier. These are to address critical needs and it was felt that we needed to attack those now rather than wait until uh, July um, uh, going through the normal budget process. Uh, and then we also have some reclassification uh, that are in some of the other funds. So next slide, please. What I'm showing here 
while we're only um, appropriating a uh, 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 basically a quarter's worth of costs for the three uh, um, uh, the development review coordinator, the civil engineering technician, and the building plans examiner, uh, and the human resources analyst. Their full cost with salaries and benefits is, is, is shown here. This is what we can expect to be a recurring cost going forward. And that cost to the general fund is about one point, uh, close to $1.2 million, uh, ongoing. So again, as I talk about how we need to meet critical needs, but still have an eye on our budget. Uh, this is one of those things where we're meeting a critical need, but it will impact uh, the general fund going forward. Um, I should also add, though, that with the uh, the planning and economic development position, there is revenue tied for us. Now, planning and economic development is not an enterprise fund, so this general fund revenue that comes in, it goes to the whole general fund. But you can tie these positions to revenue generation coming out of that. And I would argue that, that by adding those positions, we have a greater chance to be able to increase revenue coming in that will not directly pay for those from a one-on-one -on -one because again, it's not an enterprise fund. It does help support those positions, which is important. And as we add positions going forward in the areas where we can get a benefit from uh, revenue coming in as a result of adding those, that's always positive. So in these cases, what you're seeing here is the full value of the uh, expenditure. What you're not seeing is the increased uh, revenue that could come as a, or that would come as a result of those folks and us able to move through that backlog of development activity. Um, with the uh, director positions, at this point, we do not need to do uh, um, uh, a, uh, an appropriation. Uh, any changes there can be absorbed within uh, the budget. But going forward, when uh, those positions are filled uh, um, and for a full year, they will have a cost associated with them. Unfortunately, the human resources analyst is an administrative uh, in an administrative department that doesn't have a revenue source tied to it, although I would argue that without the HR analysts helping to get all of the other uh, positions going and getting us working, it helps bog down the whole organization. So being able to have them at a point where they can keep the organization moving forward is a very important thing. Next slide, please. And we are just about at the end, oh, sorry about this. Um, so uh, we do have a couple of, of uh, uh, small level um, uh, non-general fund reclassifications or ads uh, that we need to do. One is in, uh, in IT that basically takes a, uh, upgrades a, um, a senior uh, technician uh, into a network systems analyst. Um, I believe there are IT folks that are online that could uh, speak to that, but uh, um, we are also uh, adding a limited term uh, technician. This is 100% charged to the housing trust and funded by federal funds. Uh, looking to convert a, uh, a senior maintenance worker to a mechanical technologist within the water fund and uh, um, add a, uh, a wastewater operator uh, one, two position to the water fund as well. Um, uh, these help, uh, I believe if I recall correctly, these are, will help with the maintenance of operations down at the treatment plant. And, uh, we've reached the end here. The next slide just tells the next steps that we're going through. And I've already gone through that with our, with our budget public hearing, but 
We do have goal setting that's coming up next week. We have the budget study sessions in May and then the adoption in June uh, 2021. And I think I don't have a recommendation slide here. So before I get to the questions, I'll read it verbally uh, in case it's not there. Um, it's recommended uh, by the finance department that the city council by two resolutions do the following tasks. One, amend the fiscal year 2021-22 adopted budget and the fiscal year 2021-22 salary plan and number of authorized positions as set forth in Exhibit A of the resolution. And two, amend the transaction and use tax uh, measure O implementation plan for police, fire, and gang prevention intervention services. And I might add that uh, because that's an implementation plan change, that would take six affirmative votes from the council uh, to, to move forward with that. And with that, I'm available to answer any questions and I know there are staff here that can answer questions as well. All right, thank you so much, Alan. Really appreciate the presentation. Let's look to council to see if there are any questions. Councilmember McDonald. I just actually have a quick question on um, the budget stabilization money of the $40 million, does that create any revenue or how is that money appropriated and what, what type of account? Right, so those were, this was part of the, of the 95 million uh, PG&E funds and we've just allocated that and had that held in the general fund. So it, it will not, uh, add to revenue coming in in the future. What we're hoping to do with this is be able to use long-term strategic, uh, um, uh, uh, make long-term strategic fiscal uh, uh, strategies with this. I, sorry, that's a little bit uh, weird there, but um, we are trying to look instead of being more reactionary in how we address costs that we know that we're gonna have, is to be more proactive and establish policies that council will adopt that helps us meet those goals of being uh, more proactive. And we've talked about this in prior council meetings. I can briefly say that um, the, the things that we're looking closely at is the pension stabilization fund, and using a Section 115 trust for that. We're looking at an ability to uh, better uh, uh, plan for and pay for long-term or, or large capital replacement costs, uh, uh, the bulk of those being in, in the fire department. Um, uh, and then we're also looking at infrastructure, uh, uh, deferred infrastructure maintenance, uh, um, most likely with facilities, but that's just in general. And, and staff is currently working on putting the methodology around those. Uh, we have uh, committed to be back to the uh, uh, long-term financial planning and audit subcommittee uh, to, to, uh, uh, to further develop those, those methodologies with them uh, beginning in, in March. Any other questions? Let's go to public comment on this item. If you have a comment for item 14.4, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on Zoom. We'll start with Mark. Oh, great. Hi, um, Alan. First, thanks for the wonderful presentation. I appreciate it. And, uh, and I, I, I agree with a lot of it. I'm hoping that before we have the uh, budget priority discussion that we uh, issue the audited financial statements if they're available so members of the public can see the uh, audit report June 30, 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Do we have any pre-recorded voicemails? We do not, Mayor. All right, I'll go ahead and bring that back and Alan, I'll throw that over to you as a question from the public. 
Yeah, uh, we the the final piece of what we need to be able to issue those statements uh, uh, went over to the auditors today. So we should be able to issue by the end of this week. So uh, we uh, it's our hope to be able to have that on our website either before the goal setting or immediately thereafter. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Council Member Swedham, do you want to put a motion on the table? Sure. Uh, the first of two resolutions, I'd move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending the fiscal year 2021-2022 budget and amending the classification and salary plan and waive further reading the text. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Swedhelm and a second from Council Member Rogers. Any other discussion? Let's call the vote. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Council Member. Just before, I just want to make a comment and compliment the city manager. I know during the um, selection process that ultimately we made the right choice. We talked about the structure, and I'm just so impressed how quickly you've done the assessment of the organization and you're suggesting these changes, which I'm sure you'll give you a lot of support from the council. But thank you for walking the talk. Thank you, Council Member. Let's vote. Council Member Schwedham? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember McDonald? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. All right. We have no more items. I've for got the one night. more resolution. Oh, sorry, the second resolution. <laughs> uh, I move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending the transaction and use tax implementation plan for police fire and gang prevention intervention services and way for the reading of the text. Second. So we've got a motion from Council Member Swedelm and a second from Council Member Sawyer. Let's go ahead and call the vote. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. All right, thank you, Council. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we have no written communications. We'll go to item 17. It is our second public comment period for non-agenda items. I see no hands. Yes, we did. And with that, we are adjourned.